Hi, Liz. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, where each week we have an unusually in-depth conversation about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wibland, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today's episode is long for a reason. My producer, Kieran Harris, listened to our first recording session and said it was his favorite episode so far. So we decided to go back and add another 90 minutes to cover a bunch of issues that we didn't make it to the first time around. As a result, the summary on the episode can really only touch on a fraction of the topics that come up. It really is pretty exciting. I hope you enjoy it as much as we did. And if you know someone working near AI or machine learning, please do pass this conversation on to them so they can enjoy it as well. But just quickly before that, I wanted to let you know that last week we released probably our most important article of the year. It's called These are the World's Highest Impact Career Paths According to Our Research, and it summarizes many years of work into a single article that brings you up to date on what 80,000 Hours recommends today. It outlines our new suggested process, which any of you could potentially use to generate a a short list of high-impact career options given your personal situation. It then describes the five key categories of career that we most often find ourselves recommending, which should be able to produce at least one good option for almost all graduates. Finally, it lists and explains the top 10 priority paths that we want to draw attention to because we think that they can enable the right person to do an especially large amount of good for the world. I definitely recommend checking it out, and so we'll link to it from the show notes and the blog post. Here's Paul. Today, I'm speaking with Dr. Paul Cristiano. Paul recently completed a PhD in theoretical computer science at UC Berkeley, and is now a researcher at OpenAI, working on aligning artificial intelligence with human values. He blogs at AIalignment.com. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Paul. Thanks for having me. We plan to talk about Paul's views on how the transition to an AI-dominated economy will actually occur, and how listeners can contribute to making that transition go better. But first, I'd like to give you a chance to frame the issue of AI alignment in your own words. Uh, what is the problem of AI safety and uh, why did you decide to work on it yourself? AI alignment, I see as the problem of building AI systems that are trying to do the thing that we want them to do. So in some sense, that might sound like it's like uh, should be very easy. But as we're building the AI system, we get to choose sort of all of, we get to write the code. We get to choose how the AI system is trained. Uh, there are some reasons that it seems kind of hard to train an AI system to do exactly right. So we have something we want in the world. For example, we want to build an AI, we want it to help us govern better, we want it to help us enforce the law, we want it to help us run a company. We have something we want that AI to do. For like technical reasons, it's not trivial to build the AI that's actually trying to do the thing that we want it to do. Um, That's the alignment problem. I care about that problem a lot because I think we're moving towards a world where like most of the decisions are made by intelligent machines. And so if those machines aren't trying to do the things humans want them to do, then the world is sort of going to go off in a bad direction. Like if all the systems, like if the AI systems we can build are really good, like it's easy to train them to maximize profit or to get users to visit a website um, or to get users to like press the button saying that the AI did well. Then you kind of have a world that's increasingly optimized for things like making profit or getting users to click on buttons or getting users to spend time on websites without being increasingly optimized for like having good policies, heading in a trajectory that we're happy with, helping us figure out what we want and how to get it. So that's the alignment problem. The safety problem is like somewhat more broadly, like understand things that might go poorly with AI and how we can what technical work and political work we can do to improve the probability that things go well. Right. So um, what concretely do you do at OpenAI? So I do machine learning research, which is a combination of writing code and running experiments and thinking about sort of how machine learning systems should work, trying to understand what are the important problems, how could we fix them, plan out what experiments give us interesting information, what capabilities do we need if we want to build aligned AI five years, 10 years, 20 years down the road, what are the capabilities we need? What should we do today to work towards those capabilities? Like what are the hardest parts? So trying to understand what we need to do and then actually trying to do it. Makes sense. So uh, the first big topic that I wanted to get into was kind of the the strategic landscape of artificial intelligence, safety research, both technical and um, I guess political and strategic. And partly I wanted to do that first because I understand it better than the technical stuff. So I didn't want to be, be floundering right off the bat. What basically caused you to form your current views about AI alignment and to regard it as a, as a really important problem? And, and maybe also how, how have your views on this changed over time? So there are a lot of a lot of parts of my views on this, so it's like it's a kind of complicated pipeline from do the most good for the most people to like write this particular machine learning code. I think very broadly speaking, I come in with this utilitarian perspective of you care about more people more, then you start thinking, if you take that perspective and you think that future populations will be very large, you start asking, like, what are the features of the world today that affect the long run trajectory of civilization? Uh, I think if you come in with that question, like 
there's like two very natural categories of things. There's if we all die, then we're all dead forever. And second, there's sort of a distribution of like values or optimization in the world. And that can be sticky in the sense that if you create like entities that are optimizing for something, those entities can entrench themselves and be hard to remove in the same way that humans are kind of hard to remove at this point. Like you try and kill humans, humans bounce back. There are a few ways that you can change like the distribution of values in the world. I think the most natural or the most likely one is as we build AI systems, we're going to sort of pass the torch from humans who want one set of things to AI systems that potentially want different set of things. And so in addition to going extinct, I think bungling that transition is the easiest way to head in a bad direction or to permanently alter the trajectory of civilization. So at a very high level, that's kind of how I got to thinking about AI many years ago. And then once you have that perspective, one then has to look at the actual character of AI and say, how likely is this kind of failure mode? That is what actually determines what AI is trying to optimize and start thinking in detail about the kinds of techniques people are using to use to produce AI. I think that after doing that, I became pretty convinced that it, there are significant problems or there's like some actual difficulty there of building AI that's trying to do the thing that the human who builds it wants it to do. Like if we could resolve that technical problem, that would be great, right? Then we sort of dodge this difficulty of humans maybe passing off control to some systems that don't want the same things we want. Then like zooming in a little bit more, like the whole, right? So this is a problem which some people care about. We also care about a lot of other things though. And we're also like all competing with one another, which introduces a lot of pressure for us to build whatever kind of AI works best. So there's some sort of fundamental tension between building AI that works best at the tasks that we want our AI to achieve and building AI, which robustly shares our values or is trying to do the same things that we want it to do. And so it seems like the current situation is we don't know how to build AI that is like maximally effective, but still robustly beneficial. If we don't understand that, then people deploying AI will face some trade-off between those two goals. I think by default, like competitive pressures would cause people to push far towards the AI that's really effective at doing what we want it, like really effective at acquiring influence or navigating conflict or so on, um, but not necessarily robustly beneficial. And so then we would need to either somehow coordinate to overcome that pressure. So we'd have to like all agree we're going to build AI that actually does what we want it to do rather than building AI, which is effective in conflict, say, or we need to make technical progress so there's not that trade off. So to what extent do you view the arms race dynamic, the the fact that people might try to develop AI prematurely because they're in a competitive situation as the the key problem that's that's driving the, the lack of safety? So I think the competitive pressure to develop AI in some sense is the only reason there's a problem. I think describing it as an arms race feels somewhat narrow potentially. Um, that is like the problem is not restricted to like conflict among states, say. It's not restricted even to like conflict per se. So like if we had like really secure property rights, so if everyone owns some stuff and the stuff they owned was just theirs, um, then it would be very easy to ignore. Like individuals could just opt out of AI risk being a thing because they just say, great, I have like, I have some land and some resources and space. I'm just going to chill. I'm going to take things really slow and careful and understand. Given that's not the case, then like in addition to violent conflict, there's like just faster technological progress tends to give you a larger share of the stuff. Most resources just sitting around unclaimed. And so if you go faster, you get more of them, right? If you like, if there's two countries and one of them like, is 10 years ahead in technology, that country will, everyone expects, like, expand first to space and like over the very long run, claim more resources in space. In addition to violent conflict, de facto, like they'll have more, they'll claim more resources on earth, etc. I think the problem comes from the fact that you can't take it slow because other people aren't taking it slow. That is, we're all forced to develop AI roughly as fast or to develop technology roughly as fast as we could. I don't think of it as very, as restricted to arms races or conflict among states. Uh, I think there would probably still be some problem just because people, right, even if people weren't forced to go quickly, I think everyone kind of wants to go quickly in the current world. That is, most people care a lot about having nicer things next year. And so even if there were no competitive dynamic, I think that many people would be deploying AI the first time it was practical to like become much richer or advance technology more rapidly. So I think we would still have some problem. Maybe it would be like a third as large or something like that. Uh, how much attention are people paying to these kind of problems now? Uh, my, my perception is that uh, the amount of interest has ramped up uh, a huge amount. But of course, uh, I guess the amount, the number of resources going into just increasing the capabilities of AI has also been increasing a lot. So it's unclear whether safety has become a larger fraction of the whole. So I think in terms of profile of the issue, like how much discussion there is of the problem, safety has scaled up faster than AI broadly. So it's like a larger fraction of discussion now. I think that more discussion of the issue doesn't necessarily translate to anything super productive. It definitely translates to like people in machine learning maybe being a little bit annoyed about it. 
So there's a lot of discussion. Discussion has scaled up a lot. The number of people doing research has also scaled up significantly, but I think that's like maybe more in line with the rate of progress in the fields. Like I'm not sure if the fraction of people working on alignment oh, full-time. Actually, no, I, I think it's that's also scaled up maybe by like a factor of two relatively or something. So if one were to look at like publications and top machine learning conferences, there's an increasing number, like maybe a few in the last NIPs that are very specifically directed at the problem. We want our AI to be doing the thing that we want it to be doing. And we don't have a, we don't have a way to do that right now. Let's try and push technology in that direction to build AIs that are able to understand what we want and help us get it. So now we're at the point where there's like a few papers uh, in each conference that are sort of very explicitly targeted at that goal up from like zero to one. And at the same time, like there's kind of aspects of the alignment problem that are more clear. So things like building AI that's able to like reason about what humans want. And there's aspects that are maybe a little bit less clear, like more arcane seeming. So for example, thinking about issues distinctive to like AI, which exceeds human capabilities in some respect. I think like the more arcane issues are also starting to go from like basically nothing to discussed a little bit. What, what kind of arcane issues are you thinking of? Uh, so this is, there's some problem of building weak AIs, say, that want to do what humans want them to do. There's then a bunch of additional difficulties that appear when you imagine the AI that you're training is a lot smarter than you are in some respect. So then you need some other strategy. So in that regime, it becomes when you have a weak AI, it's very easy to say what the goal is, what you want the AI to do, to do something that like looks good to you. If you have a very strong AI, then you actually have like a sort of philosophical difficulty of like, what is the right behavior for such a system? And that means like all the answers, there can be no like very straightforward technical answer where you like prove a theorem and say, this is the right, right. Or you can't merely prove a theorem. You have to do some work to say, this is, we're happy with what this AI is doing, even though like no human understands, say what this AI is doing. So in parallel with like the value specification stuff. Another big part of alignment is understanding like training models that continue to do, like you train your model to do something on the training distribution, you, know, you trained your AI on the training distribution, it does what you want. There's a further problem of like, maybe when you deploy it or at the, on the test distribution, it does something like catastrophically different from what you want. And that's also on that problem. I think interest has probably scaled up even more rapidly. Um, so the number of people thinking about like adversarial machine learning, like can an adversary find some situation in which your AI does something very bad? There are people working on that problem has scaled up. I think has more than doubled as a fraction of the field, although I'm, it's still in absolute terms kind of small. What do you think uh, would cause people to uh, seriously scale up their uh, work on, on this topic? And do you think it's likely to come in time uh, to, to solve the problem if if you're right that, uh, that there are serious risks here? Yeah, so I think that where we're currently at, it seems clear that there is a real problem. There's, there's this technical difficulty of building AI that does we want to do. It's not yet clear if that problem is super hard. So I think we're really uncertain about that. I'm working on it not because I'm confident it's super hard, but because it seems pretty plausible that it's hard. I think that the machine learning community would be much, much more motivated to work on the problem if it became clear that this was going to be a serious problem. Right? People aren't super good at coping with like, you know, well, there's a 30% chance this is going to be a huge problem or something like that. So I think one big thing is like, as it becomes more clear, then I think many more people will work on the problem. Uh, so when I talk about these issues of like training weaker AI systems to do what humans want them to do, I think it is becoming more clear that that's a big problem. So for example, we're getting to the point where robotics is getting good enough that it's going to be limited by or starting to be limited by, like, can you communicate to the robot what it actually ought to be doing? Or like people are becoming very familiar with like, you know, YouTube has some algorithm that decides what video it will show you. People have some intuitive understanding that like that algorithm has a goal. And like, if that goal is not the goal that like we collectively as Google and the users of YouTube would want, that's going to kind of push the world in this annoying direction. It's going to push the world towards like people spending a bunch of time on YouTube rather than their lives being better. So I think like we are currently at the stage where like some aspects of these problems are becoming more obvious and that makes it a lot easier for people to work on those aspects. As we get closer to AI, like assuming that these problems are serious, it's going to become more and more obvious that the problems are serious. That is like, we'll be building AI systems, which like humans don't understand what they do. And the fact that their values are not quite right is causing serious problems. I think that's one axis. And then the other axis is, right, so... I'm particularly interested in the possibility of transformative AI that has a really, like a very large effect on the world. Um, so like AI that starts replacing humans in the great majority of economically useful work. I think that right now we're very uncertain about what the timelines are for that. I think there's like a reasonable chance within 20 years, say, but it's certainly there's not compelling evidence that's going to be within 20 years. I think as that becomes more obvious, then it will, many more people will start thinking about catastrophic risks in particular, because those will become more plausible. So your concerns about how transformative AI could go badly have become pretty mainstream, but uh, not everyone is convinced. How how compelling do you think the arguments are that people should be worried about this? And is there anything that you think that, you, that you'd like to say to try to persuade skeptics who might be listening? So I think almost everyone is convinced that there is, or almost everyone in machine learning is convinced that there is a problem 
that like there is an alignment problem. There's, there's the problem of build AI that's trying to do what you want it to do and that that requires some amount of work. I think the point of disagreement, there's a few points of disagreement like within the machine learning community. So one is, is that problem hard enough that it's a problem that's like worth trying to work on, right? That's worth trying to focus on and trying to push differentially? Or is that the kind of problem that's just should get solved in the normal business of doing AI research? So that's one point of disagreement. I think on that point, I think in order to be really excited about working on that problem, you have to be thinking like, what can we do to affect how AI goes better? Right? If you're just asking like, how can we have really powerful AI that does good things as soon as possible, then I think it's actually not that compelling an argument to work on alignment. Um, but I think if you're asking the question, like, how do we actually maximize the probability this goes well, then like, it doesn't really matter whether that's part, like whether that ought to be part of the job of AI researchers, we should all like, we should be really excited about putting more resources into that to make it go faster. And I think they're like, if someone really takes seriously the goal of trying to make AI go well, instead of just trying to push on AI and trying to make cool stuff happen sooner, um, or trying to realize benefits over the next five years, then I think that case is pretty strong right now. Another place there's a lot of disagreement in the ML community is like, maybe it's more an issue of framing than an issue of substance, which is the kind of thing I find pretty annoying. But like, there's one frame where like AI is very likely to kill everyone. There's going to be some robot uprising. It's going to be a huge mess. This should be like a top of our list of problems. And there's another framing where it's like, well, if we as the community fail to do our jobs, then yes, something bad would happen. But like, it's kind of offensive for you to say that we as the AI community are going to fail to do our jobs. I don't know if I like really need to, doesn't seem like you should really have to convince anyone on the second issue. Like you should just be like, yes, it'll be really bad if we fail to do our jobs. And now like this discussion we're currently having is not like part of us trying to argue that like the world, like that everyone should be freaking out. This is tr us trying to argue that like this is us doing our jobs, the discussion we're having right now. And like, you can't in a discussion about how to do our jobs, be like, yes, like it's going to be fine because we're going to do our jobs. Like that, that is an appropriate response in some kinds of discussion, maybe. But when you're having the conversation about, are we going to like spend some money on this now? Then yeah, then I think it's not such a great response. And like, I think safety is a really unfortunate word. And like, lots of people don't like safety, but it's kind of hard to move away from. Because if you describe these problems, like if you describe the problem, like let's train an AI to do what we want to do to people. They're like, why do you call that safety? That's the problem of like building a good AI. That's fine. Like, I'm happy with that. I'm happy saying, yep, this is just like doing AI reasonably well. But then, yeah, it's not really an argument about why one shouldn't push more money into that area or shouldn't like push more effort into that area. It's like a part of AI that's particularly important to whether AI has a positive or negative effect. But yeah, I think in my experience, those are like the two biggest disagreements. So the biggest substantive disagreement is on this, like, is this a thing that's going to get done easily anyway? And I think there, like, uh, people tend to have, maybe it's just like a normal level of overconfidence about how easy problems will end up being together with like not having a real, I think there aren't that many people who are really prioritizing the question, how do you make AI go well, instead of just how do you make, like choose some cool thing they want to happen? How do I make that cool thing happen as soon as possible, like in calendar time? I think that's like unfortunate. Uh, it's a hard kind of thing to convince people on in part because like, yeah, values discussions are always a little bit hard. So uh, what do you think are the best arguments against being concerned about this issue, or at least uh, wanting to prioritize directing resources towards it? And why doesn't it persuade you? Uh, so I think there's a few classes of arguments. Probably the ones I find most compelling are opportunity cost arguments, where someone says, like, here's a concrete alternative. Like, yeah, you're concerned about X, but, like, have you considered that Y is even more concerning? Like, you'd imagine someone saying, look, the risk of, like, bioterrorism killing everyone is high enough that you should, like, on the margin, returns to that are higher than returns to AI safety. I'm mostly not compelled by those arguments. Well, in part, there's, like, a comparative advantage thing where, like, I don't really have to evaluate those arguments because, like, it's sort of clear what my comparative advantage is. Um, and in part, like, I have a different reason I'm not compelled for every argument of that form. Uh, so that's, like, one class of arguments against. In terms of the actual, like, value of working on AI safety, I think the biggest concern is this, like, is this an easy problem that will get solved anyway? And maybe the second biggest concern is, like, is this a problem that's so difficult that, like, one shouldn't bother working on it or, like, one should be assuming that we need some other approach? Like, you could imagine a technical problem is hard enough that almost all the bang is going to come from policy solutions rather than from technical solutions. And you could imagine those two concerns like maybe sound contradictory, but aren't necessarily contradictory because you could say like, we have some uncertainty about this parameter of like how hard this problem is. You could have the view that either it's going to be easy enough that it's solved anyway, or it's going to be hard enough that like working on it now isn't going to help that much. And so what mostly matters is getting our policy response in order. Um, I think I don't find that compelling in part because like one, I think the significant probability on the range, like the place in between those. Um, and two, like, I just think working on this problem earlier, like will tell us what's going on. Like if we're in the world where we need a really drastic policy response to cope with this problem, then you kind of want to know that as soon as possible. And it's like not a good move to be like, we're not going to work on this problem because if it's serious, we're going to have a dramatic policy response because like, you really, you want to work on it earlier, discover that it seems really hard and then have like significantly more motivation for trying the kind of coordination you'd need to get around it. It seems to me like it's just too soon to say whether it's very easy, moderately difficult, or very difficult. Does that seem right? 
that's definitely my take. So I think people make some arguments in both directions and like we could talk about particular arguments people make. But like overall, I find them all just pretty unconvincing. I think a lot of the like, it seems easy, comes from just the intuitive, like, look, we get to build the AI, we get to choose the training process, we get to like, look at all the computation the AI is doing as it thinks, like, how hard can it be to get the AI to be like trying to do, or maybe not, maybe it's hard to get to try to do exactly what you want, but how hard can it be to like, get it to not try and kill everyone? Like, that sounds like a pretty, there's a pretty big gap between the behavior we want and the behavior of like reasoning about what output is going to like most lead to humans being crushed. That's like a pretty big gap. Feels like you ought to be able to distinguish those. But I think that's not like there is something to that kind of intuition. Like it, it is relevant to the reasoning about how hard a problem is, but it just like doesn't carry that much weight on its own. Like you really have to get into the actual details of like how are we producing AI systems, how that likely to work, what is the distribution of possible outcomes in order to actually say anything with confidence. I think once you do that, like the picture doesn't look quite as rosy. You mentioned that one of the most potentially uh, compelling counter arguments was that there's just other really important things for people to be doing that might be even more pressing. Yeah, what uh, things other than AI safety do you think uh, are among the most important things for people to be working on? Uh, so I guess I have, I have two kinds of answers to this question. One kind of answer is like, what's the standard list of things people would give, which I think are the most likely things to be good alternatives. So for example, like amongst the utilitarian crowd, I think they're like talking about existential risk from engineered pandemics is like a very salient option. And maybe there's like a somewhat broader bioterror category. I give other things like in this genre, um, one could also look at the world more broadly. So like intervening on political process, like improve political institutions, or just like push governance a particular direction that we think is conducive to like a good world or like a world on a good long-term trajectory. Those are examples of problems that like lots of people would advocate for. Um, and for my best, you know, I think if lots of people think X is important, that's good evidence that X is important. The second kind of answer, which is like the problems that I find most tempting to work on, which is going to be related to, like it's going to tend to systematically be things that other people don't care about. Uh, Cause I think there's a lot of value. Yeah. One can, one can add a lot of value if there's a thing that's important you care about the ratio between how important it actually is and like, or like how important other people think it is and how important it actually is. So at that level, things that I'm like, I'm particularly excited about like very weird utilitarian arguments. So as I'm particularly excited about people doing more thinking about what actual features of the world affect, whether on a positive or negative trajectory. So thinking about things like there's a lot of considerations that are extremely important from this like long run utilitarian perspective that are just not very important according to people's normal, like normal view of the world or like normal values. So I think like one big area is just thinking about and acting on sort of that space of considerations. So like an example, which is a kind of weird example, but hopefully illustrates the point is like normal people care a ton about like whether humanity, like they care a ton about catastrophic risks. They would really care if everyone died. I think it's like a weird utilitarian. You're like, well, it would be bad if everyone died. But like even in that scenario, there's like a bunch of weird stuff you would do to try and improve the probability that things turn out okay in the end. So these include things like working on inc- extremely robust bunkers that are capable of like repopulating the world or like trying to right in the extreme case where like all humans die. You're like, well, we'd like some other animal later to like come along and evolve intelligent life again and colonize the stars. And like, those are weird scenarios. The scenarios that like basically no one tries to push on, like no one is asking, you know, what could we do as a civilization to make it like better for the people who come after us if we manage to blow ourselves up. And so because no one is working on them, even though they're like not that important in absolute terms, like I think it's reasonably likely that they're good things to work on. Those are examples of kind of weird things. There's a bunch of not as weird things that also seem pretty exciting to me, especially things about like improving how well people are able to think or improving how well institutions function, which I'd be happy to get into more detail on, but are not things I'm an expert in. Yeah. Maybe you just want to want to list off a couple of those. Uh, so just like all the areas that seem like, or like high level areas that seem good to me. Um, so we listed like thinking about the utilitarian picture and what's important to a far future focused utilitarian. There's thinking about extinction risks, like maybe extinction risks that are especially interesting to people who care about extinction. So like things like bunkers, things like repopulation in the future, things like understanding the tales of the yeah, understanding the tales of normal risks. So understanding the tales of climate change, um, understanding the tales of nuclear war, more normal interventions like pushing on peace, but especially with like an eye towards like avoiding the most extreme forms of war or like mitigating the severity of like all out war, pushing on institutional quality. So like experimenting with institutions like prediction markets or different ways of aggregating information or making decisions across people. Just like running tons of experiments and understanding what factors influence like individual cognitive performance or individual performance within organizations or for decision making. Like an example of a thing that I'm like kind of shocked by is how little study there is of nootropics and cognitive enhancement broadly. I think that's like a kind of thing that's like relatively cheap and seems like such a good, such good bang for your buck and expectation. Um, that it's pretty damning for civilization that we haven't invested in it. Yeah, those are a few examples. Okay, great. Coming back to AI, 
how important is it to make sure that the the best AI safety team ends up uh, existing within the organization that has the the best general machine learning firepower behind it? So you could imagine splitting up the functions of people working on AI safety into two categories. One category is developing technical understanding, which is sufficient to build aligned AI. So this is like doing research saying, here are some algorithms, here are some, here's some analysis that seems important. And then a second function is actually affecting the way that an AI project is carried out to make sure it reflects our understanding of how to build an aligned AI. So for the first function, it's not super important. Like for the first function, if you want to be doing research on alignment, you want to have access to machine learning expertise. So you need to be somewhere that's like doing reasonably good machine learning research. But it's not that important that you be at the place that's actually like at the literal cutting edge. From the, the second function, it's like quite important. So if you imagine someone actually building, you know, very, very powerful AI systems, like I think the only way in practice the like society's expertise about how to build aligned AI is going to affect the way that we build AGI is by having a bunch of people who have like made it their career to understand those considerations and work on those considerations who are involved in the process of creating AGI. Um, so for that second function, it's like quite important that if you want an AI to be safe, you need like people involved in the like, development of that AI to be like basically be alignment researchers. Do you think we're heading towards a world where uh, we have the right distribution of, of uh, people? Yeah, so I think things are currently okay on that front. And I think as we get closer, it's, we're sort of currently in a mode where we can imagine we're like somewhat confident there won't be powerful AI systems within like two or three years. <laughs> And so over the short term, like there's not as much pressure as there will be closer to the day to like say consolidate behind projects that are posing a catastrophic risk. And I would be optimistic that like if we're in that situation where we actually faced you know, a significant prospect of like existential risk from AI over the next two years, then there would be significantly more pressure for both pressure for like safety researchers to really follow wherever like that AI was being built or like be allocated across the organizations that are working on AI that poses an existential risk. And also a lot of pressure within such organizations to be actively seeking safety researchers. My hope would be that you don't have to like really pick like a safety researchers. You don't have to pick a long time in advance what organizations you think will be doing that development. You can say, we're going to try and understand, like develop the understanding that is needed to make this AI safe. We're going to work in an organization that is like amongst those that might be doing like development of dangerous AI. And then we're going to try and live in the kind of world where like as we get very close, there's a lot of like people understand the need for and are motivated to concentrate more expertise in alignment and safety and then that occurs at that time. It seems like there's some risks to creating uh, new organizations because you get kind of a splintering uh, of the effort and also potential coordination problems between uh, the, d- the different groups. Uh, h- how do you feel we should split uh, you know, additional resources between just expanding existing uh, research organizations versus creating, creating new projects? So I agree that to the extent that we have a coordination problem amongst developers of AI, or like to the extent the field is harder to, it's hard to reach agreements or regulate as there are like more and more actors, then all else equal, you'd prefer not to have a bunch of new actors. I think that's mostly the case for people doing AI development. So for example, for projects that are doing alignment per se, like I don't think it's a huge deal and should mostly be determined by other considerations, whether to contribute to existing efforts or create new efforts. Yeah, I think in the context of AI projects, I think all SQL, like one should only be creating new AI, like if you're interested in alignment, you should only be creating new AI projects where you have some like very significant interest in doing so. It's not a huge deal, but it's nicer to have a smaller number of more pro-social actors than to have like a larger number of actors with uncertain or even like a similar distribution of motivations. Uh, so how much of the variance in outcomes from artificial general intelligence uh, in your estimates comes from uncertainty about how good we'll be at actually working on the technical AI alignment problem versus uncertainty about how firms that are working to develop AGI will behave and potentially, uh, you know, the governments in the countries that they're operating, how, how they're going to behave. Yeah, I think the largest source of variance is neither of those, but is instead just how hard is the problem? <laughs> or like, what is the character of the problem? Yeah. So after that, I think the biggest uncertainty, though not necessarily the highest place to push, is about like how people behave. That is how much investment do they make? How well are they able to reach agreements? How motivated are they in general to like change what they're doing in order to make things go well? So I think that's a larger source of variance than like technical research that we do in advance. I think it's potentially a harder thing to push on in advance. Like pushing on how much technical research we do in advance is very easy. Like if you want to increase that amount by 10%, that's incredibly cheap. Whereas having a similarly big change on how people behave would be a kind of epic project. But I think that more of the variance comes from how people, more of the variance comes from how people behave. I'm like very, very uncertain about the institutional context in which AI will be developed. Uncertain about how much each particular actor really cares about these issues or when push came to shove, how far out of their way they would go to avoid um, catastrophic risk. I'm very uncertain about how feasible it will be to make agreements to avoid 
like race to the bottom on safety. Another question that uh, came in from a listener was, um, uh, I guess, a bit of a hypothetical, but it's interesting to, to probe your intuitions here. What do you think would happen if several different firms or countries simultaneously made a, a very powerful general AI, uh, and some of which were aligned, uh, but some of which weren't and potentially uh, kind of went rogue uh, with their own agenda? Do you think that would be a very bad expectation uh, situation and expectation? My normal model does not involve a moment where you're building powerful AI. So that is instead of having like a transition from nothing to very powerful AI, you have like a bunch of actors gradually ratcheting up the capacity of the systems they're able to build. But even if that's false, I'd like expect developers to generally be like really well financed groups that are like quite large. And so if there are smaller groups, I do generally expect them to like divide up the task and effectively pool resources in one way or another, either by like explicitly resource sharing or by merging or by normal like trading with each other. But we can still imagine, like we can say in general, like suppose distributed across the world, you have a bunch of powerful AI systems, um, some of which are aligned, some of which aren't aligned. I think like uh, my default guess about what happens in that world is similar to saying if like 10% of the AIs are aligned, then we capture like 10% as much value as if 100% of them are aligned. It's roughly in that ballpark. Does that come from the fact that there's a, you know, a 10% chance that one out of 10 uh, AGIs would in, in general take over? Or you, you, you have more of a view where uh, there's going to be kind of uh, power sharing or each group gets like a fraction of the influence as, as in the world today? Yeah. So I think, I mean, I don't have a super strong view on this. And in part, I don't have a strong view because I end up at the same place regardless of how much stochasticity there is. Like whether ever you get 10% of the stuff all the time or all the stuff 10% of the time. I don't have an incredibly strong preference between those for kind of complicated reasons. I think I would guess, so in general... If there's like two actors who are equally powerful, they could like fight it out and then just see what happened. And then like from behind the veil of ignorance, each of them wins like half the time and like crushes the other. I think normally people would prefer like reach compromises short of that. So that is like, imagine like how that conflict would go and say, well, like, you know, if you're someone who would be more likely to win, then you'll like extract a bunch of concessions from the weaker party. But like everyone is incentivized to reach an agreement where they don't have an all out war. And in general, I, like that's how things normally go amongst humans. Like we're able to avoid all-out war most of the time, though not all the time. I would, in general, guess that AI systems will be better at that. Or certainly in the long run, I think it's pretty clear AI systems will be better at like negotiating to reach positive sum trades. Where avoiding war is often an example of a positive sum trade. It's conceivable in the short term that you have AI systems that are very good at some kinds of tasks and not very good at like diplomacy or not very good at reaching agreement or this uh, these kinds of tasks. But uh, I don't have a super strong view about that. I think that's the kind of thing that would determine like to what extent you should predict there to be war. Like if people have transferred most of the decision making authority to machines or like a lot of decision making authority to machines, then you care a lot about things like are machines really good at waging war but not really changing the process of diplomacy. And like if they have differential ability in one that kind of respect, then you get an outcome that's more like random and someone will crush everyone else. And if you're better at striking agreements, then you're more likely to say, like, well, look, here's the allocation of resources, or, like here's the we'll allocate influence according to like the results of what would happen if we fought, but like, let's all not fight. One topic that you've written quite a lot about is uh, credible commitments and the need for organizations to be honest. Uh, and I get, I guess uh, part of that is because it seems like it's going to be very important in the future for organizations that are involved in the development of, of AGI to be able to coordinate uh, around safety uh, and alignment and to avoid uh, getting into races with one another and or to have just a general environment of mistrust uh, where they have reasons to, to go faster in order to, to outcompete uh, other groups. Has anyone ever attempted to have organizations that are as credible <laughs> as or with, in their commits as, as this? Um, and do you have much hope that we'll be able to, to, to do that? Uh, so certainly in the context of like arms control agreements and monitoring, there is some efforts are made for like one organization to be able to credibly commit that they are like, credibly demonstrate that they're abiding by some agreement. I think that like the kind of thing I've talked about, so I wrote this blog post on honest organizations. I think the kind of measure I'm discussing there is like both somewhat more extreme than things that would like a government would normally be open to. And also um, sort of more tailored for the setting where you have an organization, which is currently not under the spotlight, which is trying to set itself up in such a way that it's prepared to be trustworthy in the future. Um, if it is under the spotlight, I'm not aware of any organizations having tried that kind of thing. So like a private organization saying, well, we expect someday in the future, like we might want to coordinate in this way or be regulated in this way. So we're going to try and constitute ourselves such that it's like very easy for someone to verify that we're complying with an agreement or a law. I'm not aware of people really having tried that much. I think there's like some things that are kind of implicitly this way, like, you know, companies ch can change who they hire, like they can try and be more trustworthy by like having executives or having people on the board or having like monitors embedded within the organization that they think like stakeholders will trust. Certainly a lot of precedent for that. 
Yeah, I think that the reason you gave for why this seems important to me in this context is basically right. So like, I'm concerned of setting where there's some trade-off between the capability of the AI systems you build and safety. And like, in the context of such a trade-off, you're reasonably likely to want some agreement that says like, everyone is going to meet this bar on safety. Given that everyone has committed to meet that bar, there's not really an incentive then to cut or like, they're not able to follow the incentive to cut corners on safety, say. And so you might want to make that, like, that agreement might take place as an informal agreement amongst AI developers. It might take place as, like, domestic regulation, where, like, law enforcement would like to allow AI companies to continue operating, but would like to verify they're, like, not going to take over the world. Uh, it might take the context of, like, agreements among states, which would themselves be largely, like, an agreement among states about AI would involve, like, you know, the U.S. or China having some unusually high degree of trust or insight into what firms in the other country are doing. And so like thinking forward to that kind of agreement, it like seems like you would need machinery in place that's not currently in place or it would be very, very hard um, at the moment. So anything you could do to make it easier seems like it would be potentially you could make it like quite a lot easier. There's a lot of room there. Is this uh, in itself a reason for anyone who's involved in AI research to maintain a, a, an extremely high level of integrity so that they so that they will be trusted in future? Uh, I think having a very high level of integrity sounds good in general. Like, you know, as a as a utilitarian, I do like it, like the people engaged in important projects are mostly in it for like their stated goals and want to make the world better. It seems like there is a somewhat different thing, which is like how trustworthy are you to like the external stakeholders who wouldn't otherwise have trusted your organization, which I think is different from the normal, like, you know, if you're to rank people by integrity, that would be a quite different ranking than ranking them by like, yeah, demonstrable integrity to like people very far away who don't necessarily trust the rest of the organization they're involved in. I, I didn't quite get that. Can you explain that? So I could say there's both... Like if I'm interacting with someone in the context, like I'm interacting with a colleague, I have some sense of like how much they connect themselves with integrity. And that's like one, I could rank people by that. I'd like love it if the people who were actually involved in making AI were people who I'd rank as like super high integrity. There's then a different question, which is like, suppose you have some firm and then you have, there's like someone in the Chinese defense establishment reasoning about the conduct of that firm. And like, they don't really care that much probably if there's like someone who I would judge as high integrity involved in the process because they don't have like the information that I'm using to make that judgment. Like from their perspective, they care a lot about the firm being instructed such that they like feel like they understand what the firm is doing. I um, mean, they don't feel like any uncertainty about whether like in particular, they have like a minimal suspicion that like a formal agreement is just cover for like US firms to be like cutting corners and delaying their competitors. So they like really want to have a lot of insight into what is happening at the firm. Right? They want to have some confidence that there's not some unobserved collusion between the US defense establishment and this firm that nominally is like complying with some international agreement. Um, to undermine that agreement. That's the example of like states looking into firms, but also in the example of firms looking into firms similarly, like, you know, if I'm looking in, there's some like notion of integrity that would be relevant for like two researchers at Baidu looking, like interacting with each other and thinking about like how much integrity they have. And there's something quite different that would be helpful for like me looking into AI research at Baidu, actually believing that like AI research at Baidu is being conducted like when they make public statements, those statements are an accurate reflection of what they're doing. They aren't collaborating, you know, there isn't behind the scenes a bunch of work to undermine nominal agreements. Yeah, I think that it's, it, it is very valuable for people in this uh, industry to be trustworthy for all of these reasons. But I, I guess I am a bit skeptical that trust alone is going to be enough, in part for the reasons you just gave. And there's that uh, the famous Russian uh, proverb, uh, trust but verify. And it seems like there's been a lot of talk, uh, at least publicly, about the importance of trust and maybe not enough about how we can come up with better ways of verifying uh, what people's behavior actually is. I mean, well, one option, I guess, would just be to have people from different organizations all working together in the same building uh, or to, to, f to move them together so they can see what, what other groups are doing, um, which allows them to, to have a lot more trust just because they have much more visibility. Uh, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so I think I would be pretty pessimistic about reaching any kind of substantive and space agreement based only on trust for the, the other actors in the space. Like, it may be possible in some, yeah, it's like conceivable amongst like, Western firms that are like already quite closely, like where there's been a bunch of turnover of staff from one to the other and like everyone knows everyone. It's like maybe conceivable in that case. But in general, when I talk about agreements, I'm imagining like trust as a complement to fairly involved monitoring and enforcement mechanisms. The monitoring and enforcement problem in this context is quite difficult. That is, it's very, very hard for me to know. Suppose I've reached, for A and firm B, I've reached some nominal agreement, like they're only going to develop some AI that's safe according to some standard. Like, it's very, very hard for firm A to demonstrate that to firm B without, like, literally showing all of their, without giving firm B enough information, they could basically just take everything or, like, benefit from all of the research that firm A is doing. There's no, like, easy solution to this problem. 
the problem is easier to the extent that you believe that like say the firm is not like running a completely fraudulent operation to maintain some appearances but then in addition to like having some you know in addition to having enough insight to verify that you still need to do a whole bunch of work to actually control like how development is going like you know i'm just running a bunch of code on some giant computing cluster you can look and you can see indeed they're running some code on this cluster and even if i literally showed you all of the code i was running on the cluster that's actually not that wouldn't be that helpful right it's kind of very hard for you to trust what i'm doing unless you like literally have watched the entire process by which the code was produced or at least like you're confident there wasn't some other process hidden away that's writing the real code and the thing you can see is just a cover by which like you know it looks like we're running some scheduling job but actually like it's just a like it's carrying some real payload that's like a bunch of actual AI research. That the results are getting smuggled out to the real AI research group. Could you have an agreement in which every organization accepts that all of the other groups are going to try to put uh, clandestine informants inside their organization and that that's just an acceptable thing for everyone to do to one another? Because it's the only way that you could really believe uh, what, what someone's telling you? Yes, I think there's sort of a split between two ways of doing this kind of coordination. On one arm, you try and maintain something like the status quo, where you have a bunch of people independently pushing on AI progress. And in order to maintain that arm, there's like some limit on how much transparency different developers can have into each other's research. That's one arm. And then there's a second arm where you just give up on that and you say, yes, like all of the information is going to leak. And like the, I think the difficulty in the first arm is that it's like incredibly, you have to like walk this really fine line where you're like trying to give people enough insight, which probably does involve like monitors, whistleblowing, other like mechanisms whereby like there are people who firm A trusts embedded in firm B. That's what makes it hard to do monitoring without leaking all the information. You have to walk that fine line. And then if you want to leak all the information, then the main difficulty seems to be like you have to reach some new agreement about like how you're actually going to divide the fruits of AI research. Like right now, there's sort of some implicit status quo where like people who make more AI progress expect to capture some benefits by virtue of having made more AI progress. So you could say, no, that's we're going to deviate from the status quo and just agree that like we're going to develop AI effectively jointly either because it's literally joint or because like we've all opened ourselves or like the leader has opened themselves up to enough monitoring they cease to be the leader. And if you do that, then you have to reach some agreement where you say, here's how we compensate the leader for the fact that they were the leader or that or the leader has to be willing to say, yep, I used to be like, have a high valuation because I was doing so well in AI. And now I'm just happy to grant that like that advantage is going to get eroded. And I'm happy to do that because it reduces the risk of the world being destroyed. I think like both of those seem like reasonable options to me. And like which one you take depends a little bit on like how serious the problem appears to be like what the actual structure of the field is like, right? Like the coordinating is more reasonable if like the relevant actors are kind of close such that, well, it's more reasonable if either like if there's an obvious leader who should like is going to capture the benefits and is feeling or like reasonably is willing to distribute them. Or if like somehow there's not a big difference between the players such that like erasing AI as like a fact, like, you know, if you imagine the US and China both believing that like, like things are hard if each of them believes that they're ahead in AI and each of them believes that like they're going to benefit by having AI research, which isn't available to their competitor. Things are hard if both of them believe that they're ahead and things are easy if both of them believe that they're behind. And if they like both have an accurate appraisal of the situation and understand there's not a big difference, then maybe you're also okay because everyone's fine saying, sure, I'm fine leaking because I know that like that's roughly the same as like I'm not going to lose a whole lot by leaking information to you. Okay, let's turn now to this question of fast versus slow uh, takeoff of artificial intelligence. Uh, historically, a lot of people who've been worried about AI alignment have tended to take the view that they expected progress to be relatively gradual for a while and then to suddenly accelerate uh, and take off very quickly over a period of days or weeks or months uh, rather than years. But you've for some time been promoting the view that you think uh, the takeoff of uh, general AI is going to be more gradual than that. Do you want to just explain explain your general view? Uh, yeah. So I, it's worth clarifying that when I say slow... I think I still mean very fast compared to most people's expectations. So I think that like a transition taking place over like a few years, maybe two years between AI having like very significant economic impact and literally doing everything sounds pretty plausible. So I think when people think about such a two-year transition to most people on the street, that sounds like a pretty fast takeoff. I think that's important to clarify that when I say slow, I don't mean what most people think of by slow. Another thing that's important to clarify is that I think... There's rough agreement amongst the alignment and safety crowd about what would happen if we did have human level AI. That is, everyone agrees that kind of at that point, progress has probably exploded and is occurring very quickly. And the main disagreement is about what happens in advance of that. So I think I have the view that in advance of that, the world has already changed very substantially. You're already likely exposed to catastrophic AI risk. And in particular, when someone develops 
human level AI, it's not going to emerge in a world like the world of today, where we can say that indeed having human level AI today would be, would it'll give you a decisive strategic advantage. Instead, it will emerge in a world which is already much, much crazier than the world of today, uh, where having your human level AI gives you some more modest advantage. Yeah. Do you want to paint a picture for us of, of what that what that world might look like? Yeah. So I guess there are a bunch of different parts of the world, uh, and I can focus on different ones, but I can try and give some random facts or some random views, like facts from that world. They're not real facts. They're they're Paul's wild speculations. So I guess in terms of like calibrating what AI progress looks like, or like how rapid it is, I think maybe two things that seem reasonable to think about are the current rate of progress in information technology in general. So that would suggest something like, uh, maybe in the case of AI, like falling in cost by a factor of two every like year-ish, or like every six to 12 months. And another thing that I think is important to get an intuitive sense of scale is like to compare to intelligence in nature. So I think when people do intuitive extrapolation of AI, they often think about like abilities within the human range. One thing that I do agree with proponents of fast takeoff about is that that's not a very accurate perspective when thinking about AI. I think a better way to compare is to like look at what evolution was able to do with varying amounts of compute. So if you look at like what each order of magnitude buys you in nature, right, you're going from like insects to small fish to lizards to rats to crows to primates to humans. Each of those is like one order of magnitude roughly. So like you should be thinking of right there are these jumps that it, it is the case that the difference between insect and lizard like feels a lot smaller to us and is less intuitive significance than like the difference between primate and human or crow and primate. So when I'm thinking about AI capabilities, I'm kind of imagining intuitively, and this is not that accurate, but I think is useful as an example to ground things out. I'm imagining like this line raising and like one day you have, or like one year you have an AI, which is capable of like very simple learning tasks and motor control. And then a few years later, you know, a year later, you have an AI that's capable of like slightly more sophisticated learning. Like now it like learns as well as a crow or something. That AI is like starting to get deployed as quickly as possible in the world and having a transformative impact. And then it's like a year later that AI has taken over the process of doing science from humans. Yeah, I think that's important to have in mind as background, like talking about what this world looks like. What tasks can you put an AI that's as smart as a crow on that are, that are economically valuable? So I think there's a few kinds of answers. So one place where I think you definitely have a big impact is in robotics and domains like manufacturing, logistics, and construction. Um, that is, I think lower animals are probably, they're good enough at motor control that they you'd have much, much better robotics than you have now. So today I would say robotics doesn't really, or robots that learn like don't really work very well or at all. Today, like the way you get robotics to work is you like really organize your manufacturing process around them. They're quite expensive and tricky and it's just like hard to roll it out. I think in this world, probably even before you have crow level AI, you have robots that are like very general and flexible they can be applied not only in on an assembly line, but okay, one, they can take the place of humans on assembly lines quite reliably, but they can also then be applied in like logistics. So like loading and unloading uh, trucks, driving trucks, managing warehouses, construction. Maybe image identification as well? Uh, they can certainly do image identification well. <laughs> I think that's yeah. the sort of thing we get uh, a little bit earlier. So I think that's a large part of like today, those activities are a large part of the economy. Like maybe the stuff we just listed is something like... Uh, I don't actually know in the US, it's probably lower here than elsewhere, but still like more than 10% of our economy, less than 25%. There's another class of activities. Like if you look at like the intellectual work humans do, I think a significant part of it could be done by very cheap AIs at the level of at the level of crows or not much more sophisticated than crows. There's also a significant part that requires a lot more sophistication. I think we're like very uncertain about how hard like doing science is. So as an example, like I think Back in the day, we would have said that like playing board games that are designed to tax human intelligence, like playing chess or go is like really quite hard. And like, it feels to humans, like they're really able to leverage all their intelligence doing it. It turns out that like playing chess from the perspective of uh, like actually designing a computation to play chess is incredibly easy. So it takes a brain, like, you know, brain much smaller than an insect brain in order to play chess much better than a human. I think it's pretty clear at this point that science like makes better use of human brains than chess does. But it's actually not clear how much better. So it, it's totally conceivable from our current perspective, I think, that like an intelligence that was as smart as a crow, but was actually designed for doing science, actually designed for doing engineering, for advancing technology as rapidly as possible. It's quite conceivable that such a brain would actually outcompete humans pretty badly at those tasks. So I guess that's another important thing to have in mind. That when we talk about like when stuff goes crazy, I would guess humans are like an upper bound for when stuff goes crazy. That is, we kind of know that if you had cheap simulated humans, the technological progress would be much, much faster than it is today. But like probably stuff goes crazy somewhat before you actually get to humans. It's not clear like how many orders of magnitude smaller brain can be before it goes crazy. 
I think like probably at least one seems kind of safe. And then like two or three is definitely plausible. So it's a bit surprising to say that uh, science isn't so hard and that there might be a brain that in a sense is much less intelligent than a human that could blow us out of the water in doing science. Can, can you explain, uh, can, you, could you, can you try to make that more intuitive? Yeah, so I mentioned this analogy to chess, which is that like when humans play chess, we apply a lot of faculties that we evolved for other purposes to play chess well. And we play chess like much, much better than someone using like pencil and paper to mechanically play chess at the speed that a human could. Like we're able to get a lot of mileage out of all of these other, you know, we evolved to like be really good at physical manipulation and planning in physical contexts and reasoning about social situations. Like that makes us in some sense, like it lets us play good chess much better than if we didn't have all of those capacities. That said, like if you just write down a simple algorithm for playing chess and you run it with a tiny, tiny fraction of the compute that a human uses in order to play chess, it crushes humans incredibly consistently. And so in a similar sense, like if you imagine this project of like, you know, look at some technological problem, consider a bunch of possible solutions, understand like what the real obstructions are and how we can try and overcome those obstructions. Like a lot of the stuff we do there, like we know that humans are much, much better than a simple mechanical algorithm applied to those tasks. That is, we're able to leverage like all of these abilities that we, all of these abilities that helped us in the evolutionary environment, we're able to leverage to do like really incredible things in terms of technological progress or in terms of doing science or designing systems or et cetera. But what's not clear is if you actually had created, right? So again, if you take the computation of the human brain and you like actually put it in a shape that's optimal for playing chess, it plays chess many, many orders of magnitude better than a human. And so similarly, like if you took the computation of the human brain and you actually like reorganized it. So you said now, instead of a human explicitly considering some possibilities for like how to approach this problem, a computer is going to generate, you know, a billion possibilities per second for like possible solutions to this problem. So in many respects, we know that that computation would be like much, much better than humans at resolving some parts of like science and engineering. There's then a question of how sort of exactly how much leverage are we getting out of all of these evolutionary heuristics? Um, so it's kind of not surprising that in the case of chess, we're getting, you know, much less mileage than we do for tasks that are closer, like that sort of more leverage the full range of human, like what the human brain does or like closer to tasks the human brain was designed for. I think science is kind of, and technology are in a kind of intermediate place where they're still really, really not close to what human brains are designed to do. So, you know, it's not, it's not that surprising if you can make brains that are really a lot better at science and technology than humans are. And I think a priori, it's like not that much su more surprising for s science and technology than it would be for chess. Okay. I, I took us uh, some part away from the uh, core of this fast versus slow takeoff uh, discussion. What, one part of your argument that I think isn't, isn't, immediate, isn't immediately obvious is that when, when you're saying in a sense that takeoff will be slow, you're actually saying that dumber AI will have a lot more impact on the economy and on the world than, than other people think. Why do you disagree with other people about that? Why do you think that earlier versions of machine learning could, could already be having a transformative impact? I think there's a bunch of dimensions of this disagreement. And like an interesting fact, I think, about the sort of effective altruism and AI safety communities is that there's a lot of agreement about, uh, or there's a surprising amount of agreement about takeoff being fast. There's a really quite large diversity of views about why takeoff will be fast. Uh, <laughs> like certainly the arguments people would emphasize if you were to talk with them would be very, very different. And so my answer to this question is like different for different people. I think there's this general, uh, one general issue is like, I think other people more imagine so other people look at the evolutionary record and they more see like this transition between like lower primates and humans, where humans seem incredibly good at doing a kind of like reasoning that builds on itself and discovers new things and accumulates them over time culturally. They more see that as being like this jump that occurred around human intelligence and is likely to be recapitulated in AI. I think I more see that jump as occurring when it did because of the structure of evolution. So this evolution was not really trying to optimize, it was not trying to optimize humans for cultural accumulation in any particularly meaningful sense. It was trying to optimize humans for this suite of tasks that primates are engaged in. And kind of incidentally, humans became very good at cultural accumulation and reasoning. I think if you optimize AI systems for reasoning, kind of it appears much, much earlier, right? If evolution had been trying to make AIs that would build a civilization, or if evolution had been trying to design creatures, trying to optimize for creatures that would build a civilization, instead of like going straight to humans who have some level of ability at forming a technological civilization, it would have been able to produce crappier technological civilizations earlier. So I think, I now think it's probably not the case that if you like lay left monkeys for long enough, you would get a spacefaring civilization. But I think that's not for reasons that are directly, like I think that's not a consequence of monkeys just being too dumb to do it. I think it's largely a consequence of like the way that monkey social dynamics work, like the way that imitation works amongst monkeys, the way that culture accumulation works and how often things are forgotten. And so I think that this discontinuity that we observe in the historical record between lower primates and humans 
I don't feel like it's, it certainly provides some indication about what kind of change we should expect to see in the context of AI, but I don't feel like it's giving us a really robust indicator that it's a really very closely analogous situation. So that's, that's one important difference. There's like this jump in the evolutionary record. I expect that like, to the extent there's a similar jump, we would see it significantly earlier and we would jump to something significantly dumber than humans. And it's a significant difference, I think, between my view and the view of some, like, I don't know, maybe one third of people who are who think takeoff is likely to be fast. There are, of course, other differences. So in general, like I look at the historical record and I think it feels to me like there's an extremely strong regularity of the form before you're able to make a really great version of something, you're able to make a much, much worse version of something. So for example, before you're able to make a really fast computer, you're able to make a really bad computer. Before you're able to make a really big explosive, you're able to make a really crappy explosive that's like unreliable and extremely expensive. Before you're able to make a robot that's able to like do some very interesting task, you're able to make a robot which is able to do the task with lower reliability or greater expense or in a narrower range of cases. That seems to me like a pretty robust regularity. It seems like it's most robust in cases where like the metric that we're checking is something people are really trying to optimize. So if you're looking at a metric that people aren't trying to optimize, like how many books are there in the world? Like how many books are there in the world is a property that changes discontinuously over the historical record. And I think the the reason for that is just because no one is trying to increase the number of books in the world. It's kind of incidental. Like there's a point in history when books are a relatively inefficient way of doing something. And you switch to books being an efficient way to do something. And the number of books increases dramatically. If you look at a measure people are actually trying to optimize, like how quickly information is transmitted, how many facts the average person knows, et cetera, not the average person, but how many facts someone trying to learn facts knows those metrics aren't going to change discontinuously in the same way that like how many books exist will change. I think how smart is your AI is the kind of thing that's not going to change. Like that's the kind of thing people are really, really pushing on and caring a lot about how economically valuable is your AI. And so I think that this historical regularity like probably applies to the case of AI. There are like a few plausible historical exceptions. I think the strongest one by far is like the nuclear weapons case. But I think that that case first is like, there are a lot of very good a priori arguments for discontinuity around that case that are much, much stronger than the arguments we give for AI. And even as such, I think the extent of the discontinuity is normally overstated by people talking about the historical record. That's a second kind of disagreement. I think like a third kind of disagreement is I think people make a lot of sloppy arguments or arguments that don't quite work. And I think they're like, I feel like a little bit less uncertain because I feel like it's just a matter of if you work through the arguments, they don't really hold together. So I think an example of that is like, I think people often make this argument of imagining your AI as being like a human who makes mistakes sometimes. There's like some epsilon fraction of the time or like fraction of cases where your AI can't do what a human could do. And you're just like decreasing epsilon over time until you hit some critical threshold where now your AI becomes super useful. Like once it's reliable enough, like when it gets to like zero mistakes or, you know, one in a million mistakes. I think that model just like, there's not actually, right, it's kind of looks a priori like a reasonable-ish model, but then you actually think about it, like your AI is not like a human that's degraded in some way. Like if you take a human, you degrade them, there is a discontinuity as you get to like really low levels of degradation. But in fact, your AI is like following along a very different trajectory. The conclusions from that model turn out to be like very specific to the way that you were thinking of AI as like a degraded human. Those are three classes of disagreements. So let's let's take it as given that you're right, that that an AI takeoff will be more gradual than uh, than some people think, although I guess still very fast by by human timescales. Uh, what kind of strategic implications does that have for, for you and me today trying to make that transition go better? I think the biggest strategic question that I, I like think about regularly that's influenced by this is to what extent early developers of AI will have a lot of leeway um, to do what they want with the the AI that they've built, like how much advantage will they have over the rest of the world? So I think some people have a model in which early developers of AI will be at a huge advantage. They can sort of take their time or they can be very picky about how they want to deploy their AI and nevertheless, like radically reshape the world. I think I think that's conceivable, but it, it's much more likely that the early developers of AI will be developing AI in a world that already contains quite a lot of AI that's almost as good. And they really won't have that much breathing room. Like they won't be able to reap a tremendous fall profit. They won't be able to be really picky about how they use their AI. You won't be able to like take your human level AI and like send it out on the internet to like take over every computer because like this will occur in a world where like all the computers that were easy to take over have already been taken over by much dumber AIs. Like it's more like you're existing in the soup of a bunch of very powerful systems. You can't just like go out into a world that, like people imagine something like the world of today and human level AI like venturing out into that world. You know, in, in that scenario, you're able to do an incredible amount of stuff. You're able to like basically steal everyone's stuff if you want to steal everyone's stuff. You're able to win a war if you want to win a war. I think that like that model, so that model I think is less likely under slow takeoff, though it still depends on quantitatively like exactly how slow. And it especially depends on like, you know, maybe there's some way if a military is to develop AI in a way where they like selectively, they could develop AI in a way that would increase the probability of this outcome. 
if they were really aiming for this outcome of having like a decided strategic advantage. If this doesn't happen, if the person who develops side doesn't have this kind of leeway, then they're like, I think the nature of the safety problem changes a little bit. Uh, so in one respect, it's harder because now you really want to be building an AI that can do, like you're not going to be, get to be picky about what tasks you're applying your AI to. You need an AI that can be applied to any task. That is, you need an AI that can like compete with a world full of a bunch of other AIs. It can't just say like, I'm going to focus on this task with a clear definition of what I'm trying to do. Or I'm just going to pick a particular task, which is sufficient to obtain a decided strategic advantage and focus on that one. You really have to say like, based on the way the world is set up, there's a bunch of tasks that people want to apply AI to, and you need to be able to make those AI safe. So in that respect, it makes the problem substantially harder. It makes the problem easier in the sense that now you do get a little bit of a learning period. So like as AI ramps up, people get to see a bunch of stuff going wrong. We get to roll out a bunch of systems and see how they work. And so it's not like there's this one shot, there's this moment where you press the button and then your AI goes and it like either destroys the world or it doesn't. Um, it's more like there's a whole bunch of buttons. Every day you push a new button and like if you mess up, then like you're very unhappy that day, but it's not literally the end of the world until you like push the button like the 60th time. It also changes the nature of like the policy or coordination problem a little bit. So I think it tends to make the coordination problem harder and like changes your sense of exactly what that problem will look like. In particular, it's not, it's unlikely to just be like between two AI developers who are like racing to build a powerful AI and takes over the world. It's more likely that like there are many people developing AI or like, you know, not many, but like, whatever. Let's say there are like a few companies developing AI, which is then being used by a very, very large number of people, both like in law enforcement and in the military and in private industry. And like the kind of agreement you want is then an agreement between like those players. And so like, again, the problem is easier in some sense in that now the military significance is not as clear. Like it's conceivable that like that industry isn't nationalized, that this development isn't being done by military, but it's instead being treated in like a similar way to other strategically important industries. And then it's harder because like, there's not just this one, you don't have to like hold your breath until an AI takes over the world and everything changes. You kind of need to actually set up some like sustainable regime where people are happy with the way AI development is going. People are going to continue to think like engage in normal economic ways as they're like as developing AI. So in that sense, the problem gets harder. So I think both problems, some aspects of the problem, both the technical and policy problems become harder. Some aspects become easier. Yeah, that's, that's a very good answer. That other people disagree with you, though. Uh, wh- what do you think are the chances that you're that you're wrong about this, and uh, what's the counter argument that gives you the the greatest concern? Yeah, I feel pretty uncertain about this question. I think we could try and like quantify an answer to like how fast is takeoff by talking about like how much time elapses between certain benchmarks being met, or like if you have a one year lead in the development of AI, how much of an advantage does that give you um, at various points in the development? I think that, like when I break out like very concrete consequences in the world, like if I ask. Like, how likely is it the person who develops AI will be able to achieve a decisive strategic advantage for some operationalization at some point? Then, like, I find myself disagreeing with other people's probabilities, but I can't disagree that strongly. So, you know, maybe other people will assign, like, a two-thirds probability to that event, and I'll assign, like, a one-fourth probability to that event, which is a pretty big disagreement, um, but certainly doesn't look like either side being, like, confident. Maybe let's say two-thirds versus one-third. Doesn't look like either side being like super confident in their answer and kind of everyone needs to be willing to pursue policies that are robust across that uncertainty. I think the thing that makes me most sympathetic to the fast takeoff view is not like any argument about a qualitative change around human level. It's more an argument just of like, look quantitatively about the speed of development and think about, right, if you were scaling up on this time scale, like if, if every three months you were corresponding to a, your AIs were like equivalent to an animal with a brain twice as large. It would not be many months between like AI that seemed kind of minimally useful and AI that was like conferring a strategic advantage. So I think there's just this quantitative question of exactly how fast is development. And even if there's no qualitative change, you can have development that's fast enough that like it's correctly described as a fast takeoff. And like I think in that case, the the view I've described of the world is like not as accurate. It's we're more like in that scenario where the AI developer like can just keep things under wraps during like these extra nine months. And then if they'd like, have a lot of leeway about what to do. How strong do you think is the argument that people involved in AI alignment uh, work should focus on the fast takeoff scenario, uh, even if it's uh, less likely because they expect to get more leverage personally, uh, if, if that scenario does come to pass? So I think that's a, there's definitely a consideration in that direction. I think it tends to be significantly weaker than the focusing on short time. There's like a similar argument for focusing on short timelines, which I think is quite a bit stronger. I mean, I think that like, so the way that argument runs, the reason you might focus on fast lines or on fast takeoff is because like over the course of a slow takeoff, there'll be lots of opportunities to do additional work and additional experimentation to figure out what's going on. If you have a view where that work can just replace anything you could do now, then like anything you could do now becomes relatively unimportant. 
if you have a view where there's like any kind of complementarity between like work we do now and work that's done. So imagine you have this like, let's say one to two year period where people are like really scrambling, where it becomes clear to many people that there's a serious problem here and we'd like to fix it. Um, if there's any kind of complementarity between the work we do now and the work that they're doing during that period, then that doesn't really undercut doing work now. So like, I think that it's good, like we can in advance do things like understand the nature of the problem, like the nature of the alignment problem, understand much more about how difficult the problem is, set up institutions such that they're prepared to make these investments. And like, I think those things like are maybe a little bit better in fast takeoff worlds, but like, it's not a huge difference, right? I think it's like not more than like, intuitively, I think it's not more than a factor of two, but I haven't thought that much about it. It might be like, maybe somewhat more than that. The short timelines thing, I think is a much larger update. Yeah, tell, tell us about that. Uh, just so if you think that AI might be surprisingly soon, in general, like what surprisingly soon means is that many people are surprised and so they haven't made much investment. And so like in those worlds, there's a lot less, much less has been done. So like if AI was, certainly if AI was developed in like 50 years, like I do not think it's the case that the research I'm doing now could really very plausibly be relevant just because there's so much time that other people are going to have to rediscover the same things. And like, if you get a year ahead now, that means maybe like five years from now, you're 11 months ahead of where you would have been otherwise. And like five years later, you're like eight months ahead of where you would have been otherwise. And like over time, the advantage just shrinks more and more. And like, if AI is developed in 10 years, then like something crazy happened. People were completely, like the world at large has like really been asleep at the wheel if we're going to have human level AI in 10 years. And in that world, like it's just very easy to have a very large impact. And of course, if AI is developed in 50 years, it could happen that like, people are asleep at the wheel in 40 years, but you can kind of just independently make those, I don't know, you can like invest now for the case that people are asleep at the wheel. You don't, aren't really foreclosing the possibility of people being asleep at the wheel in the future. If they're not asleep at the wheel in the future, then like the we do now is like a much lower impact. So it's mostly, I guess, just a neglectedness argument where like, you don't really expect a priori AI to be incredibly neglected. If in fact, like people with short timelines are right, like if the 15% in 10 years, 35% in 20 years is right, then AI is like kind of absurdly neglected at the moment. Right. In, th in that world, what we're currently seeing on ML is not like unjustified hype. It's like desperately trying to catch up to what would be an acceptable level of investment, given the actual probabilities we face. Uh, earlier, you mentioned that if you have kind of this two year period uh, where uh, economic growth has really accelerated uh, in a very visible way, that uh, people would already be freaking out. Um, do you have a vision for exactly what that freaking out would, would look like and um, what implications that, that has? So I think there's different domains and different consequences in different domains. Amongst AI researchers, I think a big consequence is a bunch, that a bunch of discussions that are currently like kind of hypothetical and strange, like when we talk about catastrophic risk posed by AI, or we talk about the possibility of AI much better than humans, or we talk about like most decisions being made by machines, like a bunch of those issues will cease to become, like stop being weird considerations or like speculative arguments. And we'll start being like, this is basically already happening. We're like really freaked out about where this is going. Or like, we feel very visually concerned. And so I think that's a thing that will have a significant effect on like both what kind of research people are doing and also like how open they are to various kinds of coordination. I guess that's a very optimistic view. And I think it's totally plausible that many people are much more pessimistic on that front than I am. But I feel like if we're in this regime, people will really be thinking about powerful AI as a thing that's like clearly coming and they will be thinking about catastrophic risk from AI as like even more clear than powerful AI, just because we'll be living in this world where AI is really... You know, you're already living in a world where stuff is changing too fast for humans to understand in quite a clear way. In some respects, our current world has that character, and that like makes it a lot easier to make this case than it would have been 15 years ago. Um, but that will be much, much more the case in the future. Can you yeah. imagine countries and firms hoarding computational ability because they don't want to allow anyone else to uh, to get in on the game? Uh, so I think mostly I imagine like defaults is just asset prices get bid up a ton. So like, it's not that you hoard, in, hoard computation so much as just like computers become incredibly expensive and that like flows backwards to like semiconductor fabrication becomes incredibly expensive. IP at chip companies becomes relatively valuable that could easily get computed away. So I, I think like to first order, like the sort of economic story is probably what I expect. But then like, I think if you try it, like if you look at the world and you like have imagine asset prices in some area raising by like a factor of 10 over the course of a few years or a year, like I think that it's pretty likely that like the normal, like, I think the, the rough economic story is probably still basically right. Uh, but like markets or like the formal structure of markets is pretty easy to break down in that case. So like you can easily end up in the world where computation is very expensive, but like prices are too sticky for like actual prices to adjust in the correct way. So instead that ends up looking like, you know, computers are still somewhat cheap, but now like effectively they're impossible for everyone to buy or like machine learning hardware is effectively impossible for people to buy at the like nominal price. And that world might look more like people hoarding computation, which I, I would say is mostly a symptom of like, you know, inefficient market worlds, 
It's just the price of your computer has gone up by an absurd amount because everyone thinks like this is incredibly important now and it's hard to produce computers as fast as people want them. And in an inefficient market world that may look like that like ends up looking like freaking out and like takes the form partly of like a policy response instead of a market response and strategic behavior by militaries and large firms. Okay, that has been the discussion of uh, how fast or gradual this transition will be. Uh, let's talk now about when you think this kind of thing might happen. Uh, what's your best guess for yeah AI um, progress timelines? So I normally think about this question uh, in terms of what's the probability of some particular development by 10 or 20 years, rather than thinking about like what is a median, um, because those seem like the most decision relevant numbers, basically. And maybe one could also, if you had very short timelines, give probabilities on less than 10 years. So I think that my probability for like human labor being obsolete within 10 years is probably something in the ballpark of 15%. And within 20 years is something in the ballpark of 35%. And I would then have prior to human labor being obsolete, you have some window of like maybe a few years during which stuff is already getting quite extremely crazy. And like probably AI X risk becomes a big deal. Like, you know, we kind of permanently sunk the ship like somewhat before, one to two years before we actually have human labor being obsolete. Those are my current best guesses. I'm super uncertain about, like I have numbers offhand because I've been asked before, but I still feel like very uncertain about those numbers. And I think it's quite likely they'll change over the coming year. Not just because new evidence comes in, but also because like I continue to reflect on my views. I think that like a lot of people whose views I think are quite reasonable, who push for numbers both higher and lower, or like there are a lot of people making reasonable arguments for numbers both much like shorter timelines than that and longer timelines than that. Overall, I come away like pretty confused with why people currently are as confident as they are in their views. I think compared to the world at large, like the view I've described is incredibly aggressive, like incredibly soon. I think compared to the community of people who think about this a lot, I'm like more like somewhere in, I'm still not in the middle of the distribution, but amongst people who's thinking I most respect, maybe I'm somewhere in the middle of the distribution. And like, uh, I don't quite understand why people come away like with much higher, much lower numbers than that. Like, I don't have a good, it seems to me like the arguments people are making on both sides are like really quite shaky. I can totally imagine that after doing, like after being more thoughtful, I would come away with higher or lower numbers. But I don't like, yeah, I don't feel convinced that people who are much more confident one way or the other have actually done the kind of analysis that I should defer to them on. That said, I also don't think I've done the kind of analysis that other people should really be deferring to me on. Uh, there's been discussion of uh, fire alarms, uh, which are kind of in- indicators that you get ahead of time that you're about to develop a really transformative AI. Do you think that there will be fire alarms that will give us um, you know, several years or five or 10 years notice uh, that this is going to happen? And, and what might those alarms look like? Uh, so I think that the answer to this question depends a lot on, there's like many different ways that I could look, uh, different ways that AI could look have different signs in advance. Um, so I think if AI has developed very soon, say like within the next 20 years, um, I think the best single guess for the way that it looks uh, is like a sort of techniques that we are using are more similar to evolution than they are to learning occurring within like a human brain. And like a way to get indications about where things are going is by comparing how well those techniques are working to how well evolution was able to do with different levels of like different computational resources. Um, so on that perspective, or like in, in that scenario, what I think is the most likely scenario within 20 years, um, I think the most likely fire alarms, like successfully replicating the intelligence of lower animals. So I think like right now we're kind of at the stage where AI systems are like the sophistication is probably somewhere in the range of insect abilities. That's like my current best guess. And I'm like very uncertain about that. I think like as you move from insects to like small vertebrates to like larger vertebrates up to mice and then birds and so on, like... I think it becomes much, much more obvious. Like it's easier to make this comparison and the behaviors become like more like qualitatively distinct. Um, also just every order of magnitude gets you like an order of magnitude closer to humans. So I think before having broadly human level AI, a reasonably good warning sign would be like, you know, broadly lizard level, broadly mouse level AI. Uh, that is like learning algorithms, which are able to do about as well as a mouse in a distribution of environments about as broad as the distribution environments that mice are evolved to handle. I think that's a bit of a problematic alarm for two reasons. One, that like it's actually quite difficult to get a distribution of environments as broad as the distribution that a mouse faces. So there's likely to be remaining concern. Like if you can replicate everything a mouse can do in a lab, that's maybe not so impressive. And it's very difficult to actually test for some distribution of environments. Is it really flexing like the most impressive mouse skills? I think that won't be a huge problem for people like for each person, a very reasonable person looking at the evidence, I think we'll still be able to get a good indication, but it'll be a huge problem for like establishing consensus about what's going on. Um, so that's one problem. And the other problem was this issue I mentioned where like it seems like transformative impact should come significantly before broadly human level AI. 
So I think that a mouse level AI would probably not give you that much warning or broadly mouse level AI would probably not give you that much warning. And so you need to be able to look like a little bit earlier than mice. It's plausible that like, in fact, one should be regarding like, one should really be diving into the comparison to index now and saying like, can we really do this? And like, it's plausible to me that that's like the kind of like, if we're in this world where our procedures are similar to evolution, it's plausible to me the insect thing should be like a, a good indication or like one of the better indications that we'll be able to get in advance. There was this uh, recent blog post that was doing the rounds on social media called uh, An AI Winter is Coming, uh, which was broadly making the argument that people are realizing that current machine learning techniques can't do the things that people have been hoping that they'll be able to do over the last uh, couple of years, that the range of situations they can handle is much more limited, and that uh, this the author expects that uh, the economic opportunities for them are, are going to dry up somewhat, and, in, and investment will will shrink, uh, as as we've seen. Uh, so 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 uh, they claim uh, in the past when there's been a lot of enthusiasm about AI, and then it hasn't uh, actually been able to to do the to do the things that were claimed. Do you think there's um, much chance that that's correct? And what, what's your what's your general take on this uh, AI boom, AI winter view? Uh, so I think that the the position at post or like the somewhat. I feel like the position in that post is fairly extreme in a way that's not very plausible. So, for example, I think the author of that post is like pessimistic about self-driving cars actually working because they won't be sufficiently reliable. I think that like it's correct to be like this is a hard problem. I think that like I would be extremely happy to take a bet at pretty good odds against like the world they're imagining. And so I guess I, I also feel somewhat similarly about robotics at this point. Like I think what we're currently able to do in the lab is like approaching good enough that industrial robotics can like that's a big. If the technology is able to work well, it's a lot of value. I think what we're able to do in the lab is like a very strong indication that like that is going to work in the reasonably short term. So I think those things are pretty good indications that that say like current investment in the field is probably justified by or like, you know, the level of investment is plausible given the level of applications that we can foresee quite easily. Though the form, I don't want to comment on the form of investment. There's like maybe a second. So I don't, yeah, I think I don't consider like the argument in the post. I think the arguments in the post are like kind of wacky and like not very careful. Um, I think one thing that like makes it a little bit tricky is this comparison. Like if, if you're doing, if you compare the kind of AI we're building now to human intelligence, I think like literally until the very end, actually probably after the very end, you're just going to be like, look, there's all these things humans can do that our algorithms can't do. I think like a, one problem is that's just kind of a terrible way to do the comparison. Like that's the kind of comparison that is predictably going to leave you like being really skeptical until like the very, very end. I think there's another question, which is like, maybe this is actually what they were getting at, which is... um like there's a sense maybe amongst the, especially certainly deep learning true believers at the moment, that you can just like take existing techniques and scale them quite far. Like if you just keep going, like things are going to keep getting better and better and we're going to get all the way to powerful AI like that. I think it's like a quite interesting question whether that is like, if we're in that world, then we're just going to see machine learning like continue to grow. So then we would not be in a bubble. We would be in like the beginning of like this ramp up to spending some substantial fraction of GDP on machine learning. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that like some applications are going to work well. So maybe we'll get like some simple robotics applications working well, which could be quite large. So that could easily have impacts in like, you know, hundreds of billions or trillions of dollars, but like things are going to dry up long before they get to human level. I think that seems quite conceivable. I would maybe be like, maybe I think it's like a little bit more likely than not that like at some point things pull back. I mean, it's like somewhat less than less than 50% that like the current wave of enthusiasm is going to just continue going up until we build human level AI. But I also think that iPod, that's like kind of plausible. I think people are like, they really want to like call bubbles in a way that like results in a lot of irrationality. I think like Scott Sumner writes about this a lot and I like mostly agree with his take. Like when enthusiasm about something gets really high, that doesn't mean it's like guaranteed that it's going to continue going up. It can just be a bet that like there's a one third chance that's going to continue going up or one half chance. And I think that like people are, yeah, they're really happy about being self-satisfied after calling a bubble, after calling like a level of enthusiasm that's unjustified. Sometimes they're right ex ante. And like the fact that there are some people who are right, like sometimes those calls are right ex ante makes it a lot more like attractive to take this position. But I think a lot of the time, like, you know, ex post, it was fine to say like this was a bubble, but ex ante, I think like it's worth investing a bunch on the possibility that like something is really, really important. I think that's kind of where we're at. I think that the arguments people are making that like deep learning is doomed are like mostly pretty weak. Um, for example, because they're like comparing deep learning to like human intelligence. And it's just like not the way to run this extrapolation. Like the way to run the extrapolation is to think about how tiny existing models are compared to the brain. Think about like on the model where we'll be able to do a brain in 10 or 20 years, what should we be able to do now and actually make that comparison instead of trying to say like, look at all these tasks humans can do. 
what kinds of things um, should people do um, before we have an artificial in in general intelligence in order to, I guess, protect themselves financially if if they're potentially going to to lose their jobs? Is there there really anything meaningful that that people can do to to shield themselves from potentially negative effects? So if like the world continues to go well, so if all that happens is that we build AI and it just works the way that it would work in efficient market worlds, there's no like crazy turbulence. Then the main change is you shift from like having the so currently like two thirds of GDP gets paid out roughly as income. I think if you have a transition to human labor being obsolete, then you fall to like roughly zero of GDP is paid out as income and all of it is paid out as returns on capital. So from the perspective of a normal person, like really like you sort of either want to be benefiting from capital indirectly, by like living in a state that like uses capital to fund redistribution, or you just want to have some savings. Like there's a question of how you'd want to like... The market is not really anticipating AI being a huge thing over 10 or 20 years. So you might want to like further hedge and say, like, if you thought this was pretty likely, then you might want to take a bet against the market and say, like, invest in stuff that's going to be extra valuable in those cases. I think that like mostly like the very naive guess is like not a crazy guess for how to do that. Like investing more in tech companies. I like I'm pretty optimistic about investing in semiconductor companies. Uh, Chip companies seem reasonable. A bunch of stuff that's complementary to AI is going to become valuable. So like natural resources bid up. Again, inefficient market world, the price of natural resources is like one of the main things that benefits. As you make human labor really cheap, you just become limited on resources a lot. People who own like like Amazon presumably benefits a huge amount. People who run logistics, people who run manufacturing, etc. I think that like generally just owning capital seems pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, like right now is not a great time to be investing. But like still, I think that's uh, not a not a dominant consideration when determining how much you should save. Oh, uh, you, you say it's it's bad just because the stock market in general looks overvalued based on like press to earnings ratios? Yeah, it's hard to know what overvalued means exactly. But certainly like, yeah, it seems reasonable to think of it in terms of like, if you buy a dollar of stocks, like how much earnings are there to go around for that dollar of stocks? And like, it's pretty low, pretty unusually low. This might be how it is forever. I guess like if you have the kind of view that I'm describing, like if you think we're going to move to an economy that's growing extremely rapidly, then you kind of have to bet that like uh, the rate of return on capital is going to go up. And so it's kind of, in some sense, you need to invest early. Um, because you want to actually be owning physical assets since that's where all of the value is going to accrue. But like, it's a bummer to lock in like relatively low rates of return. In the in the normal scenario where that doesn't happen? Uh, no, in the, even in, like, suppose I like make someone a loan. Yeah. Like a way people normally hold capital would be like making a loan. You make a loan now, you make a loan at like 1% real interest for 20 years. You're pretty bummed if then people develop AI and like now the economy is growing like by 25% a year, like your 1% a year loan is like looking pretty crappy. Right, yeah. Um, and you're like pretty unhappy you hold that. So stocks are a little bit better than that, but it depends a lot on like, yeah, stocks still take a little bit of a beating from that. Um, so I think this generally is like a consideration that undercuts like the basic, I think the basic thing you would do if you expected AI would be like save more, or like own more capital if you can. I think that's like undercut a little bit by like the market being priced such that's hard, which could be a bunch of people doing that. I think that's not why it's happening. Like prices aren't being bid up because everyone is reasoning in this way. Prices are being bid up just because of like unrelated cyclical factors. Let's talk now about some of the actual technical ideas you've had for how to make machine learning uh, safer. One of those has been called uh, Iterated Intelligence Distillation and Amplification, or and sometimes abbreviated as, as IDA. Uh, what is that idea uh, in, in a nutshell? I think the starting point is realizing that it is easier to train an AI system, or it currently seems easier to train an aligned AI system, if you have access to some kind of overseer that's smarter than the AI you're trying to train. It's like a lot of the traditional arguments about why alignment is really hard or why the problem might be intractably difficult really push on the fact that you're trying to train, like say a super intelligence and you're just a human. And similarly, like if you look at existing techniques, if you look at the kind of work people are currently doing in like more mainstream alignment work, it's often kind of implicitly predicated on the assumption that there's like a human who can understand what the AI is doing or there's a human who can behave kind of close to approximately rational, or a human who can evaluate how good the AI system's behavior is, or a human who can like peer in at what the AI system is thinking and make sense of that decision process. And sometimes this dependence is a little bit subtle, but it seems to me like it's extremely common. Like even when people aren't acknowledging explicitly, a lot of the techniques are going to have a hard time scaling to domains where the AI is a lot smarter than the overseer who's training it. So I think motivated by that observation, you could say, let's try and split the alignment problem into like two parts, one of which is try and train an aligned AI, assuming that you have an overseer smarter than that AI. And the second part is like actually produce an overseer who's smart enough to use that process or smart enough to train that AI. So the idea in iterated amplification is to start from a weak AI. At the beginning of training, you can use a human, like a human is smarter than your AI, so they can train the system. As the AI acquires capabilities that are like comparable to those of a human, 
Then the human can use the AI that they're currently training as an assistant to help them act as a more competent overseer. So over the course of training, you have this AI that's getting more and more competent, and the human at every point in time uses several copies of the current AI as assistants to help them make smarter decisions. And the hope is that that process both preserves alignment and allows this overseer to always be smarter than the AI that they're trying to train. And so the, the key steps of the analysis there are both solving this problem, the first problem I mentioned of like training an AI given that you have a smarter overseer, and then actually analyzing the behavior of the system consisting of a human plus several copies of the current AI acting as assistance to the human to help them make good decisions. Um, so in particular, as you move along in training, like by the end of training, the human's role becomes kind of minimal, like if we imagine training super intelligence. And in that regime, we're just saying, can you somehow put together several copies of your current AI to act as the overseer? So you have this AI like trying to, hopefully at each step it remains aligned, you put together a few copies of the AI to like act as an overseer for itself. How is it that the kind of training AI uh, and and the human are going to be smarter than the AI that they're that they're trying to train? Which I mean, I mean they're trying to make something that's smarter than them, right? But you're saying that that as a, that in combination they can do a better job. Yeah. So the key step there, the reason why it's plausible, like let's suppose we're we're trying to train our AI. It's at some level of capability. Suppose that you imagine like the AI gets to think for like two seconds before a decision it makes. Then when in this oversight process we have multiple copies of the AI, each thinking for two seconds. Uh, so if you imagine this in like an analogy to humans, you have like one smart human who's making a decision and they're being overseen by like a team of like 20 slightly less smart humans. And when I say slightly, I really mean slightly, like they're one gradient step behind. So the hope is that like, and this is a like complicated question or like an open question at the moment. If you have this team of like 20 very slightly dumber aligned agents, then can they sort of divide up the work of overseeing this AI um, so that they can... Yeah, so that even though they're a tiny bit dumber, by working together, they can do it. Okay, so is, is the idea that, yeah, by throwing more processing power or more instances behind the somewhat dumber algorithm, they'll be smarter than the AI that they're trying to train and therefore able to, I don't know, keep it under control and give it good instructions uh, in concert with the human? Uh, that's roughly right, yeah. So in particular, when we ask, like, what does this team have to do? We have this overseer, which is now a team of AIs working together. What does the team have to actually do? There may be like two big classes of tasks they have to do. So one is they're going to like provide the incentives to the AI. So this team is going to like look, right? Our AI is going to take some action. Then our team of overseer AIs is going to evaluate that action and decide how good it was. And that's going to be the reward signal that we use to train our AI. So in order for that to work, this team of 20 AIs needs to be able to make a better judgment about how good actions are than the AI that they're trying to train, right? Because they can't, they sort of using this process, can't really train an AI to make smarter decisions than that team would make. And so there we hope that you can sort of break down, there's this question, like how good an action was action X? You hope that you can like break down the problem of evaluating that action into a bunch of tasks, each of which are a little bit easier. And you can sort of split up those tasks across this team. So that's one of the tasks that the team needs to be able to do, this evaluation, answer these evaluation questions. There's a second category that we don't understand as well, which is like, they would like to ensure that the AI they're training reliably does the thing they're trying to incentivize it to do. So for example, or an example of a technique um, called adversarial training that you could use for this problem is if I'm training some AI, I'm concerned that in some situations it might behave badly. I can try and synthesize situations. I can try and construct handcrafted situations designed to look like our situations where the AI might behave badly. And I can, instead of running this AI just on real examples, I also run it on these synthetic examples designed to cause problems. And so in order to do that, I need to be able to do tasks like look at the AI and figure out like what are the synthetic, what are the cases where it would perform poorly? And then also evaluate in such a case, like, did it do something unacceptable? So I think it's not crazy to think about this with an analogy to humans. So you're like, again, you have your team of 20 humans, you have one like slightly smarter human who maybe is like, you know, you're concerned that under some conditions, they're going to try and like break this process. They're going to try and go like, go rogue, do something bad. And like this team of 20 humans is responsible for like interrogating this human and like making sure there's not a condition under which it's going to behave poorly. It's so, like giving it test cases that hopefully it can't tell, the human being trained can't tell from like the real situations it's going to encounter. That's an example of a technique that you could use for this problem of reliability. There are like other possible techniques you could use. And those are the two, those are the two big tasks this team of humans needs to be, or this team of AIs needs to be able to solve. There's a team of humans in the analogy, but this team needs to be able to evaluate behavior to produce good incentives, to train the AI to do what the team wants it to do. And it needs to be able to do some evaluation for reliability, which is not something we currently understand well. So at its core, you're, you're going to try to get somewhat dumber AIs and humans together to come up with a training process by which they figure out whether this smarter AI that they're trying to develop 
uh, is behaving in the way that they want by designing particular scenarios to, to test whether that's the case. And even though they're like not quite as smart, I guess, in, in, in this model, uh, because they because you're throwing quite a lot of power behind that somewhat simpler uh, task of just evaluating whether uh, it's doing the right thing. Uh, you, you hope that that way you'll be able to to gradually scale up and and not lose alignment at any particular point in time. Uh, yeah, that's right. So I guess it's worth pointing out again that the, the like generating scenarios that's like one possible way of testing, like trying to get the system to behave robustly, like robustly do the right thing. There are other possible approaches. So like you could also try and use an approach where you like open up the brain of this AI you're trying to train. So use something like interpretability techniques that people are currently working on to understand like how it's thinking and say, ah, now that I understand how it's thinking, I see that like, here's a place where it's thinking in a way that I wouldn't have wanted it to be thinking. And like, I can tell from that that it will fail in the scenario, or I can just directly say like, no, that was not a good way to be thinking about the problem and penalize that. One of the major things this group is doing is like just determining incentives for the AI they're training. So this team of slightly dumber humans is just determining what constant, yeah. They're like evaluating the AI on realistic examples, like on examples that appear in the real world and saying, how good was its behavior in this case? How good was its behavior in that case? And the AI is being trained to maximize those evaluations. Yeah. Okay. So uh, by incentives, you mean kind of, do we, do we give it its reward? Do we give it whatever it's been programmed to try to, to get? Yeah. So, I mean, formally it's like, you would really be using gradient descent where you're like, yep, we take our AI, we take this evaluation that this team is providing. And then we like modify the AI very slightly so that it gets a slightly higher reward on that. It gets a slightly higher evaluation or it outputs actions that have higher evaluations on average. And in that setting, like actually the AI that you're starting with is exactly the same as the AIs who are on this team doing the oversight. But like after you make this very small perturbation, that perturbation now hopefully gives you an AI that's very slightly smarter than the AIs on the team. It's the AI that's actually thinking is like exactly as smart as the ones on the team. It's only as you consider these possible perturbations that you hope that the perturbations are like epsilon smarter. And that's that's how training would normally work. We'd have like some evaluation, consider AI, run it, perturb it to get slightly better performance, repeat. Okay, yes. Yeah, so someone someone uh, emailed me about um, IDA wanting me to ask you about it and, and said... Uh... Um, the context here is that I and many others think that uh, IDA is currently the most promising approach to solving the alignment problem, largely because it's the only real actual proposal that anyone has made. Do, do you think that's right? And and more generally, what, what's been the, the reaction to, to this general approach? Yeah. Um, so I would say the current situation is I am very interested in really asking what solutions would look like in like as you scale them up. Like, what is our actual game plan? What is the actual end game here? That's a question that relatively few people are interested in, and so very few people are working on. Miri, like the Machine Intelligence Research Institute, is very interested in that question, but they part ways with me by believing that like that question is so obviously impossible that it's like not worth thinking about it directly. Instead, we should be trying to improve our understanding of like the nature of rational agency. So that's the reason maybe why they are not in the business of trying to produce concrete proposals. It just seems doomed to them. It feels to them like it's patching holes in a thing that's fundamentally not going to work. Most people in the broader ML community, like I, I would say they take an attitude that's more like, we don't really know how the system is going to work until we build it. So it's like not that valuable to think about in advance, like what is the actual scheme going to look like? And so that's the difference there. I think that's also true for many safety researchers who are like most, or like more traditional um, AI or ML researchers. Like they would more often say like, look, I have a kind of general plan. I'm not going to think in great detail about what that plan is going to look like because I don't think that thinking is productive. But I'm going to try and like vaguely explain the intuitions, like maybe something like this could work. I think it sort of happens to be the case, like basically no one is engaged in the project of like actually say, here's what the land AI might look like. I'm trying to aspire to the goal of like actually write down a scheme that could work. There are a few other groups that are also doing that. Um, I guess so at, at the OpenAI safety team, uh, we also recently published this paper on safety via debate, which I think also has this form of like being a candidate, like an actual candidate solution or something that's aspiring to be a scalable solution to this problem. Um, so Jeffrey Irving was lead author on that. He's like a colleague at, on the OpenAI safety team. And I think that's like coming from a very similar place and like maybe is, is in some sense is a very similar proposal. I think it's very likely that either both of these proposals work or neither of them works. Huh. So in that sense, they're not really like totally independent proposals, but they're like getting at, yeah, they're really pushing on kind of the same facts about the world to let you make AI. Both of them are leveraging AI to help you evaluate your AI. I think the other like big category is work on inverse reinforcement learning, where people are attempting to sort of invert through human behavior and say, given what a human did, here's what the human wants. Given what the human wants, we can come up with better plans to get what the human wants. And maybe that approach can be scalable. I think the current state of affairs on that is there are like some very fundamental problems with making it work, like with scaling it up related to like, how do you actually define what it is that a human wants? Like, how do you relate human behavior 
to human preferences, given that like humans aren't really the kind of creature that actually has like there's no slot in the human brain that's like where you put the preferences. And I think unfortunately we haven't made super much progress on like that like sort of core of the problem or like from the what what I would consider the core of the problem. I think that's related to like people in that area, like not thinking of that as being their current primary goal. That is, they're not really in the business of like saying, and we're going to try and write down something that's just going to work no matter how powerful AI gets. They're more in the business saying like, let's understand, like clarify the nature of the problem, make some progress, try and get some intuition for like what will allow us to further progress and like how we could get ourselves in a position where like as AI improves, we'll be able to adapt to that. But I think it's not a crazy perspective, but I think that's how we come to be in this place where like there are very, very few concrete proposals that are aspiring to be like actual a scheme you could write down and then run with AI and would actually yield the land AI. I think like overall reaction is like there's kind of two there's two kinds of criticisms people have. One of which is this problem seems just completely hopeless. So there's a few reasons people would think that this iterative amplification approach is completely hopeless. They're normally can be divided roughly into thinking that like organizing a team of 20 AIs to be aligned and smarter than the individual AIs sort of already subsumes the entire alignment problem. Like in order to do that, you would need to understand like how to solve alignment in a very deep way, such that if you understood that, there'd be no need to do any of this, bother with any of the other machinery. Um, The second common concern is that like this robustness problem is just impossibly difficult. So in this iterative amplification scheme, as we produce an AI, we need to verify, not only do we need to incentivize the AI to do well on the training distribution, we also need to sort of restrict it to not behave really badly off of the training distribution. And like, there are a bunch of plausible approaches to that that people are currently exploring in the machine learning community. But it's, I think the current situation is, we don't see a fundamental reason that's impossible, but it currently looks really hard. And so it's, many people are like suspicious that problem might be impossible. So that's one kind of negative response is this, like, maybe the problem, like iterative amplification cannot be made to work. The other kind of response is, it's reasonably likely that AI safety is sort of easy enough that we also don't need any of this machinery. Uh, that is... You know, I've described this procedure for trying to oversee AI systems that are like significantly smarter than humans. Many of the problems on this perspective are only problems when you want things to be scalable to very, very smart AI systems. You might think instead, like, look, we just want to build an AI that can like take one quote, like pivotal act. There's an expression people sometimes use for like an action AI could take that would substantially improve our situation with respect to the alignment problem. So they say we want to build an AI which is like able to safely take like one pivotal act. That doesn't require being radically smarter than human or taking actions that are not understandable to a human. So we should really not be focusing on or like thinking that much about like techniques that work in this like weird extreme regime. And I guess even people like in the broader ML community would say like, look, I don't know, like they don't necessarily buy into this framework of like you need to take a pivotal act, but they would still say, look, you're worrying about a problem which is quite distant. It's pretty likely that for one reason or another, that problem is going to be very easy by the time we get there or that like one of these other approaches we can identify is just going to sort of turn out to work fine. Um, I think both those reactions are quite common. I think there's also a reasonably big crowd of people who are like, yeah, I'm really interested. It's like come from a similar perspective to me where they really want like a concrete proposal that they can actually see how it could work. I think that like those people tend to be, well, for those who aren't incredibly pessimistic about this proposal, many of them are pretty optimistic about like iterative amplification or a debate or something along those lines. That's a great answer. Yeah, I think it's really credible that you actually try to put out ideas for how we could deal with this. And I've seen, as you say, uh, very few other people uh, actually try to do that. And, and people can just read those ideas for themselves on your AI alignment blog on, on Medium. You, you mentioned there uh, another approach that people have been talking about recently, which is the uh, d- debate as a, as a way of uh, aligning AI. You also mentioned uh, in- inverse reinforcement learning, but uh, we, we discussed that in the episode last year with Dario Amade. So we'll skip that one. But uh, can you just describe the approach uh, in, in, in the debate paper, uh, which, which which is somewhat similar, it sounds like, to, to IDA? Yeah. So the idea is uh, we're we're interested in turning AI systems to make decisions that are, in some respects, too complicated for a human to understand. It's worth pointing out that problem can appear long before AI is broadly human level because AI's capabilities are very uneven, so it can like have understanding of a domain that are way beyond human understanding of that domain, even while being subhuman in many respects. We want to train this AI to make decisions that are too complex for a human to understand. We're wondering, how do you get a training signal for such an AI? One way, one approach people often take is like pick some actual consequence in the world, like some simple consequence in the world that you can optimize. Like, you know, whatever, you're running a company, just I don't care how you're making decisions about that company. All I care about is that they lead to the company having high profit. We're interested in moving away from, they're like, I think there's serious concerns with that from a safety perspective. We want to move more towards the regime where like, instead of evaluating like, yes, this decision had good consequences, but I don't understand why. We're evaluating a proposed decision and saying, yeah, we understand that that's a good decision. 
So we're going to give it a high reward because we understand why it's good. That approach has, I mean, if an AI comes to you and says, I would like to design the particle accelerator this way because, and then makes you an inscrutable argument about physics, you're kind of faced with this tough choice. Like you can either sign off on that decision and just see if it has good consequences, or it can be like, no, don't do that because I don't understand it. But then you're going to be like sort of permanently foreclosing some large space of possible things your AI could do. So instead, the proposal is we're going to have two AIs. One AI is going to make a proposal. We can't directly, like that proposal depends on a bunch of complicated facts we don't necessarily understand. Like it's going to make some complicated argument about the economy in order to justify that proposal. And we couldn't actually evaluate that argument. But if we introduce this adversarial agent who can explain to us like why the proposal that was made is bad, and then the original agent, right, if this critique has a flaw, the original agent can say like, no, that critique is not like a valid critique because, and then point out the flaw. And then the, the critiquer can say, no, like actually it was valid. So they can go back and forth in this way. Then you can kind of implicitly explore an exponentially large space of considerations, right? Because like, by giving the critiquer the option to pick any line of argument that they want in order to attack the proposal, you can sort of verify that every possible line of argument, right, if the critiquer is not able to win, it suggests to you that every possible line of argument would have been unsuccessful. Every possible line of argument would have still left you thinking the proposal was a good one. Uh, so it's not clear if you can actually construct. So now we have some complicated question. Our AI is proposing to us an action. We would like to set up the debate such that the best action will actually win the debate. So if two AIs propose actions and one of them is proposing an, an action which is actually better, then it will be able to win a debate in which it establishes that its action is better. I think there are some plausibility arguments, like the one I just gave, you're exploring an exponentially large space of considerations, that this might be possible in cases where a human couldn't have any idea about the task itself or directly answering the question. It's a very open question, exactly how powerful is debate? That is, if we set up a debate in the best possible way, so we give it, we, we have some human judge of this debate who's evaluating the claims and counterclaims. If we give them like optimal training and optimal advice, and then we have two very powerful agents debate in this way, we'd like it to be the case that the optimal strategy in that debate is being honest and actually telling the truth, and then actually providing like valid arguments for that and responding to counter arguments in a valid way. I think we don't know if that's the case, but figuring out if that's the case and then, yeah, like understanding in what cases we're able to run such debates and it converges to truth, understanding how to set them up so they converge to truth, et cetera, does give like a plausible way of training very powerful AI systems. So how analogous is this uh, approach to a, a case where, say, a, a person like me is trying to judge a difficult scientific issue and I wouldn't be capable of doing the original research and figuring out the truth myself. But if there was, you know, scientists debating back and forth, and one of them maybe was trying to be misleading in some way, but uh, and, and another one was was being truthful. The hope is that I would be able to figure out which one was uh, telling the truth, uh, because I can I can at least evaluate deba the debate, even if I couldn't produce the arguments myself. Yeah, so I think the situation is pretty analogous to two human experts with lots of understanding you lack. You're trying to understand the truth. You hope that if one of those experts is trying to make a claim that is true, then you know, by like zooming in on one consideration after another, you could find out that it's true. Um, you could eventually come to become very skeptical of all the counter arguments where yeah. they could undermine all the counter arguments that were offered and so on. Um, so I think that's like, uh, it's definitely not an obvious claim. It's not obvious in the context of human discussions. I think like as a society, we don't empirically, there aren't great examples of covering really big gaps in expertise. Like it's often the case that two people with expertise in an area can have a debate in a way that convinces someone with like slightly less expertise. Mm -hmm. But when there's really large gaps, I don't have a very good record of doing that kind of thing successfully. So I'd say there's like more hope that this is possible than that a human could just directly evaluate some proposal produced by a sophisticated AI system. Uh, but it's still very much an open question whether this kind of thing can actually work. And one way you could try and assess that would be say we're going to like get fairly serious about or like have some serious experiments of trying to take people with considerable expertise in an area and have them have a debate arbitrated by someone with less expertise. What do you think is the is the biggest uh, or most concerning criticism of a kind of AI safety uh, via debate? I'd say personally, I think the worst problem is just... This like basic question, do debates tend to favor accurate answers or do they tend to favor answers that are easy to defend for reasons other than their accuracy? So there's a bunch of reasons that the debate might favor an answer other than it being accurate. So I think one that really leaps to people's mind is like, well, the judge is just a human. Humans have all sorts of biases and inconsistencies. So that's one reason that debate could favor answers other than the accurate one. I'm sort of more personally concerned about maybe an even more basic question, which is like setting aside all human biases and like all ways in which humans like fail to reason well. I think it's just an open question. Does the structure of debate tend to promote truth? Like, does it tend to be the case that there's some way to argue for the accurate position, even if the content of the debate, like the thing you're debating is really, really complex compared to what the human can understand? It's, it seems like debate among humans is, is way better than random anyway. I agree that humans are, and clearly we're able to get, at least in some cases, able to get much better answers than we get on our own. Like if I get to observe two experts debate a subject, 
even if one of them is actively trying to mislead me, I can arrive at a better conclusion than I could have arrived at if I just like wasn't able to listen to their expertise or was only given like a single expert whose incentive was just to like look good. I think that the example of debates amongst humans like makes it very unclear whether this procedure can be scaled arbitrarily far. So like an example you might think of is like consider a human who's like a smart person who like knows a lot about reason, who has been like practiced a lot of judging debates. They don't know any calculus. They're not judging a debate between like two quantum physicists about how to interpret the results of some experiment and a recent particle accelerator. Just imagining that process, like I can see how it could work. I can imagine it working, but it's like an incredibly intimidating prospect. Just like this person is not going to understand anything about like over the course of the debate, there's no way that they can form in their head like a reasonable model of calculus or of quantum mechanics or of the standard model. And like, yet you hope that somehow the way they're arbitrating this debate can implicitly like answer extremely complex questions about that depend on all of those areas. So I think this is a kind of test that you can do empirically. Like we can ask the empirical question for a human who's like very good at, you know, a very smart person who's been trained to judge such debates. And then you have like two people with a ton of expertise in an area they've never thought about to come in, one of them trying to convince them of the truth and one trying to mislead them. Like, is it the case empirically that humans can arbitrate such debates and actually like that the best way to win such a debate is to provide true facts about the domain to the human. I think that like, if that's the case, I think it's actually, you know, if that's the case, it's a very interesting fact, not just for this, like not just for the purpose of training AI, but just in general, I think it prime faster is just a really important question about the world. Like, are there norms of debate that allow you to consistently arrive at the truth in domains where the arbitrator like doesn't understand what's true? That's like a question that's relevant to a ton of domains. This version of the question is like a little bit, it's distinctive in some respects, I think mostly it's distinctive because like we are free to set things up in the way that's like maximally convenient. So it's kind of asking like under the best possible conditions can debate be conducive to truth. Whereas like most debates that occur in society occur under like pretty highly suboptimal conditions of like very limited time, bad incentives on behalf of the judge, judges sampled from some population that like doesn't have a lot of time to think about how to judge such debates well, or like isn't that like hasn't thought a lot about how to structure this to lead to truth. So I think like most debates in the real world like are under pretty pessimistic conditions, but just understanding like when does debate work or when is the equilibrium of debate truth, I think is like a really, I don't know, I would consider that like a really fundamental and interesting question completely independent of AI. I think it's like now also a particularly important question because it really is closely related to like one of the most plausible strategies for training very powerful AIs to like help us actually arrive at like good advice or good conclusions. Are there other um, important pros and cons of, of this approach that are worth mentioning? Uh, so I think there's, there's definitely a a lot to, that could be said about it. There are a bunch of other issues that come up like when you actually start trying to do machine learning, so when you try and train agents to play this kind of game, then there's lots of ways that that can be hard as a machine learning problem. You could have lots of concerns in particular with the dynamics of this game. Um, so some people like maybe wouldn't be happy that you have like your training area has to be really persuasive to people. Hmm. You might be concerned that makes some kinds of failure modes look more, crop up in more subtle ways or be more problematic. Um, but I really think the main thing is just is it the case that a sufficiently sophisticated judge will be able, you know, every judge defines a different game, like convincing me is a different game from convincing you. Yeah. I think it's probably clear that for weak enough judges, this game isn't particularly truth conducive. Like there's no reason that the honest player would have an advantage. Yeah. The hope is that there's some level of sufficiently strong judges above which it's the case that you converge over long, longer debates to more accurate claims. Yeah, and it's unclear. Even so first question is, this is a threshold. And the second question, are humans actually above that threshold? This is the case that like, if we have humans judge such debates, they will actually have honest strategies winning. What kind of people do you need to, to pursue this research? Are there, are there any differences compared with other, other lines? Uh, so again, I think there's like a very similar, there's a bunch of different questions that come up, both for amplification and debate. I think different questions require different kinds of skill or different backgrounds. Uh, I think that both for amplification and debate, there's this like a more conceptual question or like, I don't know if conceptual is the right word. It's a fact both about like the structure of argument and about the actual like way that humans make decisions, mm -hmm. which is like, can humans arbitrate these debates and demands where they lack expertise? Or in the amplification case, can you have teams like addressing some issue where no individual can understand the big picture? And that, I, uh, I mean, there's a bunch of different angles you could take on that question, right? So you could take a more philosophical angle and say like, what is the, like, what is going on there? Why should we expect this to be true? Or what are the cases that might be really hard? Mm -hmm. You could also just run experiments among people, which seems relatively promising, but involves obviously a different set of skills. Or you could try and study it in the context of machine learning and go straight for like training. But you might say, well, if we could test these things with humans, if we had very large numbers of humans, then maybe actually the easiest way to test it is to be in the regime where we can train machines to effectively like, yeah, do things that are much, much more expensive than what we could afford to do with humans. So you could imagine approaching it from like a more philosophical perspective, a more like, I don't know, cognitive science or just like organizing, like maybe not even an academic perspective, but just to like putting together a bunch of humans and understanding how those groups behave or a like more machine learning perspective. 
What's been the reception uh, from other groups to, to this uh, debate approach? Uh, so I think there's there are many different groups and different answers for different groups. I would say that for many people, like the nature of the problem or the alignment problem is like very unclear when they first hear it stated in an abstract way. And so I think for a lot of people, it's been very helpful to get a clear sense of like what the problem is that you're trying to solve. And like, so I think when you, when you throw out this proposal, people both understand why debates are better than just giving an answer and then having human evaluate it. And they also can sort of see very clearly why there's difficulty. Like it's not obvious that the outcome of a debate is in fact producing the right answer. So I think from that perspective, it's been extremely helpful and having like people, I think a lot of people have really been able to like get much more purchase on understanding what, like what the difficulties are and what we're trying to do. I think for people who are more in like the ML side, Again, it's still been very helpful for having them understand what what we're trying to do. But I think the ML community is like really very focused on like a certain kind of implementation and actually building the thing. Yeah. And so I think that community is mostly just sort of waiting to like that's a very interesting research direction. And then their response is like to wait until things either happen or don't happen, like until we've actually built systems that embody those principles to do something which you wouldn't have been able to do without without that idea. So if we can use this approach to go from having like 60% accuracy to 70% or 80% accuracy, like how, how useful is that? Do, do we need to be able to judge these things correctly almost all of the time? Or is it more just like the, the more often humans can make the right call, the, the better? Yeah, so certainly if you just had a judge who was like correct, but then 40% of the time they err randomly, yeah. that would be totally fine because that's sort of going to average out and it's not a problem at all. Um, what you really care about is just like in what cases are there to what extent are there like systematic biases in these judgments so to mm-hmm. extent we just consistently make the wrong answer when the answer depends on certain considerations or in certain domains and so for that from that perspective like i guess the question is what class of problems can you successfully resolve with this technique and like if you push that frontier of problems a little bit further if you can solve a few more problems now than you could before are you happy i would say there's kind of two attitudes you could have on this so one i guess the thing i really would like is a solution that just works in the sense that we have some principled reason to think it works. It works empirically. As we scale up our machine learning systems, it works better and better. And we don't expect that to break down. That would be like really great. And sort of as from a more theoretical perspective, that's kind of what we'd like. There's a second perspective you could have, which is just there's a set of important problems that we want to apply machine learning systems to. So like as we deploy ML systems, we think the world might change faster or become more complex in certain respects. Mm-hmm. And we really care about is whether we can apply machine learning to help us make sense of that kind of world or steer that world in a good direction. And so from that perspective, it's more like there's this list of tasks that we're interested in. And sort of the more tasks we can apply ML to, the better positioned we will be to cope with like possible disruption caused by ML. And so from that perspective, I think you're just sort of happy every time you expand the frontier of tasks that you're able to solve effectively. And I think like I also take that pretty seriously. So if it was the case that we could just push the set of tasks that we're able to solve a little bit, I think that would improve our chances of coping with things well a little bit. But my main goal is probably, or like the main focus, I think, you know, as we are further away, if we're like think having to think about things more conceptually or more theoretically, then I think it's better to focus on like having a really solid solution that we think will work all the time. Mm-hmm. As we get closer, then it becomes more interesting to say like, great, now we see these particular problems that we want to solve. Let's just see if we can push our techniques a little bit so that ML systems can help us solve those problems. Do you think it's possible that there's an advantage to whoever's trying to be deceptive in these cases, that in fact it's easier uh, for the person who's trying to mislead a judge because they can choose from a wide range of possible claims that they could make, whereas the person or the, yeah, the agent that's trying to communicate the truth, they can only make one claim, which is the, 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 the true one? Yeah, so I guess a few points. Maybe a first preliminary point is that in general, there wouldn't if you had two agents, there wouldn't be like one assigned to the truth and one assigned to lie. Yeah. Instead, they would both just be arguing whatever they thought would be most likely to be judged as you know honest and helpful. So in a world where it worked like that, there were just neither participant in the debate would be trying to say anything true. Both of them would be arguing for some garbage if we were in this unfortunate situation. So then in terms of the actual question, like, yeah, you could sort of imagine there's this giant space of things you could argue for. One of them is like, you know, some tiny space of them are the things that we would actually regard on reflection as like the most truthy yeah. and like all the other stuff. Yeah, it's a very tiny, tiny subset of the possible claims. And like, there's a ton of other things that differ between different claims besides like how actually useful are they and truthful are they. And so I think a priori, you'd definitely be very, very, it's like a very, very surprising claim or very, very special claim to say the very best strategy for amongst all these strategies is the one that's most truthful and helpful. So I definitely think that like your first guess, you know, just if you didn't know anything about the domain would be that there's going to be some other properties, you know, like maybe how nice it sounds is like a very useful, like you want to pick the thing that sounds nicest. Hmm. Or like the thing that has the slickest soundbite in its favor or something like that. Yeah. I think I am reasonably optimistic that if, say, a human judge is careful, they can sort of judge well enough that they have some... Right? So yeah, if, you're, if you're a weak judge, you sort of this process can't really get off the ground. You're like not able to at all correlate your judgments with truth. As you get to be a stronger judge, you hope that not only can you start to answer some questions, 
you can sort of bootstrap up to answering more and more complex questions. So that is, you could say, well, if I just were to guess something off the top of my head that has like one level of correlation with truth, like in easy enough cases, that's going to be truthful. Then if I have a short debate that sort of bottoms out with me guessing something off the top of my head, that can be like a little bit more conducive to the truth. And now if I have like a long debate where like after that long debate, I can now have a short debate to decide which side I think wins. Hmm. Then I think that's like more likely to be conducive to truth. So you could hope that you have sort of a limiting behavior as you think longer, longer, the like class of cases in which truthfulness becomes the optimal strategy grows. But I don't, yeah, I think it's not obvious at all. Uh, what's the best source of people who want to learn more about this approach? There's a paper up on archive, and I think there was a, a blog post that came out after that that's uh, perhaps more extensive. Uh, I think the paper is probably the best thing to look at. So there's a paper in the archive called like, AI Safety via Debate. Like, it covers like a lot of considerations and raises a lot of considerations, discusses possible problems, discusses how it compares to amplification, things like that. Mm-hmm. It presents some like sort of very simple toy experiments to show a little bit about how this might work in the context of machine learning. It doesn't present like sort of convincing example of a system which does something interesting using debate. And so that's like what we're currently, that's more like what we're currently working on. And so a reader who's looking for that should maybe come back in six months. Mm. But I think if you want to understand what is, yeah, if you want to understand like why we're interested in the idea or like what is basically going on, then I think the paper is a good thing to look at. What would prevent us from implementing either of these strategies today? What advance do we need to, to actually be able to put them into practice? Yeah, so I think depending on your perspective, either unfortunately or fortunately, there's really like a ton of stuff that needs to be done. Uh, So one category is just building up like that basic engineering competence to make these things work at scale. Um, So that is, right, like in running this process, it's kind of like training an AI. Let's consider the debate case, which I think is, is fairly similar in technical requirements, but maybe a bit easier to talk about. We understand a lot about how to train AIs to play games well, because that's a thing we've been trying to do a lot. This as an example of a game has like, many differences from the games people normally train AIs to play. So for example, like it is arbitrated by a human and queries to a human judge are incredibly expensive. So that presents you with a ton of problems about like one, organizing the collection of this data using like approximations, like there's this whole family of approximations you're going to have to use in order to be able to actually train these AIs to play this game well. You can't just like have every time they play the game, a human actually makes the evaluation. You need to like be training models to approximate humans. You need to be using like less trusted evaluations. You need to be like learning cleverly from data that's like just passive data rather than actually allowing them to query the judge. So that's like one, yeah, just like technically running this project at scale is hard for a bunch of reasons that AI is hard. And then also hard for some additional reasons distinctive to the role of humans in these kinds of proposals. It's also hard, I guess, as a game because it has like some features that games don't normally have. So when we used to thinking of games with, yeah, maybe I don't want to get like, there's other technical differences beyond the involvement of humans that like make these kind of hard engineering problems. And like some of those are things that I'm currently working on, just trying to understand better. And again, trying to build up the actual engineering expertise to be ready to make these things work at very large scale. So that's one class of problems. Um, A second class of problems is just figuring out, like, I think there's maybe two things you could want. One is you want to be able to actually apply these schemes. Like you want to be able to actually run such debates and use them to train a powerful AI. But then you also want to understand much more than we currently understand about whether that's actually going to work well. So in some sense, like, even if there was nothing stopping us from running kind of training procedure right now, we're going to have to do a lot of work to understand whether we're comfortable with that. Like, do we think that's good? Or do we think that, like, we should use some other approach or maybe, like, try harder to coordinate to avoid deploying AI? That's a huge cluster of questions, some of which are, like, empirical questions about how humans think about things, like what happens in actual debates involving humans, what happens if you actually try and take 20 humans and have them coordinate in the amplification setting. It also depends on hard philosophical questions. Like I mentioned earlier, the question like, what should a super intelligent AI do? If you had like a formal condition for what it should do, then your problem would be a lot easier. Our current position is like, we don't know. In addition to solving that problem, we're going to be defining that problem. Like should is a tricky word. Anyways, that's a second category of difficulties. There's a third big category of difficulties corresponding to like, and these are the third category is maybe something you just wait on, but like current AI is not sophisticated enough to say run interesting debates. That is like, if you imagine the kind of debate between humans, that's like interestingly promoting truth that involves a very complicated learning problem that the debaters have to solve. And so I think right now, like it feels like that problem is kind of just at the limits of our abilities. Like you can imagine in some simple settings, training that kind of AI. And so one option would just be to wait until AI improves and say, we're going to try and study these techniques in simpler cases and then apply them with like the real messiness of human cognition only once AI is better. Another option would be to try and push safety out as far as one could go so that it's actually starting to engage with like the messiness of human cognition. And to be clear, that's in parallel. This, the second step I suggested is like philosophical difficulties and asking whether this is actually a good scheme. That's totally going to have to, even today, involve engaging a ton with humans. 
Like that involves actually running debates, actually doing this kind of like decomposition process that underlies amplification. So maybe those are the three main categories of difficulty that I see. I think all of them seem very important. I think like my current take is probably that the the most important ones are figuring out whether this is a good idea rather than being actual obstructions to running the scheme. I think it's like quite realistic to relatively soon be at a place where you could use this procedure to train a powerful AI. And the hard part is just getting to the point where like we actually believe that's a good idea or we've actually figured out whether that's a good idea. And then, I mean, that's not just figuring out, it's also like modifying the procedures so that they actually are a good idea. Yeah, that uh, that makes a lot more sense now. Okay, uh, let's push on to a different uh, line of research you've been doing into a prosaic AI alignment. Uh, you've, you've got a series of posts about this on uh, AIalignment.com. Yeah, what's what's kind of the, the argument you're making? And, and what, what is prosaic AI? So I would describe this as a motivating goal for research or a statement of like what we ought to be trying to do as researchers working on alignment. And roughly what I mean by prosaic AI is AI which doesn't involve any unknown unknowns or AI which doesn't involve any fundamental surprises about the nature of intelligence. So we could look at existing ML systems and say whether or not I think this is likely. We could ask what would happen if you took these ideas and scaled these ideas up to produce something like sophisticated behavior or human level intelligence. And then again, whether or not that's likely, we can sort of understand what those systems would look like much better than we can understand what other kinds of AI systems would look like, just because they would be very analogous to the kinds of systems we can build today. And so in particular, what that involves, I guess, if by the thing we're scaling up is something like existing existing techniques in deep learning, that involves defining an objective, defining a really broad class of models, so really giant neural nets or some complicated model involving attention and internal cognitive workspaces, and then just optimizing over that class to find something that scores well according to the objective. And so we'd imagine... Yeah, so that, that's like the class of technique. That's the basic technique. And you could say what would happen if it turned out that technique could be scaled up to produce powerful AI. That's what I mean by prosaic AI. And then the task would be to say, supposing you live in that world, supposing we're able to do that kind of scale up, can we design techniques which allow us to use that AI for good or allow us to use that AI to do what we actually want, given that we're assuming that that AI can be used to have some really big transformative impact on the world? Yeah, so there's a few reasons you might think this is a reasonable goal for research. So maybe one is that it's a very, it's like a concrete model of what AI might look like. And so it's relatively easy to actually work on instead of sort of being in the dark and having to speculate about what kinds of changes might occur in the field. A second reason is that sort of even if many more techniques are involved in AI, like it seems quite likely that doing gradient descent over like rich model classes is going to be one of several techniques. And so if you don't understand how to use that technique safely, it's pretty likely you're going to have a hard time. Maybe a third reason is that I think there is actually some, there is some prospect that existing techniques will go further than people guess. Uh, And that's a case that's like particularly important from the perspective of alignment, because in that case, like people sort of by hypothesis be caught a little bit by surprise and there's not that much time to do intervening or like to do more work between now and then. So I think in general, I would advocate for a policy of like, look at the techniques that you understand currently and try and understand how to use those techniques to, to safely use those techniques. And then once you've really solved that problem, once you're like, now we understand how to make, you know, how to do gradient descent in a way that produces safe AI, then you can go on and look towards future techniques that might appear. And ideally, you'd understand sort of for each of the techniques that might play around building your AI, you'd have some analogous safe version of that technique, um, which doesn't introduce problems with alignment, but is roughly equally useful. So I guess the people who wouldn't be keen on this approach would be those who are confident that current methods uh, are not going to lead to uh, very high levels of, of general intelligence. Uh, and, so they, and, and so they expect that the techniques that you're developing now just won't, won't be usable because it could be so different. Yeah, I guess I'd say there's two categories of people who might be super skeptical of this as a goal. Yeah, so one will be, as you said, people who just don't believe that existing techniques are going to go that far or don't believe that they're going to play an important role in powerful AI systems. And then a second would be those who think that's plausible, but that the project is just doomed. That is, that there is going to be no way to produce an analog of existing techniques that would be aligned, even if they could, in fact, play a role in sophisticated AI systems. I think both of those are reasonably common perspectives. I think in a minute we'll talk about uh, Miri uh, and, and their view, which I guess is uh, perhaps a bit of a combination of the two of them. Yeah. Although they're, yeah, they're the strongest proponents of the second view that like we're super doomed in a world where sophisticated AI looks anything like existing systems. Yeah. Can, can you lay out the, the reasons both for and against thinking that current techniques uh, in machine learning can lead to general intelligence? Yeah. So I think one argument in favor or one simple point in favor is that we do believe if you took existing techniques and ran them with enough computing resources, we... I mean, there's some there's some anthropic weirdness and so on, but we do think that produces general intelligence based on observing humans, which are effectively produced by the same techniques. 
So we do think if you had enough compute, that would work. That probably takes sort of if you were to run a really naive analogy with the process of evolution, you might think that if you scaled up existing ML experiments by like 20 orders of magnitude or so, that then you would certainly get general intelligence. So that's one, there's this basic point that like probably these techniques would work at large enough scale. And so then it just becomes a question about what is that scale? Mm. That is how much compute do you need before you can do something like this um, to produce human level intelligence. And so then the arguments ever become quantitative arguments about why to think various levels are necessary. So that could be an argument that talks about the efficiency of our techniques compared to the efficiency of evolution, or like examines ways in which evolution probably uses more compute than we need. It includes arguments about things like computing hardware, saying how much of those 20 orders of magnitude will we just be able to close by spending more money and building faster computers, which is like 20 orders of magnitude sounds like a lot, but actually you cover, you know, we've covered more than 20 orders of magnitude so far, yeah. and we will cover a significant fraction of those over the coming decade. Or you can also try and run arguments on analogies, like look at how effectively or how much compute existing systems take to train and try and understand that. So you could just try and say, based on what our experience so far, how much compute do you think will be needed? So that's like probably the most important class of arguments in favor. Um, there's sort of other qualitative arguments, like there are lots of tasks that we're able to do. So like you'd probably want to look at what tasks we have succeeded at or failed at and try and fit those into that quantitative picture to make sense of it. But I think it's like not insane to say that like existing systems seems like they've plausibly reached the level of sophistication of like insects. Um, so we are able to take the very brute force approach of doing search over like neural nets and get behavior that's, and this is totally unclear, but I think it's plausible that existing behavior is as sophisticated as insects. Uh, and if you thought that, then I think it would constitute an argument in favor. Yeah, so I guess arguments against, probably the most salient argument against is just like, if we look at the range of tasks humans are able to accomplish, we have some intuitive sense of how quickly machines are becoming able to do more and more of those tasks. Mm. And I think uh, many people would look at that rate of progress and say, look, if you were to extrapolate that rate, it's just going to take a very, very long time before we're able to do that many tasks. I think a lot of this is just like people extrapolate things in very different ways. So some people would look at like being able to do the task an insect can do and say, wow, insects have like reasonably big brains on a scale from nothing to human. We've come some substantial fraction of the way where like perhaps plausibly going to get there just by scaling this up. Other people would look at what insects do and say, look, insects exhibit like almost none of the interesting properties of reasoning. You've captured some like very tiny fraction of that. Presumably it's going to be a really long time before you're able to capture even like a small fraction of interesting human cognition. What are the aspects of cognition that seem most challenging or, or, or I guess are most likely to require, you know, major research insights rather than just increasing the, the compute? So over long, again, with enough compute, you would sort of expect, or I would be willing to batch that you would get everything in human cognition. Um, and the question is, in some sense, which aspects of cognition are like most expensive to produce in this way or most mm -hmm. likely to be prohibitively expensive such that you can't just find them by brute force search enough to actually understand them. So natural things are like properties of human cognition that operate over very long time scales. Like maybe evolution got to take a lot of cracks of like developing different notions of curiosity until it found a notion of curiosity, which was effective or like a notion of play that was effective for getting humans to do useful learning. Mm. It's not clear that you can evaluate if you have like some proposed like set of motivations for a human that you're rolling out. It's not clear you can evaluate other than by actually having a bunch of human lifetimes occur. Mm. And so if there's a thing that you're trying to optimize where every time you have a proposal in order to check it, you have to like run a whole bunch of human lifetimes, then that's going to take a checks. And so if there's like cognitively complicated things that only, right, so like, I mean, maybe curiosity is simple, but if you have a thing like curiosity that's actually very complicated or involves lots of moving parts, then it might be very, very hard to find something like that by this brute force search. Things that operate over very short time scales are much, much more likely to, I mean, then you can try a whole bunch of things, you can get quick feedback about which works, but things that operate over very long time scales might be very hard. Uh, so it sounds like you're saying um, at, at some level of compute, you're pretty confident that current methods would produce human level intelligence and maybe much more. Uh, I think a lot of listeners would find that claim somewhat surprising or at least being confident that that's true. Yeah. What, what's, what's the reason that you think that? Yeah. So there's a bunch of, there are a bunch of things to be said on this topic. So maybe a first thing to say is human intelligence was produced by this process of try some random genomes, take those genomes which produce the organisms with the highest fitness, mm -hmm. um, and then randomly vary those a little bit and see where you get. In order for that process to produce intelligence, you definitely need a bunch of things. At a minimum, you need to try a huge number of possibilities. Again, now we're just discussing the claim that with enough compute, this would work. So at a minimum, you need to try a whole bunch of possibilities, but you also need like an environment in which reproductive fitness is like a sufficiently interesting objective. So one reason that you might be skeptical of this claim is that you might think that the environment that sort of humans evolved in or the lower life evolved in like is actually quite complex and we wouldn't have access even if we had arbitrarily large amounts of compute we wouldn't actually be able to create an environment rich enough to produce intelligence in the same way um, so that's something i'm skeptical of largely because i think 
I mean, humans operate in this physical environment. Almost all the actual complexity comes from other organisms. So that's sort of something you get for free if you're spending all this compute running evolution because you get to have your you get to have the agent you're producing interact with itself. I guess other than that, you have this physical environment which is very rich and like you know, quantum field theory is very computationally complicated if you want to actually simulate the behavior of materials. Uh, but it's not an environment that's like optimized in ways that like really pull out. Like human intelligence is not sensitive to the details of like the way that materials break. If you just mm-hmm. substitute in, if you take like, well, materials break when you like apply stress and you just throw in some random complicated dynamics concerning how materials break, that's about as good, it seems, as the dynamics from like actual chemistry and like, yeah, until you get to the point where humans are starting to build technology that depends on those properties. And by that point, like the game is already over, right? At the point when humans are building technologies that really exploit the fact that we live in a universe with like this rich and like consistent physics, mm-hmm. at that point, you already have human level intelligence. Effectively, there's not much more evolution occurring. So yeah, maybe on the environment side, I think most of the interesting complexity comes from organisms in the environment. And there's not much evidence that like the considerable computational complexity of the world is actually an important part of what gives you human intelligence. A second reason people might be skeptical is they might like this estimate, this 20 orders of magnitude thing would come from like thinking about the neurons and all the brains of all the organisms that have lived. Hmm. You might think that, you know, maybe most of the interesting compute is like being done early in the process of development or like something about the way that uh, genotypes translate into phenotypes. Hmm. And if you think that, you might think that the, the neuron counts are a great underestimate for the amount of interesting compute. Um, or similarly, I think other things in the organisms are more interesting than either development or neurons. I think that like my main position here is that it really does look like we understand the way in which neurons do computing. Like a lot of the action is sending action potentials over long distances. The brain spends a huge amount of energy on that. It looks like that's the way that organisms do interesting computing. It looks like they don't have some other mechanism that does a bunch of interesting computing because otherwise they wouldn't be spending this huge amount of energy implementing the mechanism we understand. So it does look like brains work the way we think they work. Yeah. So I guess there's some people who think that there's a lot of computation going on within individual neurons, uh, but you're you're skeptical of that. Yes. I think my view would be that mostly the hard thing about, say, if you want to simulate a brain, you could imagine there being two kinds of difficulties. One is like simulating the local dynamics of neurons, and the second is moving information long distances, say as you fire action potentials. And I think most likely, both in the brain and in computers, like the movement of information is actually the main difficulty. So like the dynamics within a neuron just don't they they might be very complicated. It might involve a lot of arithmetic operations to perform that that simulation. But I think it's not hard compared to just shuffling the data around. And shuffling the data around, we have a much clearer sense of exactly how much happens because we know that there's these action potentials. Yeah. Action potentials communicate information basically only in the timing. I mean, there's a little bit more than that. But we can basically, we know sort of how much information is actually getting moved. It looks like ones and zeros. Yeah, it looks like ones and zeros and most of the extra bits are in timing. And we sort of know roughly what level of precision there is. And so like there's not that many bits per action potential. So I don't have a lot of understanding of like the specifics of like how machine learning works, but I would think that one objection people might have is to say that even if you had lots of compute and you tried to uh, you know, make the parameters of this, like the machine learning algorithm more, more accurate, just the structure of it might not match like what the, what the brain is doing. So it might, it might just like cap out at some level of, of capability uh, because you, it's just, there's no way for the like current methods or the, the current way that the, that the data is being transformed to actually uh, yeah, pr- produce general intelligence. Do you think there's any any argument for that? Or is it just the case that kind of the methods we have now, like at least at some level of abstraction are analogous to what the human brain is doing and therefore with a like sufficient amount of compute, maybe like a, maybe a very, very high amount, um, but, but they should be able to copy everything that the human brain is doing? Yeah, so I would say that most of the time machine learning, we like fix an architecture and then optimize over sort of computations that fit within that architecture. Obviously, when evolution optimizes for humans, it does sort of this very broad search over possible architectures, like looking over genomes that encode, like, here's how you put together a brain. We can also do a search over architectures. And so the natural question becomes, like, you know, how effective are we at searching over architectures compared to evolution? Mm -hmm. I feel like this is mostly in the regime of, like, a just computational question. Okay. That is, we sort of know, I mean... The, the very highest level architecture that evolution uses isn't that complicated, sort mm-hmm. of at the, at the meta level. And so you could, in the worst case, just do a search at that same level of abstraction. I guess one point that we haven't discussed at all, but is, I guess, relevant for some, some people would consider super relevant, is like anthropic considerations concerning the evolution of humans. So you might think that evolution only extremely really produces mm-hmm. intelligent life, but that we happen to live on a planet where that process worked. Yeah. What do you make of that? So I think it's kind of hard to make it fit with the evolutionary evidence. This is something that like, I think Carl Shulman and Nick Bostrom have a paper about this and some other people have written about it periodically. I think that like the rough picture is that intelligence evolves like too quick. Like if, if this is the case, if there's some hard step in evolution, it has to be extremely early in evolutionary history. 
Um, so in particular, it has to happen considerably before vertebrates and probably has to have happened by like simple worms. Why is that? Because those steps took longer than the later steps did? Well, so one reason, I think the easiest way to put it before vertebrates is just to say that like cephalopods seem pretty smart and the last common mm -hmm. ancestor between like an octopus and a human is some uh -huh. like simple worm. I think that's probably the strongest evidence that's from this paper by Nick and Carl. Okay, um, because because then uh, we have another line that also produced uh, substantial intelligence. Um, independently. Independently. And that would be incredibly suspicious if it had happened twice on the same planet. And, and there we don't have the anthropic argument because you could live on a planet where it only happened once. That's right. Um, you could think that like maybe there's a hard step between octopi and humans, but then we're getting into the regime where like, mm. again, sort of any place you look. What is this hard step? Yeah. Many things happen twice. Like, you know, birds and mammals independently seem to become like very, very intelligent. You could think that like maybe in early vertebrates, there was some like lucky architectural choice made in the design of vertebrate brains that causes on the entire vertebrate line intelligence will then sort of systematically increase quickly. But like what was important was this lucky step. But at some point, like you can try and run some argument for you might get stuck before humans. It seems pretty hard to do or like doesn't seem very convincing. And it certainly doesn't seem like it would give you an argument for why you wouldn't reach at least like octopus levels of intelligence. So like if you're like thinking that existing techniques are going to get stuck anywhere around their current level, then this kind of thing isn't going to be very relevant. Yeah. So I guess it kind of raises a definitional question of uh, what is current techniques? So like how much you change the architecture before you say, oh, well, this is no longer like current machine learning methods. Uh, this is this is no longer prosaic AI. Yeah. So I think the thing that's really relevant from the perspective of climate research is like you want to assume something about what you can do. And the thing you want to assume you can do is like, there is some model class. You optimize over that model class given an objective. Maybe you care about whether the objective has to supply gradients, but maybe it doesn't even matter that much. Mm. So then as an alignment researcher, you say, great, the AI researchers have handed us a black box. The black box works as like follows. The black box takes some inputs, produces some outputs. You specify how good those outputs were. And then the black box adjusts over time to be better and better. And like as an alignment researcher, you don't as long as something fits within that framework, you don't necessarily care about the details of like what kind of architecture are you searching over? Or are you doing architecture search? Or what form does the objective take? Well, what form the objective takes you might care about. But most other details you don't really care about because alignment research isn't going to be sensitive to those details. So in some sense, like you could easily end up with a system that like existing ML researchers would say, wow, that was actually like quite a lot different from what we were doing in mm. 2018. But which an alignment researcher would say, that's fine. Like the important thing from my perspective is this still matches with the kind of alignment techniques that we were developing. So we, yeah. don't, we don't really care how different it looks. We just care about did it like basically change the nature of the game from the perspective of alignment. Yeah. Can we look backwards in history and say, you know, uh, would techniques that we developed five or 10 years ago work on today's architectures? Yeah. So we can try and look. Yeah, we can look back. Hindsight is always complicated and like hazardous. But I think that you would say if you were to, to say 1990, perform a similar exercise and look across techniques. I would say certainly the kind of things we're talking about now would exist. They would be part of your picture. They would not have nearly as much of a be nearly as much of a focal point as they are today because they hadn't yet worked nearly as well as they've worked now. So I guess we would be talking about like what fraction of your field of view would like these techniques occupy. So I think I think it's pretty safe to say that like more than ten percent of your field of view would have been taken up by like the kind of thing we're discussing now, and the techniques developed with respect like with that ten percent of possibilities in mind would still apply. Like. Existing systems are very, very similar to sort of the kinds of things people are imagining in the late 80s. And then there's a question like, is that number 10% or is it a third? I think that's pretty unclear. And I, could, I don't have enough of a detailed understanding of that history to like really be able to comment intelligently. And I'd want to defer to people who are doing research in the area at that time. I do think that like if you had instead focused on different kinds of techniques, like if you'd been around in the further past and you were, say, trying to do AI alignment for expert systems... Like, I don't feel that bad about that. I guess some people look back at history and say, like, man, that would have been a real bummer if you'd been alive in the 60s and you'd done all this AI alignment research that didn't apply to what the kind of AI we're building now. And my perspective is kind of like, look, one, if it takes 50 years to build AI, it doesn't matter as much what the details are of the AI alignment workage in the 60s. Two, actually, there's a lot of overlap between those problems. Like, many of the philosophical difficulties you run into alignment are basically the same, even between existing systems and expert systems. Three, like... I would actually be pretty happy with the world where like when people propose a technique, you know, a bunch of AI alignment researchers invest a bunch of time in understanding alignment for expert systems. And then 15 years later, they move on they to the next, the next thing. thing. It's yeah. like not that bad a world. Yeah. Like I expect you would, in fact, like if you just solve the sequence of concrete problems, like that actually sounds pretty good. It sounds like a good way to get practice as a field. It sounds reasonably likely to be useful. There's probably lots of commonalities between those problems. Even if they turn out to be totally wasted, like it's a reasonable bet and expectation. Like yeah. you sort of have to do that's the cost you have to pay if you want to have done a bunch of research for the techniques that are actually relevant. Yeah. Unless you're like very confident that the current techniques are not the things that will go all the way or that it's doomed. And I think like both those positions seem really, really hard to run to me. Or like I don't yeah. I haven't heard very convincing arguments for either of those positions. What's expert systems? 
Uh, mm-hmm. so these are like the systems based on having a giant set of like maybe reasoning rules and facts, mm-hmm. and then they just sort of use these rules to combine these facts. And that just didn't work? Yeah, there was a period where people were more optimistic about them. I don't know the history very well at all. Yeah. Uh, I think in general, certainly it didn't realize the ambitions of the most ambitious people in that field. Mm-hmm. And certainly it's not the shape of yeah. most existing or like the kinds of systems people are most excited about today. Okay, so uh, we mentioned that a, a group that has um, kind of a different view from from this uh, prosaic AI is um, the Machine Intelligence Research in- Institute uh, at Berkeley. If I understand correctly, it's kind of you, you got into AI safety in, in part through at least that 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 social group or that intellectual group. But it seems like now you kind of recommend or you kind of um, represent a different node uh, or different uh, what's the term axis within within the people working on AI safety. Yeah, how would you describe uh, their view and, and and how it differs from yours today? I would say the most important difference is they believe that this prosaic AI alignment project is very likely to be doomed. That is, they think if the shape of sophisticated AI systems resembles the shape of existing ML systems, or like if it in particular, you obtain sophisticated AI by defining a model class, defining an objective and doing gradient descent to find a model that scores well according to the objective, then they think we're just extremely doomed such that they think the right strategy is to instead step back from that assumption and say, can we understand other ways that people could build sophisticated AI? Part of that is like, you know, if you're doing gradient descent over this big model, like if you're doing gradient descent to find a model that performs well, you're going to end up with some actual particular model. You're going to end up with some particular like way of thinking that your like giant neural net embodies. Hmm. And you could instead, instead of just specifying procedures that give rise to that way of thinking, you could actually try and understand that way of thinking directly and say, great, now that we understand this, we can both reason about its alignment and maybe we can also design it more efficiently or we can more efficiently describe search procedures that will uncover it once we know what it is that they're looking for. So I'd say it's like the biggest difference. And like the crux there, I think, is mostly the, is it possible to design alignment techniques that you make something like existing ML systems safe? Yeah. And so my view is that most likely that's possible. Not most, like more likely than not, not like radically more likely than not, but somewhat more likely than not, that's possible. And that as long as it looks possible and we have like attractive lines of research to pursue and like a clear path forward, we should probably work on that by default. And that we should, at some point, if we're like, wow, it's really hard to solve alignment for systems like anything like existing ML, then like you really want to understand as much as you can why that's hard. And then you want to step back and say, look, people in ML, it looks like the thing you're doing actually is sort of like unfixably dangerous. And maybe it's time for us to like think about like weird solutions where we have to like change the overall trajectory of the field based on this consideration about alignment. Maybe it's not reasonable to call that weird. Like from the outside view, you might think, well, the goal of AI is to make things good for humans. It's not crazy to change the direction of the field based on like what is plausibly going to be alignable. But it would seem strange to them today. Yeah. Yeah. People in ML would not be like, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Let's just (laughs) swap what we're doing. So I guess my position would be like, I'm currently much, much more optimistic than many people. I think that's the main disagreement about whether Mm -hmm. it will be possible to solve alignment for prosaic AI systems. And I think that like, as long as we're optimistic in that way, we should work on that problem until we discover why it's hard um, or solve it. Uh, just to make it more concrete for people, uh, what are the kind of specific questions that, that Miri is researching that they think are useful? So I think at this point, uh, in Miri's public research, the stuff that they publish on and talk about on the internet, like one big research area is decision theory. So understanding, like supposing that you have some agent which like is able to make predictions about things or like has views on like the truth of various statements, how do you actually translate those views into decisions? And this is tricky because you want to say things like, you care about quantities like what would happen if I were to do X. And it's not actually clear what, what would happen if I were to do X means. Like, is it a causal counterfactual of like a certain kind of statement? It's like not clear that's the right kind of statement. So this is causal decision theory, evidential decision theory. and uh, Yeah, uh, and most of the stuff they would consider that... seriously is like, I think once you get like really precise about it, you're like, we'd like this to be an algorithm. Like the whole picture just gets like a lot weirder. And like there are a lot of distinctions that people don't normally consider in the philosophy, philosophical community that are kind of, you have to wade through if you want to have be at the place where you have like a serious proposal for like here's an algorithm for making decisions yeah. given as input like views on these empirical questions or given as input like a logical inductor or something like that so that's one class of questions that they work on i think another big class of questions they work on is like i mean like stepping back from like looking at the whole problem and saying from a conceptual perspective like supposing you grant this view this worldview about what's needed uh like what yeah i don't know a good way to define this problem but it's kind of just like figure out how you would build an aligned ai which is a good, I mean, it's a good problem. It's the very high level problem. I endorse like some people think about the very high level problem. I think it's one of the more useful things to think about. There's some flavor of it that depends on like what facts you like, what you think is the important considerations or what you think the difficulties are. Mm. Um, So they're working on like a certain version of that problem. I think other examples of things include like, they're very interested just in like what are good models for rational agency? 
So like we have such models in some settings, like in Cartesian settings, where you have like, you know, an environment and agent that communicate over some channel where they send bits to one another. Um, it becomes much less clear what agency means once you have like an agent that's physically instantiated in some environment. Uh, that is, what does it mean to say that a human is like a consequentialist thing acting in the world, given that the human is just actually like some of the degrees of freedom in the world are like linked together in this complicated way to make a human. It's like quite complicated to talk about what that actually means, that there's like this consequentialist in the world. That's a thing they're like super interested in. Um, yeah, figuring out how to reason about systems that are like logically very complex, including like systems that contain yourself or contain other agents like you. Yeah. Like how do we formalize such reasoning? Because cool. another big issue. Does Mary have a different view as well about the, the likelihood of current methods producing general intelligence or is that? Um, there's probably some difference there though it's like a lot less stark than mm -hmm. the other, the other yeah. one. I think uh, maybe a difference in that space that's more close is like, I kind of have a view that's more like there's probably some best way. There's some like easiest way for like our current society as it's currently built to develop AI. Um, and the more of a change you want to make from that default path, the more difficult it becomes. Whereas I think the mirror perspective would more be like the current way that we build ML is reasonably likely to just be very inefficient. And so it's reasonably likely that if you were to step back from that paradigm and try something very different, that it would be like comparably efficient or maybe more efficient. And like, I think that's a little bit, I'm not, yeah, I guess I don't buy that claim, but I don't think it's as important as the definite doom claim. Yeah. So um, what are the best arguments for, for Mary's point of view that, that current methods can't be made safe? So I guess... I guess I'd say there's two classes of problems that they think might be unresolvable. One is like, if I perform, if I have some objective in mind, suppose I even have like the right objective, an objective that like perfectly tracks how good a model is all considered according to human values. And then I optimize really aggressively on that objective. The objective is still just a feature of the like behavior of this, I have this black box. I'm optimizing over like the weights of some neural network. So now I have an objective that like perfectly captures whether the behavior is good for humans, and I optimize really hard on that objective. So one of Mary's big concerns is that even if we assume that problem is resolved and that you have such an objective, then it's pretty likely you're going to find a model which only has these desirable properties like on the actual distribution where it was trained, and that it's reasonably likely that in fact that system that you've trained is going to be some consequentialist who wants something different from you know human flourishing, and just happens on the training distribution to do things that look good within that narrow range. Uh, yes. Cool. So an example of this phenomenon that I think many people think is pretty informative, though certainly not decisive on its own, is like humans were evolved to produce lots of human offspring. And that it's the case that like humans are sophisticated consequentialists whose terminal goal is not just producing offspring. So that even though the like cognitive pulse that humans use is very good for producing offspring over like human evolutionary history, uh, it seems like it's not actually great. It's sort of like already broken down to a considerable extent and in the long run looks like it will break down to a much, much greater extent. So that if you were like a designer of humans being like, I know, I'd like to find this objective that tracks how many offspring they have. Now I'm going to optimize over many generations. I'm going to optimize biological life over mm. you know, a million generations to find the life which is best at producing offspring. You'd be really bummed by the results. Um, so their sort of expectation is that in a similar way, we're going to be really bummed. We're going to like optimize this neural net over a very large number of iterations to find something that appears to produce actions that are good by human lights. But we're going to find something whose relationship to human flourishing is similar to like humans' relationship to reproduction, where like they sort of do it as a weird byproduct of a complicated mix of drives rather than because that's the thing they actually want. And yeah. so when generalized, they might behave very strangely. Okay. It uh, sounds, sounds kind of persuasive. Uh, <laughs> what's, what's, what's the counter argument? So I think there's a few, a few things to say in response. So one is that Evolution does a very simple thing where you sample like environments according to distribution, and then you see what agents perform well on that on those environments. We, when we train ML systems, can be a little bit more mindful than that. So in particular, we are free to sample from whatever distribution over environments we are any distribution we're able to construct. And so as someone trying to solve for ZK alignment, you are free to look at the world and say, great, I have this concern about whether the system I'm training is going to be robust or whether it might generalize in a catastrophic way in some new kind of context. And then I'm free to use that concern to inform the training process I use. So I can say, great, I'm going to adjust my training process by, say, introducing an adversary and having the adversary try and construct inputs on which the system is going to behave badly. That's something that people do in ML. It's called adversarial training. And if you do that, that's like very different from the process evolution ran. Right now you imagine that there's someone roughly as smart as humans who's like constructing these weird environments. Like if they look in at humans and say, great, the humans seem to care about like this art shit, then the adversary is just like constructing an environment where humans have lots of opportunities to like do art or whatever. And then if they don't have any kids, then like they get downweighted. It's so like if there's some gap, if there's some context under which humans like fail to maximize reproductive fitness, then adversary can like specifically construct those contexts and use that to select against. Again, the reproductive fitness analogy makes this sound kind of evil, um, but you should replace reproductive fitness with things that are good. <laughs> uh, 
yeah, so that's one thing. I think the biggest thing probably is that like as the designers of the system, we're free to do whatever we can think of to try and improve robustness. Um, and we will not just like sample. We, we, we can look, yeah, we can look forward rather than just look at the present generation. Yeah. So. Although there's, it's a challenging problem to do so. Yeah. Um, so that's a thing a bunch of people work on. It's not obvious whether they'll be able to succeed, certainly. But yeah. I don't think that like this analogy should make you think like, I think the analogy maybe says there is a problem. Or there's like yeah. a possible problem, but doesn't say doesn't say like, and that problem will be resistant to any attempt to solve it. It's not like evolution made a serious attempt to solve the problem. Yeah. If you can make the method corrigible so that you can continue improving it uh, or changing it, uh, like even as you're going with uh, like an AI transforming the world, I mean, that seems like it would partially solve the problem. Because uh, one issue here is that kind of humans ended up with the with the motivations that they have, the desires that they have. And then like we're going about in basically a single generation or, you know, a handful of generations in evolutionary time changing everything about the environment uh, the, the environment's changing much faster than we are such that like we've become like yeah, our drives no longer match this uh, what would actually be re- required to make us reproduce at the maximal rate uh whereas if you change if you were changing humans like as we went like you know, like as um, our behavior ceased to be like adaptive from that point of view uh then perhaps you could keep us in line so we'd be like fairly close to the maximal reproductive rate D- does that make sense yeah i think that's like part of an important part of the picture for why we have hope that is, yeah. if you're like, yeah, we're going to evolve a thing that just like wants human flourishing, or we're going to like yeah. do gradient descent until we find a thing that really wants human flourishing, then we're going to yeah. let it rip in the yeah. universe. Like, it doesn't sound great. <laughs> but if you're like, we're going to try and find a thing which like helps humans in their efforts to like continue to create systems that help humans continue to create systems that help mm-hmm. humans achieve, like help humans flourish, like then that's, I guess, like you could imagine in the analogy, instead of like trying to evolve a creature which like just really cares about human flourishing, you're like trying to evolve a creature that's like really helpful. Yeah. And like somehow be really helpful and like don't kill everyone and so on is like an easier set or like a more imaginable set of properties to have mm. sort of even in across a very broad range of environments than like matching some exact notion of what constitutes flourishing by human lights. I think one reason that people like at Miri or from a similar school of thought would be pessimistic about that is they have this mental image of like humans participating in that continuing training process. So you're training more and more sophisticated AIs. Yeah. If you imagine like a human is intervening and saying, here's how I'm going to adjust this training process or here's how I'm going to like shape the course of this process. Like, it sounds kind of hopeless because humans are, like, so much slower um, and in many respects, like, presumably so much, like, less informed, uh, or less intelligent. That they might just be adding noise. Yeah. yeah. And it would be very expensive to have human involvement. And, yeah, mostly, like, they wouldn't be pushing in a good direction, some random direction. Um, I think that, like, the main response there is, like, you should imagine humans performing this process early or, like, early on in this process. You should imagine humans being the ones, like, adjusting objectives or adjusting the behavior of the system. Later, you should imagine that is mostly being carried out by, like, the current generation of AI systems. Mm. So, like, the reason that humans can keep up is that process goes faster and faster. It's hopefully because we're maintaining this property that there, like, are always a whole bunch of AI systems trying to help us get what we want. Will it continue to bottom out in some sense, like what humans say about like how the how the upper level is going? I'm imagining if there's like multiple levels of like the most advanced AI, then the less advanced. I guess this is kind of what we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got kind of humans at the bottom. At so at some point they just disappear from the equation, and it's like all like yeah. So it's dip- always going to be anchored to like what a human would have said. Yeah. In some sense, that's like the only source of ground truth in the system. Humans might not actually be. There might be some year beyond which humans never participate. But at that point, the reason that would happen would be because there is some system, like supposing, you know, year 2042, humans stop ever providing any input to AI systems again. The reason that would be possible is that in year 2042, there is some AI system, which we already trust to robustly, like do yeah. well enough according to human lights. Yeah. Um, and it could do it faster and cheaper. Yeah. yeah. It's a little bit tricky to ever have that handoff occur because that system, <laughs> you know, in 2042, the one that you're trusting to hand things off to had ever been trained on things that happened in 2043. Yeah. So it's like a little bit complicated. And it's not that you're going to keep running that same system in 2042. It's that that system is going to be sufficiently robust that it can help you train the system in 2043 that is going to. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you could visit, you know, uh, 50 years in the future uh, and see see everything that was happening there, uh, how likely do you think it would be that you would say, uh, like, my view of this was was uh, broadly uh, correct versus like Miri's view was like more, more correct than mine uh, with, with hindsight? Like I'm, I'm trying to measure kind of how confident you are about your uh, your general perspective. Yeah, so I certainly think there are a lot of cases where we'd be like, well, both views were very wrong in important ways. Mm, and then yeah. like you could easily imagine both sides being like, yeah, but my view is right in the important way. So that's yeah. certainly a thing which seems reasonably likely. In terms of like thinking in retrospect that my view is like unambiguously right, I don't know, maybe I'm on like, like relative to Mary's view, maybe I'm at like 50 to 70%. That's pretty high whatever like 60 percent that like in yeah. retrospect will be like oh yeah this was like super clear yeah um and then maybe on the other side like i would put a relatively small probability that's super clear in the other direction but like you know maybe 20 percent or 10 percent or something okay. that like in retrospect i'm like geez i was really wrong there clearly like my presence in this debate would just make things worse yeah 
Uh, and then there's kind of a middle ground of both of them had important things to say. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. So you're like reasonably, reasonably confident, but it seems like, but you, but you would still then support given those probabilities, like Miri get doing substantial research into their line of inquiry. Yeah. I'm pretty, I'm excited about Miri doing the stuff Miri's doing. I would prefer that like Miri people do things that were better on my perspective, mm-hmm. which I expect is most likely to happen if like they came to agree more with this perspective. But at some point, let's say that uh, like your line of research had four times as many resources or four times as many people. And you might say, well, you know, having one more person on this other thing could, could be more useful even given your views, right? Yeah. Although I don't think the situation is not like there's line of research A and line of research B and the chief mm-hmm. disagreement is about which line of research to pursue. It's more like if I was doing something very, very similar to what Miri's doing, like or doing something uh, like superficially quite similar, I would do it in like a somewhat different way. Yeah. So like to the extent I was working on like philosophical problems that clarify our understanding of cognition or agency, like I would not be working on the same set of problems that Miri people are working on. Mm-hmm. And I think like those differences matter probably more yeah. than the like, you know, at a high level kind of what does the research look like? Yeah. Um, so like lots of stuff in the general space of research Mary is doing that I'd be like, yep, yeah, that's like a good thing to do, which now we're in this regime of, yeah, it depends how many people are doing one thing versus doing the other thing. Do you think that there's, uh, if your view is correct, is there going to be uh, much like incidental value from the research that, that Mary is doing? Or is it kind of uh, just by the by at that point? Uh, so one way in which research of the kind Mary is doing is relevant is to clarifying whether when I talk about amplification or debate, they each have this conceptual, like key conceptual uncertainty in the case okay. of debate, like, is it the case that debates lead to, like, that the honest strategy, telling the truth, saying useful things, is actually a winning strategy in a debate? Or in the case of amplification, is there some way to assemble some large team of aligned agents such that the resulting system is smarter than the original agents and remains aligned? Those conceptual difficulties, like, seem not at all unrelated to the kinds of conceptual, like, if you ask, you know, how would we build an aligned AI using infinite amounts of computing power without thinking at all about contemporary ML? That's a very similar kind of question. You're thinking, like, what are just like the correct normative standards of reasoning that you should use to evaluate competing claims. Mm. What are like, when you compose these agents, like what kind of decomposition of cognitive work is like actually alignment preserving or do we expect to produce correct results? So in a natural way in which the kind of research Mary's doing could add value is by shedding light on those questions. And like an expectation, like, you know, I guess they're like at least several times less effective at answering those questions than if they were pointed at them more directly. You know, I don't know if it's like five times less effective than if they were pointed at them directly. I think it's a smaller multiple than that probably. What would you say to uh, people who are listening who uh, just feel kind of uh, agnostic on uh, like whether the prosaic AI approach is, uh, is the best or, or, or Miri's is? I mean, what would I say in terms of what they ought to do? Yeah, yeah. Or, uh, or maybe what they ought to think, all things considered, if they maybe don't feel qualified to, to judge this debate. Sure. So in, in terms of what to do, I suspect comparative advantage considerations will generally loom large. Yeah. And so if one's feeling agnostic, those will likely end up dominating. Or like mm-hmm. comparative advantage plus like short term, what will be most informative, involve the most learning, build the most fungible or flexible capital. Uh, in terms of like what to think, all things considered, like, I don't know, that seems pretty complicated. It's going to depend a lot on like what kind of expertise, so just in general, like looking at a situation with conflicting people who've thought a lot about the situation, like mm-hmm. how do you decide whose view to take seriously in those cases? Um, to be clear, the spectrum of views, like, Amongst all people, my view is like radically closer to Miri's than almost anyone else in the machine learning community. Yeah. Um, on, on most respects, there are other respects in which the machine learning community is closer to Miri than I am. So like the actual menu of available views is unfortunately it's, even it's, broader than this one. <laughs> even broader than uh, Paul Cristiano's view and <laughs> Miri's uh, generalized view. <laughs> Indeed. It's unfortunate. Yeah. So you're saying there's a third option. <laughs> yeah. yeah. In fact, it, yeah, it's quite a lot broader. Like, I think being agnostic is, like, not a crazy response. I think there's, like, an easy position where you're, like, well, the most confident claims, like, sort of all these perspectives, like, differ substantially emphasis, but one could basically put significant probability on all of the most confident claims from every perspective. Yeah, certainly the convex combination of them will be more accurate than any particular perspective. And then, like, in order to do significantly better than that, you're going to have to start, like, making more serious claims about, yeah. like, who you're willing to ignore. Who to trust, yeah. Yeah. What would you say is kind of the, the third most plausible, like, uh, broad view? So I think... One reasonably typical view in machine learning to which I'm sympathetic is the sort of all of this will be mostly okay. Yeah. That is, as AI progresses, like we'll get a bunch of empirical experience messing around with ML systems. Sometimes they will do bad things. Correcting that problem will not involve like heroic, heroic acts of understanding. Safety specifically or alignment specifically. Yeah. Or like not not beyond what might happen anyway. Yeah. And it's a little bit hard. You could separate that out into both a claim about like what will happen anyway and a claim about what is required. I guess like the views we're talking about for me and Miri were more about like what is required. Um, We have separate disagreements about what will happen. Uh, I think the ML, there's like a different ML position on what 
is likely to be required, which says more like, yeah, we have no idea what's likely to be required. It's reasonably likely to be easy. Any particular thing we think is reasonably likely to be wrong. And it's like, and I could try and flesh out the view more, but roughly it's this like, we don't know what's going to happen and it's reasonably likely to be easy or like by default expected to be easy. I think there's like a reasonable chance in retrospect that looks like a fine view. Yeah, I think it's not, I don't see how to end up with like high confidence in that view. And if you're at like, you know, a 50% chance of that view, it's not going to have that huge an effect. On, um, on your expected value of working on safety. Yeah. 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 It, it may. It only, it only halves it at worst. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, well, at best. <laughs> yeah. And that like. Increasing that probability from like, if you, if you give that a significant probability, that might matter a lot if you had a like, we're definitely doomed view. So I think like on the Miri view, maybe accepting, like giving significant credence to the normal machine learning perspective would significantly change what they would do. Cause they're like, they currently have this view where you're kind of at like zero. I don't know if you've seen this post on like the logistic success curve that Eliezer wrote. I haven't. The idea yeah. is that if you're like close to zero, then like most interventions, if your probability of success is close to zero, then most interventions that like look commonsensically useful aren't actually going to help you very much because it's just going to move you from like 0.01% to 0.02%. So this would be a view that it's kind of, you need many things all at once to like, like yeah. to have any significant chance of success. And yeah. so just getting one out of a hundred things you need doesn't move you much. That's right. Just making organizations like a little bit more sane or like fixing like one random problem here, random problem there isn't much going to help. So yeah. if you have that kind of view, that's like, it's kind of important then that you're putting really, really low probability on this this isn't the only perspective in ML, but it's like one conventional ML perspective. I think like on my view, it doesn't matter that much if you give that like 30% or 50% or 20% probability. Like I think that probably is not small enough that you should discount that case. Like interventions mm -hmm. that are good if the problem's not that hard yeah. seem like they're likely to be useful. And also but, it's not high enough. That hmm, I would have thought that it would make little difference to your strategy because because in that case things would be okay you don't really have to do anything so you can almost just uh like even if you think it's 50 50 whether any of this is necessary or not um you can just largely ignore that yeah so i'm saying it doesn't make a huge difference yeah. um, a way in which it matters is like you might imagine there's some interventions that are good like in worlds where things are hard and like it was 50 50 and those interventions are still good like maybe they're half as good as the other ways would have been like yeah. you were saying and there's some interventions that are good in worlds where things are easy that is you might be like well if things are easy we could still fuck up in various other ways and make the world bad um, yeah, and so like oh, reducing those probabilities, like I would say that's also a valuable intervention because the probability of things are easy is not low enough that like that's getting driven down to zero. So then just more uh, normal world improvement or like uh, making it more likely that we encode good values. Like, so we, so if the alignment problem is solved, then it becomes more a question of like, what values will we in fact program uh, into an AI and like trying to make sure that those are uh, good ones. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that actually could come up in that world. So like, for example, your AI could have a very, like if an AI has a very uneven profile of abilities, you could imagine having AI systems that are very good at like building better explosives or designing more clever biological weapons that aren't that good at helping us like accelerate the process of like reaching agreements that control yeah. the use of destructive weapons or like I see. better steering the future. And so you like another problem independent of alignment is this like uneven abilities of AI problem. Okay. It's like one example. Mm. Or you might just be concerned that as the world becomes more sophisticated, like there will be more opportunities for everyone to blow ourselves up. Yeah. Or you might be concerned that like we will solve the alignment problem when we build AI, but then someday that AI will build future AI and it will fill up the alignment problem. Uh, so there's like lots of problems you care well, about. I suppose there's also uh, AI could be destabilizing international, rela international relations or politics or, or be used for like bad purposes, even though if so we can give it good instructions and we'll give it instructions to cause harm. Yeah. So then there's a question of like how much you care about that kind of destabilization. I think most people would say they care at least some, like even yeah. if you have like a very focused on the far future perspective, there's some way in which like that kind of destabilization can lead to irreversible damage. So yeah, there's a bunch of random stuff that can go wrong with AI and you might become like more interested in attending to that or saying like, how would we solve those problems with a mediocre understanding of alignment if like a mediocre understanding of alignment doesn't automatically doom you? Yeah. Yeah. Is there anything else you want to say on, uh, I guess, uh, Miri before we move on? Obviously at some point I'll, I'll get someone on from there to, 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 to defend their view and uh, explain like, yeah, what, what research they think is most valuable, hopefully sometime in the next uh, couple of months. Yeah, so I guess one thing I mentioned earlier, there were like these two kinds of concerns or two kinds of arguments they would give that were super doomed on prosaic uh, if AI looks like existing ML systems. I mentioned one of them, this like, even if you have the right objective, it's plausible that the thing you produce will have some other real objective, will be a consequentialist who just incidentally is pursuing that objective on the training distribution. There's the second concern that like actually constructing a good objective is incredibly difficult. So in the context of like the kinds of proposals that I've been discussing, like in context of iterated amplification, they'd then be saying like, well, all the magic occurs in the step where you aggregate a bunch of people to make better decisions than those people would have made alone. And in some sense, like any way that you try and solve prosaic AI alignment is going to have some step like that, where you sort of are implicitly encoding some answer to the alignment problem in the limit of infinite computation. Mm -hmm. And so they might think that that problem, like alignment in that limit is still like sufficiently difficult or like has all the core difficulties in it. So that like, 
it's not clear. This might say that we're doomed uh, under Prosecco alignment, but like more directly, it would just say like, great, we need to solve that problem first anyway. Like, there's no reason to work on like the distinctive parts of Prosecco alignment rather than trying to attack that conceptual problem and then either learning that we're doomed or like having a solution which we could then maybe it would give you a more direct angle of attack. So you're on the board of a newish project called Ort. What is that all about? So the basic mandate is understanding how we can use machine learning to help humans make better decisions. Uh, the basic motivation is that we are super interested in like if machine learning makes the world a lot more complicated and like is able to like transform the world. We want to also ensure that machine learning is able to help humans like understand those impacts and like steer the world in a good direction. That's in some sense like what the alignment problem is about. We want to avoid the situation where there's some mismatch between how well AI can help you like develop new technologies and how well AI can help you like actually manage this more complicated world it's creating. I think the main project. Or certainly like the project at Ought I am most interested in is on what they call factored cognition, which is basically understanding how you can take complex tasks and break them down into pieces where each piece is simpler than the whole. So it doesn't depend on the whole context um, and then compose those contributions back to solve the original task. So you could imagine that either in the context of taking a hard problem and breaking it down to pieces that individual humans can work on. So like say you have you know, 100 humans, you don't want any of them to have to understand the entire task. You want to break off some little piece that that person can solve. Or you could think of it in the context of machine learning systems. And in some yeah. sense, the human version is like most interesting because it is like a warm up or a way of studying in advance the ML uh, version. So in the ML version, that would be, you know, if some, instead of 100 people, you have like some people and a bunch of ML systems, which have some set, like maybe an ML system has like more limited ability to respond to complex context. Or like a human has a lot of context in mind when they articulate this problem. ML system has some limited ability to respond to that context. Or like fundamentally, I think the most interesting reason to care about breaking tasks down to small pieces is because once you make the task simpler, like once an ML system is solving some piece, it becomes easier to evaluate its behavior and whether its behavior is good. So like this is very related to in like the way that iterated amplification hopes to solve AI alignment is by saying we can like inductively train more and more complex agents by composing like weaker agents to make stronger agents. So this factor cognition project is most like it is one possible approach for composing a bunch of weaker agents to make a stronger agent. Um, and in that sense, it's like one of the main addressing like one of the main ingredients you would need for iterated amplification to be able to work. I think right now Ott is kind of the main project that's aiming at acquiring evidence about how well that kind of composition works. Again, in the context of like just doing it with humans, since humans are something we can study today, we can just recruit a whole bunch of humans. Um, and there's like a ton of work in like actually starting to resolve that uncertainty and we can learn about, yeah, there's a lot of work we have to do before we'll be able to tell like, does this work or does it not work? Um, but so that's like one of the main things I was doing right now. The reason I'm most excited about it. Is this a business? Uh, it's organized as a nonprofit. Nonprofit, okay. Is Ort hiring at the moment and what kind of people uh, are you looking for? Yeah, so I think... There are some roles that will hopefully be resolved by the time or like hired for by this podcast comes out. Some mm -hmm. things that are likely to be like continuing hires um, are researchers who are interested in understanding this question, like understanding mm -hmm. and thinking about how you compose like labor, how you compose like the small contributions into solutions to harder tasks. Yeah. And that's a, you know, there are several different disciplines that potentially bear on that, but like mm -hmm. sort of people who are interested in computer science or interested in like I think the approach they're taking means that like people who are interested in programming languages are also a reasonable fit. Um, people who are just I think there's like some stuff that doesn't fit well cleanly into any academic discipline, but if you just think about the problem of like how you put together a bunch of people, like how do you set up these experiments? Hmm. How do you like, how do you help humans be able to function as part of such a machine? So researchers who are interested in those problems is one genre. And then another is like uh, engineers who are interested in helping actually build systems that will be used to test possible proposals or will instantiate like the sort of best guesses about how to solve those proposals. And those will be, I think like in contrast, OpenAI is currently hiring researchers and engineers in like ML. So mm. sort of engineers would then be building ML systems, testing ML systems, mm. um, debugging and improving and so on ML systems. I think it ought like similarly hiring both researchers and engineers and people in between, but there the focus is less on ML and is more on like, again, building systems that will allow humans to like humans and other like simple automation to collaborate to solve hard problems. And so it is more like it involves less of a like distinctive ML background. It's more potentially a good fit for people who have a software engineering background and like the problem sounds interesting and they have like some some relevant background or just the problem sounds interesting and they have a broad background in software engineering okay well i'll, I'll stick up a link to, to the to the Ort website with uh, more information on specifically what it's doing and, and i guess what vacancies are available uh, when, whenever we manage to edit this and get it out <laughs> cool okay let's let's talk about what listeners who are interested in working on this problem uh can, can actually do uh, what, what advice you have for them uh, so we've had a number of episodes on AI safety issues, which have kind of covered these topics before with Dario Amade, your colleague, as I mentioned, Jan Leiker at DeepMind, as well as Miles Brundage and Alan Dafoe uh, at FHI working on more policy and strategy issues. 
you have a sense of where your advice might deviate from those of uh, those four people or just other other people in general on this topic? So I think there's a bunch of categories of work that need to be done or that we'd like to be done. I think I'd probably agree with all the people you just listed about, like each of them presumably would have advocated for some kind of work. So I guess Dario and Jan probably were advocating for machine learning work that really tried to apply or like connect like ideas about safety to our actual implementations, building up the engineering expertise to make these things work and acquiring empirical evidence about like what works and what doesn't. And like, I think that project is extremely important. And like, I'm really excited about EAs, like training up an ML and being prepared to like help contribute to that project, like figuring out whether ML is a good fit for them. And then if so, contributing to that project. Um, I guess I won't talk about that because I assume it's been covered on previous podcasts. Um, I probably also agree with Miles and Alan about there's like a bunch of policy work and like strategic work that seems also incredibly important. I also want to talk more about that. I think some categories of work that I consider important that I wouldn't expect those people to mention. I think for people who don't, like for people with a background in computer science, but not machine learning or who like don't, like don't want to work in machine learning, have decided that's not the best thing, don't enjoy machine learning. I think there's a bunch of other computer science work that's relevant to understanding the mechanics of proposals like debate or amplification. So an example would be like right now, Ott, one of their projects is on factored cognition. So in general, on how can you take a big task and decompose it into pieces, which don't depend on the entire context, and then put those pieces together in a way that preserves like the semantics of the individual agents or the alignment of the individual workers. So that's a problem which is extra important in the context of machine learning or in the context of iterative amplification, but that one can study almost entirely independent of machine learning. That is, one can just say, like, let's understand the dynamics of such decomposition. Let's understand what happens when we like apply simple automation to that process. Let's understand what tasks we can decompose and can't. Let's understand what kind of interface or like what kind of collaboration amongst agents actually works effectively. So that's an example of like a, a class of questions which depend on like are sort of I think well studied from a computer science perspective, but aren't necessarily machine learning questions and which I'd be like really excited to see work on. I think there's like similar questions in the debate space where like just understanding like how do we structure such debates? Do they lead to truth, etc.? I think one could also study those questions not from a computer science perspective at all, but I think it's like super reason like I don't know if you, I think philosophers differ a lot in their taste, but like, for example, if you're a philosopher interested in asking a question about this area, then like, I think under what conditions do debate lead to truth is not really a question about computers in any sense. It's the kind of question that falls under computer scientist sensibilities. But I think that like taking a really like sort of, you know, technical, but not necessarily quantitative approach to that question is like accessible to like lots of people who want to try and help with AI safety and similarly for amplification. So I think in both of those areas, there's like questions that could be studied from a very good science perspective and like involve like software engineering and involve running experiments. And um, this also can be studied from like a more philosophical perspective, just like thinking about the questions and about like what we really want and how alignment works. They can also be studied from this more like psychology perspective of like actually engaging. Like some are going to run like relatively large scale experiments involving humans. Um, I don't know if things are like the time is right for that, but that's like definitely, there's definitely experiments in that space that do seem valuable. And like, it seems likely at some point in the future, there's going to be more of them. Sorry, what do you mean by that? Ah, so if you ask like, how does this kind of decomposition work or how do these kinds of debates work? Like the decomposition is ultimately guided by, right? So I originally described this process involving a human and a few AI assistants. Ultimately, you want to replace that human with an AI that's like predicting what a human would do. But nevertheless, like the way that you're going to train that system or the way we currently anticipate training that system involves a ton of interaction. Like a machine is really just imitating or like maximizing the approval of some human who's running that process. And so in addition to caring about how machines work, you care a ton about like, how does that process work with actual humans? And how can you collect enough data from humans to like, how can you cheaply collect enough data from humans that you can actually integrate this into the training process of powerful AI systems? So I don't think that's a fact about like, that doesn't bear on like many of the traditional questions in psychology. And maybe that's like a bad thing to refer to it as, but it is like, it involves studying humans. It involves like questions about like particular humans and about how humans behave, about how to like effectively or cheaply get data from humans, which are like not really, they're questions machine learning people have to deal with because like we also have to deal with humans, but really it's like a much larger, machine learning people are not that good at dealing with the interaction with humans at the moment. So yeah, I think... So that's some family of questions. I think like the ones I'm most excited about are probably like more in the philosophical computer science bent, but I think they're like not, I think the yeah, lots of people who like wouldn't be a great fit for working on the ML, but would be a great fit for working on those questions. I think also like stepping back further, setting aside amplification or debate, I think there's just still like a lot of very big picture questions about how do you make AI safe? That is like, you could focus on some particular proposal, but you could also just consider like the process of generating additional proposals or understanding the landscape of possibilities, understand the nature of the problem. I don't know if you've ever heard anyone from Mirion, but I'm sure they would advocate for this kind of work. Um, and I think that's also like, I, I consider that pretty valuable. Uh, probably I'm more excited about at the moment about pushing on like our current most promising proposals since I spent a bunch of time thinking about alternatives and like, it doesn't seem as great to me. 
but I also think there's a lot of value to like clarifying our understanding of the problem or like trying to generate like totally different proposals, trying to understand what possibilities are like. Great. Yeah. We're, we're planning to get someone on from Miri in a, in a couple of months time, uh, perhaps when it, when it fits better with their plans and they're, they're hoping to hire. So uh, we'll, get, we'll get some synergies between having the podcast and uh, them actually having some jobs available. That makes sense. So make it a little bit uh, more concrete. Uh, what are OpenAI's kind of hiring opportunities at the moment? And uh, in particular, I, I heard that you're not just hiring ML researchers, but also looking for engineers. So I was interested to learn kind of how they help with your work and 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 how valuable those roles are uh, compared to compared to the kind of work maybe that you're doing. I think there's a sort of spectrum between like, yeah, there's a spectrum between research and engineering. But like most people at OpenAI don't sit at like either extreme of that spectrum. So most people are doing some combination of like thinking about like more conceptual issues in ML and like running experiments and writing code that implements ideas and like then messing with that code, thinking about how it works, like debugging. Yeah, there's like a lot of steps in this pipeline that are not that cleanly separated. And so I think there's some, I think there's like value at the, on the current margin from all the points on the spectrum. And like, I think actually at, at the moment or like right now, I think I'm still spending or like the safety team is still spending a reasonably large, like even people who are nominally very far on the research end are still spending a pretty large fraction of their time doing things that are like relatively far towards engineering. So spending a lot of time like setting up and running experiments, getting things working Again, the, the spectrum between engineering and research is like, I think, not that clean. Or ML is not in really a state where it's that clean. So I think right now, we're, there's a lot of room for people who are more at the engineering side. And again, what I mean by more at the engineering side is like people who don't have a background doing research in ML, but do have a background doing engineering and who are like interested in learning about ML and willing to put in some time, like on the order of months, maybe, like getting more experienced, thinking about ML, doing engineering related to ML. I think there's a lot of room for that. Mostly, so I mentioned these three problems. The first problem was like actually getting the engineering experience to make, say, amplification or debate work at scale. I think that involves a huge amount of getting things to work sort of by the construction of the task. And similarly, like in the third category of like trying to push safety out far enough that it's engaging with like that ML can actually be interacting in an interesting way with human cognition. I think that also involves, again, pushing things to a relatively large scale, doing some research or like some work that's like more similar to conventional machine learning work rather than being safety in particular. I think that like both of those problems are pretty important and both of them require like, like are not that heavily weighted towards like very conceptual machine learning work. I think like my current take, like I currently consider the second category of work that is like figuring out, you know, from a conceptual perspective, is this a good scheme to do? Seems like the most important stuff to me, but also seems like very complementary with the other two categories in the sense that like, I think our, our current philosophy, which I think is which I'm pretty happy with is like, we actually want to be building these systems and starting to run experiments on them in parallel with thinking about like, does this scheme, like what are the biggest conceptual issues for some combination of like, the experiments can also kill, like even if the conceptual stuff work, if experiments don't, that's like another reason that the thing can be a non-starter. And second, that like you can run a bunch of experiments that actually give you a lot of evidence about, like help you understand the scheme much better. And obviously independent of the complementarity, actually being able to implement these ideas is important. Like. There's obviously complementarity between knowing whether X works and actually having the expertise that you're able to implement X, right? The good case, the case that we're aiming at is a case where like we have both developed a conceptual understanding of how you can build blind AI, but then have actually developed teams and like have, have groups that are understand that and are trained to actually put it into practice in cases where it matters. So like we'd like to aim towards the world where there's like a bunch of teams that are able to, yeah, are basically able to apply cutting edge ML to make AI systems that are aligned rather than unaligned. That's, again, harkening back to the very beginning of our discussion, we talked about these two functions of safety teams. I think the second function of like actually make the AI aligned is also an important function. Obviously, it only works if you've done the conceptual work, but also the conceptual work is realistically the main way that's going to be valuable is if there are teams that are able to put that into practice. And that problem is like, to a significant extent, an engineering problem. Just quickly, do you know what vacancies OpenAI has at the moment? Uh, so I guess on the safety team, yeah, I mostly think about the safety team. On the safety team, we're both very interested in hiring ML researchers who have a background in ML research, like who have done that kind of work in the past or have done like exceptional work in nearby fields and are like interested in moving into ML. We're also pretty interested in hiring like ML engineers, that is people who've done engineering work and are maybe interested in like learning or have put in some amount of time. So ideally these are people who are like either are exceptional at doing engineering related to ML or like are exceptional at engineering and have like demonstrated that they're able to get up to speed in ML and are now able to do high quality work. And again, those roles are not like in terms of what they involve, there, there's not like a clean separation between them. It's basically just a spectrum. Yeah, there's several different skills that are useful. We're really looking for all of those skills, like the ability to build things, the ability to do engineering, the ability to do those parts of engineering that are distinctive to ML, the ability to reason about safety, 
the ability to reason about ML, both those at a conceptual level. So the safety team is currently looking for like the entire spectrum of stuff we do. I think that's probably the case in several other teams within the organization. That the organization is large enough, there's like a bunch of places now that like given a particular skill set. Well, again, given any particular skill set on that spectrum, there's probably a place. The organization overall is not that large. We're like at the scale of 60 full-time people, I think. So there's still like a lot of roles that don't really exist that much, like that would at a very large company. But there's a lot of engineering to be done and a lot of conceptual work to be done and a lot of like the whole space in between those. Yeah. Uh, how does working at OpenAI compare to uh, DeepMind and, and other, other top places that people should have, uh, have at the forefront of their brains? Uh, you mean in terms of like my assessment of impact or in terms of like the experience day to day? I think in terms of impact, mostly. Yeah, I don't think I have a really strong view on this question. I think it depends in significant part on things like where you want to be and like which particular people you're most excited about working with. Uh, I guess those are like going to be the two biggest inputs. Yeah, I think that like both teams are doing like reasonable work that accelerates safety. Both teams are like getting experience implementing things and understanding like how you can be integrated into an AI project. I'm optimistic that like over the long run, there will be like some amount of consolidation of safety work at like wherever happens to be the place that is designing like the AI systems for which it's most needed. Awesome. A question that quite a few uh, listeners wrote in with for you was uh, how much uh, people who are concerned about AI alignment should be thinking about moving into computer security in general? And what's the relationship between yeah computer security and, uh, and AI safety? I think it's worth distinguishing two kinds or two relationships between security and alignment, or like two kinds of security research. So one would be security of computer systems that interface with or are affected by AI. So this is kind of like the conventional computer security problem, but now in a world where AI exists. Um, or maybe you like even aren't focusing on the fact that AI exists and are just thinking about conventional computer security. So that's like one class of problems. And there's a second class of problems, which is like the security of ML systems themselves. Like to what extent can an ML system be manipulated by an attacker? Or to what extent does an ML system continue to function appropriately in an environment containing an attacker. So they have different views about those two areas. So on, on the first area, computer security broadly, I think my current feeling is that computer security is quite similar to other kinds of conflict. So that is, if you live in a world where it's possible to like attack, you know, someone's running a web server, it's possible to compromise that web server. Like once people have computers, it's possible to effectively steal resources from them or to like steal time on their computers. That's very similar to living in a world where it's possible to like take a gun and shoot people. And I like regret in general, I love it if there are fewer opportunities for destructive conflict in the world. Like it's not great if it's possible to steal stuff or blow stuff or so on. But from that perspective, I don't think computer security is like, I think that like the core problem in AI alignment is like the core question is, can we build AI systems that are effectively representing human interests? And if the answer is no, then like there are enough forms of possible conflict that I think we're like pretty screwed in any case. And if the answer is yes, if we can build powerful AI systems that are representing human interests, then I don't think cybersecurity is like a fundamental problem any more than like the possibility of war is a fundamental problem. Like it's bad. It's like perhaps extremely bad, but like we will be able, like at that point, the interaction will be between AI systems representing your interests and AI systems representing someone else's interests or AI systems representing no one's interests. And like at that point, I think the situation is probably somewhat better than the situation is today. Uh, that is like, I expect the cybersecurity is less of a problem in that world than it is in this world if you manage to solve alignment. So that's my view on like, computer security that's not like sort of conventional computer security and how Lime interfaces it with, with it. I think it can be made, I basically think like quantitatively computer security can become somewhat more important during this intermediate period where like AI is especially good at certain kinds of attacks and maybe not as useful, like it may end up being not as useful for defense. And so one might want to intervene on like making AI systems more useful for defense. Um, but I think that doesn't have like outsized utilitarian impact compared to other cause areas in the world. I think security of ML systems is a somewhat different story. Uh, mostly because I think security of ML systems, like intervening on security of ML systems seems like a very effective way to advance alignment to me. So if you ask like, how are alignment problems likely to first materialize in the world? Like supposing that I've built some AI system that isn't doing exactly the thing that I want. I think the way that that's likely to first show up is in the context of security. So if I built like a virtual assistant that's representing my interests on the internet, it's like a little bit bad if they're not exactly aligned with my interests. But in a world containing an attacker, that becomes like catastrophically bad often because an attacker can like take that wedge between the values of that system and like my values, and they can sort of create situations that exploit that difference, right? So for example, if I have an AI that like doesn't care about some particular fact, like it like doesn't care about the fact that it like, uses up a little bit of network bandwidth whenever it like sends this request, but like I would really care about that because I wouldn't want to keep like sending requests arbitrarily then an attacker can like create a situation where like my AI is going to become confused and like because it doesn't isn't attending to this cost. Attackers motivated to create a situation where the AI will like therefore pay a whole bunch of the cost. 
So I'm motivated to like trick my AI that doesn't care about sending messages into sending very, very large numbers of messages. Or like if my AI like normally behaves well, but then there exists this like tiny class of inputs, like with very, very small probability it encounters an input that causes it to like behave maliciously. Like, and that will appear eventually in the real world, perhaps. And that's like part of sort of the, it's part of the alignment concern is that that will appear naturally in the world with small enough probability or as you run AI long enough. But like, it will definitely first appear when an attacker is like trying to construct a situation in which my AI behaves poorly. Uh, so I think security is like this interesting connection where like many alignment problems, not literally all, but I think a majority, you should expect to appear first as security problems. And as a result, like I think security is sort of one of the most natural communities to do this research in. When you say an attacker would try to do these things, what what would be their their motivation there? Uh, so that would depend on exactly what AI system it is. But like uh, like a really simple case would be if you have a virtual assistant going out to make purchasing decisions for you, the like way it makes those decisions is like slightly wrong. There are like a thousand agents in the world. There are a thousand people who would like that virtual assistant to like send them some money. So if it's possible to like manipulate the decision it uses for deciding where to send money, then like that's a really obvious thing to try and attack. If it's possible to cause it to like leak your information, so suppose you have an AI which like has some understanding of what information, like of what your preferences are, but doesn't quite understand exactly like how you regard privacy. There's, there are ways of leaking information that it doesn't consider a leak. Because it has a like almost but not completely correct model of what constitutes leaking. Then like an attacker can use that to just take your information by setting up a situation where like the AI doesn't regard something as a leak, but it is a leak, right? If there's like any difference between what is actually bad and what your AI considers bad, then an attacker can come in and like exploit that difference. If like there's some action that would like have a cost to you and a benefit to the attacker, then the attacker wants to set things up so that like your AI system is not recognizing the cost to you. So taking money, taking information, using your computer to like launch other malicious activities, like run denial of service, just causing destruction. Like there's some fraction of attackers who just want to like, like run denial of service attacks. It's like, if you can compromise integrity of a bunch of AI systems people are using, that's like a bummer. Maybe they want to like control what content you see. So if you have AI systems that are like mediating, like how you interact with the internet, like you know, your AI says, like, here's something you should read. There are tons of people who would like to change what your AI suggests that you read. Just because, like, every eyeball is worth a few cents. If you can deploy that at scale, it's, like, a lot of sense. So, like, that's the kind of situation where some of those problems aren't alignment. There are a lot of security problems that aren't alignment problems. But I think it's the case that, like, many, many alignment problems are also security problems. So if one were to be, like, working in security of ML with an eye towards working on those problems that are also alignment problems, um, I think that's actually a pretty compelling thing to do from a long-term AI safety perspective. So it seems to me like uh, AI safety is a pretty fragile area where it would be possible to cause harm by doing uh, kind of subpar research or having the wrong opinions or, or giving the wrong impression, you know, being uh, being kind of a loudmouth who uh, has uh, not not terribly truth tracking views. Uh, like how like how uh, high do you, do you think the bar is for for people going into this field um, without causing harm? Like, is it possible to be kind of at the 99th or 99th point ninth percentile of uh, suitability uh, for doing this, but still on balance, like not really uh, do good because uh, uh, just like the, the kind of unintentional harm that you do outweighs the outweighs the positive contribution that you make? So I do think the current relationship between like the AI alignment community or safety community mm-hmm. and the ML community is a little bit strange mm-hmm. in that you have this. Yeah, this weird situation where there's a lot of like external interest in safety and alignment, yeah. like a lot of external funding, like a lot of people on the street, like sort of sounds like a compelling concern to them. Yeah. That causes a lot of people in machine learning to be kind of on the defensive. That is, they see a lot of like external interest that's like often kind of off base, so, like doesn't totally make sense. Yeah. Um, they're concerned about like policies that don't make sense or diversion of interest from like issues they consider important to like some like, incoherent concerns. So that means, again, they're like a little bit on the defensive in some sense. And as a result, like, I think it's kind of important for people in the field to be reasonably, like, respectful and not causing trouble because there's, like, more likely than in most contexts to, like, actually cause a sort of hostile response. Mm. I don't know if that's, like, much of a property of people. Like, I think someone who believed that this was an important thing, like, if you're at the point where you're like, yep, I'm really concerned about, like, causing, mm. like, political tension or, like, really rocking the boat. That's um, a good sign. Yeah, yeah, I think at that point, like, if you're, if you're at that point and you're, like, basically behaving sensibly then I think things can probably be okay. I mean, I've definitely sometimes, like, I have from time to time, like, caused some distress or, like, run into people who are, like, pretty antagonistic towards something I was saying. Um, Mm -hmm. But I mostly think if you care about a lot or being sensible, then I'd be, like, very surprised if the net effect was negative. Um, I think a lot of people don't care about it very much. They would, like, disagree with this position and say that, Mm -hmm. like, look, this is actually, like, the reason people are antagonistic is not because they're, like, being reasonably concerned about 
like outsiders who like don't have a clear understanding pushing bad policies. Mm. The reason that they're defensive is just because they're like being super silly. And so like, it's just time for a showdown between the people who are being silly and the people who have sensible views. Mm. And like, if you're coming in with that kind of perspective, then like, I mean, presumably this question is not interesting to you because you're like, yeah, Paul's just a, it's just one of the silly sympathizers. Yeah. It's not clear that I'm allowed to give recommendations to people like that or that they would, uh, it's not clear <laughs> that they would be interested in the recommendations. I would recommend like just as part of like a compromise perspective, like if you have that view, then there exist other people like Paul who have a different view on which like there are like some reasonable concerns and one wants to behave like somewhat respectfully towards those concerns. It would be good yeah. if we like all compromised and just didn't destroy things or really piss people off. So if uh, we imagine kind of you and your colleagues and you know, people who are kind of similar to you in other organizations, uh, before you got involved in AI safety, but you had like kind of your, your skills and your talents and interests. But I would say that you can't work on AI safety. Uh, what do you think you should have done otherwise? Yeah, so by can't work on AI safety, you mean like let us ignore all of the impacts of my work via the effect on AI safety. Like a natural thing that I might have done would be go into AI. And I'm like, AI seems important, independent of alignment. Okay, it seems yeah. like AI is reasonably likely, like as a person with a sort of technical background, yeah. it kind of seemed, especially in the past, this is more obvious as a like neglected in this argument in the past. Mm. Like it seemed like there was a good ratio of like effect of the area to like congestion or number of people trying to work on it. And it was a good match for my comparative advantage. Okay. Yeah. So, Let's maybe set that aside as well. Cause yeah, it's uh, pretty similar. Not in yeah. the spirit of the question. <laughs> but yeah. So setting aside all of AI um, and like sort of let's just, just like everything that's having an effect via the overall importance of AI. Mm. I am pretty excited about overall like improving human capacity to like make good decisions, make good predictions, as our coordinate well, etc. So I'm like pretty excited about that kind of thing. I think it would be a reasonable bet. Yeah. So that includes both stuff like some of these things aren't a good fit for my comparative advantage, so it's probably not what I should do. So like examples of things that aren't a good fit for my comparative advantage are like, you know, understanding like pharmacological interventions to make people smarter, understanding just like having a better map of like determinants of cognitive performance like how can you quickly measure cognitive performance what actually determines like how will people do a complicated messy tasks in the real world so you can intervene on that um i think that's like an area where like science can add sort of a really large amount of value like it's very very hard for a firm to add value in that space compared to like a scientist because you're just going to discover facts and like you're not going to be able to monetize them very well probably that's an example of like improving human capacity in a way that i probably wouldn't have done because it's not a great fit for my abilities things that are a better fit for my abilities are like stuff that's more about like what sort of institutions or mechanisms do you use I don't know if I would have worked on that kind of thing. I might have. So an example of a thing I might work on is like... A little bit more law and economics or... Yeah. So an example of a thing that I like find very interesting is like the use of decision markets for collective decision making. Yeah. Um, and so that's like an example of an area that I would seriously consider. Um, and I think there's like a lot of very interesting stuff that you could do in that space. Mm. Uh, it's not an area I've thought about a huge amount because it seems like significantly less high leverage than AI. But it is like a thing which I think there's like a lot of more mathematical work to do. And so if you're avoiding AI and you're like, where does math have a really, like I'm almost certainly going to be working in some area that's like very, very, very similar to like theoretical computer science in terms of what skills it requires. Yeah. I guess, uh, are there other uh, kind of key questions in that field that stand out as being particularly important in maths, computer science, other than AI related things? Um, So definitely most of the questions people ask, I think are, if they're relevant at all, primarily relevant through an effect on AI. So I don't know how much exactly, maybe I took those off the table, maybe that was too much. I think that like a basic problem is if you really care about differential progress, so like yeah. effective altruists tend to have this focus on, it doesn't matter if we get somewhere faster, it mostly yeah. matters like what order technologies are developed in or like yeah. what trajectory we're on. I think really a lot of the things people work on are like, a lot of things people work on in math or computer science are like founded on this, based on this principle, like we don't know how X is going to be helpful, but it's going to be helpful in some way, which I think yeah. is often like a valid argument, but I think is not helpful for differential progress or like yeah. you need a different flavor of that argument if you want to say it's hard to say. We don't know how this is going to be helpful, but we believe it's going to be helpful to things that are good. Specifically, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, like, I think a lot of stuff in math and computer science is less appealing from a, like, long-run altruist perspective because of that. Mm-hmm. Um, I think stuff on decision-making in particular, like, what kinds of institutions do you, like, I, yeah, I think I was very interested in and did work on in my thesis was just, like, this is a giant family of problems. Like, you have N people. They, like, each have access to some local information and would like to make some decisions. Like, you can formalize a ton of problems in that space. Like, they would like to decide what to produce and what to consume and, like, what to build so on. Just asking this question, saying, what are good algorithms that people can use? It's, like, a really amusing computer science question. Yeah. Cool. I don't know that much about these areas, but it's, like, a very exciting kind of area. You may not have uh, anything new to say about this one, but, like, uh, what would you say are the most important ways that uh, people in the effective altruism community are approaching uh, AI issues incorrectly? So I think one feature of the effective altruism community is maybe it's like path dependence or founder effects, yeah. where like people in EA who are interested in AI safety are often sort of very informed by this Miri perspective for the very sensible reason that like Miri folk 
and Nick Bostrom were probably like the earliest people like talking seriously about the issue. Hmm. Um, so there's like a cluster of things that I would regard as errors that come with that. Um, so like some perspective on like how you should think about sophisticated AI systems. Hmm. So for example, like very often thinking in terms of like a system that has been given a goal. Or rep- this is actually not a mistake that Miriam makes. This is a mistake many AIs make. Hmm. So many AIs would like think about an AI as being handed some goal or like an explicit representation of some goal. Hmm. And the question is just how do we choose that explicit representation of a goal such hmm. that pursuing it leads to good outcomes. Um, which I think is like an okay model of AI to work with sometimes, but it's like mostly not, like certainly not a super accurate model. And most of the problems in AI alignment don't appear in that model. So that's like a kind of error. Again, attributing that one to Miri is somewhat unfair and that Miri themselves wouldn't make this error, um, but it is a consequence of people. It's kind of a bastardized version of their view. That's right. Like an analogous thing is like, I think that the way you should be thinking probably about building AI systems is like more based on this idea of corrigibility. So it's like AI systems that are going along with what, like helping people correct them, helping humans like understand what they're doing and like overall participating in a process that points in the right direction rather than attempting to communicate the actual like what is valuable or having a system that embodies like what humans intrinsically want in the long run. Yeah. So I think it's like a somewhat important distinction and that's kind of intuitively if an animal person talks about this problem, they're really going to be thinking about it from that angle. Like they're going to be saying like, great, we want our AI to not kill everyone. We want it to like help us understand what's going on, etc. And so like sometimes these come with the perspective of like, but consider the whole complexity of moral value and like how would you communicate that to an AI? I think that is like an example of a mismatch that's probably mostly due to an error on the EA side. Though it's certainly the case that this concept, like corrigibility is a complicated concept. And like, if you actually think about the mechanics of how that works, it's like really there's a lot more moving parts than the normal ML perspective would kind of suggest. Or like, again, it's not even really like a current ML perspective. It's like the knee-jerk response of someone who's been actually thinking about ML systems. Uh, I guess I have like difference of views with, e- like I think EAs often have maybe also for founder effecty reasons. Like, actually, no, I think for complicated reasons. Um, they tend to have a view where the development of AI is likely to be associated with both like sort of very, very rapid changes and also like very rapid concentration of power. Hmm. Um, I think that like is overestimate the extent to which like the probability of that happening. So this is like, yeah, that's certainly a disagreement between me and most EAs. So, like, I think it's much more likely they're going to be in the regime where there's like reasonably broadly distributed AI progress and like AI is getting deployed a whole bunch all around the world. And like maybe that happens rapidly like over the time scale of a year or two years that the world moves from something kind of comprehensible to something radically alien, but it's not likely to be like a year during which like somewhere inside Google AI is being developed. And at the end of the year it rolls out and takes over the world. It's more likely to be a year during which like just everything is sort of in chaos. Like the chaos is very broadly distributed chaos as AI gets rolled out. Is it possible that the, the, there'll be better uh, containment of the intellectual property such that other groups can't copy and, and one group does uh, go substantially ahead? I mean, at the moment, almost all AI, uh, research is published publicly such that it's like relatively easy to uh, replicate, but that may not remain the case. Yeah. So I think there's definitely, there's definitely this naive economic perspective on which this would be incredibly surprising. Namely, like if you have this, so in this scenario where AI is about to take over the world, then like, and it's driven primarily by like progress in AI technology rather than like control of large amounts of hardware, then like that intellectual property now, like, you know, the market value, if you were to market to market, it would be like eh, $10 trillion or whatever. And so you sort of expect that like an actor who is like developing that, like the amount of pressure, like competition to develop that would be very large. Mm. You expect like very large coalitions to be in the lead over like small actors. Mm. So like it wouldn't, Google's like not quite at the scale where they can plausibly do it. But you could imagine like sort of if all of Google was involved in this project, that becomes mm. plausible. But then again, you're not like imagining like a small group in their basement. You're imagining like an entity which was already producing on the order of like, you know, a trillion had value. It was already valued on the order of multiple trillions of dollars, mm. taking some large share of its resources into this development project. And that's kind of conceivable. Like, you know, the value will going from like $5 trillion to $100 trillion. Like that's a huge jump. This 20X in value, $100 trillion being your value if you take over the world. Like the 20X is a huge jump, but like that's kind of in the regime of what's possible. Whereas I think like a billion dollars taking over the world is just like super implausible. So there's like a naive economic perspective, which like makes that prediction very confidently. To compare that to the real world, you have to think about like a lot of ways in which the real world is not like sort of an idealized, simple economic system. But I still think it will be the case that probably AI development will involve like very large coalitions involving very large amounts of hardware, large numbers of researchers. Um, regardless of like if intellectual property is contained really well, then it might take place within a firm or like a like tightly coordinated cluster of firms rather than distributed across like the academic community. Mm-hmm. In fact, I don't I would not be at all surprised if the academic community didn't play a super large role. But then the distinction is between like distributed across a large number of loosely coordinated firms versus distributed across like a network of tightly coordinated firms. Yeah. And like in both cases, it's a lot of is a big group. It's not like a small group being covert. And like once you're in the regime of that big group, then like, yeah, I mean, probably what ends up happening there is like the price. So if it's like Google's doing this, 
unless they're like in addition to being really tight about IP, also really tight about what they're doing. Like you see the share price of Google like start growing very, very rapidly in that world. Um, and then probably like, yeah, as that happens, eventually you start running into like problems where you like can't scale markets gracefully. And then policymakers probably become involved at the point in the market is staying like Google is roughly as valuable as everything else in the world. Everyone is like, geez, this is like some serious shit. Google's an interesting case actually, because corporate governance at Google is like pretty poor. So like Google has this interesting property where like it's not clear that owning a share of Google would actually entitle you to anything if Google were to take over the world. Many companies are like somewhat better governed than Google in this respect. So ex- explain that. Uh, so oh. Google like is sort of famous for like shareholders having very little influence on in what Google does. So if Google hypothetically would have this massive windfall, like it's not really clear. Like it would be kind of a complicated question what Google as an organization ends up doing with that windfall. And Google seems like kind of cool. I like Google. They seem nice. Probably like they would do something good with it. Mm. But it's not obvious to me that being a shareholder in Google then like gives you you, like, you don't get the dividend or you could uh, sell the shares? Or well, you no get the dividend, dividend, but it's not clear whether there would be a dividend. So like, for saying, example, most shares that are sold in Google. You're saying there's a possibility of like retaining the earnings to just invest in other things and yeah, it never some, gets handed Build back, some Google City, build more Google, Google projects. It's so interesting. In particular, yeah. most shares of Google that are traded are non-voting shares, I think. Okay. I don't actually know very much about Google's corporate governance. Yeah. Sort of famous there's two classes. Of, property. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so I believe a majority of voting shares are still held by like three individuals. I see. So I think the shareholders don't have any formal power in the case of Google, essentially. Um, yeah. There's a question of like informally, there's some expectations. And again, like if yeah. they're taking over the world, like formal mechanisms are already probably breaking down. There's so, also plenty of surplus to distribute. Well, yeah, that depends on what you care about. So from the perspective in general, like <laughs> as AI has developed from the perspective of like humans living happy lives, there's sort of massive amounts of surplus. People mm-hmm. have tons of resources from the perspective of like if what you care about is relative position or like owning some large share of what is ultimately out there in the universe, yeah. then there's in some sense, there's only one universe to go around. So people will be divvying it up. So I think like the people who are mostly interested in living happy lives and like having awesome stuff happen to them and like having their families and friends all be super happy. Like those people are always going to be really satisfied and it's going to be awesome. Yeah. And then the remaining conflict will be amongst like either like people who are very like sort of greedy in the sense they just want as much stuff as they can have or like yeah. states that are very interested in like ensuring the relative prominence of their state, things like that. Utilitarians, I guess, are one of the like offenders yeah. here. Where utilitarian wouldn't be like, yeah, it's great, so, I got to live a happy life. Utilitarian yeah, yeah. is like they have like linear returns to more resources more yeah. than most people do. Yeah. yeah, I guess like yeah, any well, yeah, any universalist moral system may well have this property. Oh, I'm actually not necessarily, but most of them. Yeah, I think a lot of impartial values generally have. Yeah. Another blog post you wrote recently was about how valuable it would be if we could create uh, an AI that uh, didn't seem uh, value aligned. And yeah, whether that would have any value at all or whether it would basically mean that the, uh, we'd, we'd gotten zero value out of the world. Yeah, do you want to explain what your argument was there? Yeah, so I think this is a perspective that's reasonably common, but again, in the mall community and in like the broader like academic world or in the broader intellectual world. Namely, you build some very sophisticated system. One thing you could try and do is you could try and make it just want what humans want. Another thing you could do is you could just say, great, it's some sophisticated, some like very smart system that has like all kinds of complicated drives. Like maybe it should just do its own thing. Maybe we should be happy for it. Maybe like, you know, in the same way that we think humans were an improvement over bacteria, we should think that like this AI we built is an improvement over humans. Should live its best life. Yeah. So I think it's not an uncommon perspective. Um, I think people in the alignment community often are like pretty dismissive of that perspective. I think it's like a really hard, I think like people on both sides, like both people who sort of accept that perspective intuitively and people who dismiss that perspective, I think like haven't really engaged with how hard a like moral question that is. Yeah, so I think it's like extremely, I consider it extremely non-obvious. I like am not happy about the prospect of building such an AI just because it's kind of an irreversible decision or like handing off the world to this kind of AI we built, a somewhat irreversible decision. And it seems unlikely to be optimal, right? Uh, I guess. Yeah, so I think that's the, I guess I would say like half as good, if it's like half as good as humans doing their thing, I'm like not super excited about that. Yeah. That's like just half as bad as extinction. Like again, trying to avoid that outcome would then be only, it'd be half as important as trying to avoid extinction. But like, again, the factor of two is not going to be decisive. Yeah. I think the interesting question is, yeah. So I think the main interesting question is like, is there a way, is there such an AI you could build that would be like close to optimal? And I do agree that like a priori, like most things aren't going to be close to optimal. It'd be kind of surprising if that was the case. Um, I do think there are some kinds of AIs that are very inhuman for which it is close to optimal and like understanding that border between, you know, when that's very good, like when we should sort of, as part of being a good cosmic citizen, should be happy to just build the AI versus when that's like a great tragedy is like maybe an important, it's important to understand that boundary if there is some kind of AI you can build that's not aligned, but still good. Yeah. Um, and so in that post, I made like a few, I both like made some arguments for why there should be some kinds of AIs that are good despite not being aligned. And then I also tried to like push back a little bit against the intuitive picture some people have that's the default. Yeah. So I guess 
the, the intuitive picture in favor is just it's good when agents kind of get what they want uh, and this uh, this AI will will want some things and then it will go about getting them and that's uh, that's all for the good. Uh, and the alternative you'd be, well, yes, but it might exterminate life on Earth and then fill the universe with something like paper clips or some some random thing that doesn't seem to us like it's valuable at all. So, the, what a what a complete waste that would be. Uh, is that is that about right? Uh, that's definitely like a rough first pass. That's basically yeah. right. Um, there's definitely a lot that can be said on the topic. So, for example, someone who has the favorable view could say, like, yes, it would be possible to construct an agent which like wanted a bunch of paper clips, but such an mm-hmm. agent like would be unlikely to be produced. So it'd have to go out of your way. In fact, like maybe the only way you'd produce such an agent is if you're really trying to solve alignment. If you just mm-hmm. like tried to run something like evolution, then like consider the analogy to evolution. Right. Humans are so far from the kind of thing that would like yeah. So so one position would be the yeah, other exists such bad AIs, but if you run something like evolution, you'll get a good AI instead. And so mm-hmm. then that perspective might then be optimistic about mm-hmm. like the the trajectory of modern ML. That is from some, like on some alignment perspectives, well, this is really terrifying. We're just doing this black box optimization. Who knows what we're going to get from some other perspectives? You're like, well, that's what produced humans. So like Mm. we should pay it forward. I think also people get a lot of mileage out of the like normal analogy to descendants. That is people say, well, we like would have been unhappy had our ancestors like been really excited about controlling like the trajectory of our society and tried to ensure their values were imposed on the whole future. And like, Mm. likewise, even if like our relationship to AI systems we build is different than the relationship of our ancestors to us, it has like this structural similarity and you know, likewise, the AI would be annoyed if like, we went really out of our way and paid large costs to constrain the future trajectory of civilization. So yeah. maybe like, we should be nice and like, do unto others who have them do unto us. I don't find that persuasive, personally. Uh, I certainly is it, is it, don't find it persuasive like, out of the box, yeah. Yeah, it just seems very different because uh, I guess we're very similar by design to humans from 500 years ago, just with like, probably more information and more time to think about what we want. Whereas I think you can't just... yeah. Like an, an AI might be just so differently designed that it's like a completely different uh, jump. Whereas, like from our point of view, it could be well. Yeah, I don't know, may, 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 yeah. I, I think the I more guess. compelling. So I don't really lean much on this. Or like I don't take much away from the analogy to descendants. I, mean, I think yeah. it's like a reasonable analogy to have thought about, but it's not going to run much of the argument. Yeah. Um, I think the main reason that you might end up being altruistic towards, like, say, the kind of a product of evolution would be if you said. Like from behind the veil of ignorance, humans have some complicated set of drives, etc. If like humans go on controlling Earth, like that like set of values and preferences humans have is going to get satisfied. Yeah. If we were to run some new process that's similar to evolution, it would produce a different agent with a different set of values and preferences. Mm-hmm. But like from behind the veil of ignorance, like it's mm-hmm. just as likely that our preferences would be the preferences of the thing that actually evolved on Earth as that our set of preferences would be the preferences of this AI that got created. So like if you're willing mm-hmm. to step far enough back behind the veil of ignorance, yeah. then you might say like, okay, I guess. That's 50-50. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I think there are some conditions under which you can make that argument tight. And so like even like a causal, perfectly selfish causal decision theorist would in fact, for like these normal weird causal trade reasons, would in fact like want to let the AI, like would be happy for the AI. And then there's a question of like outside of those very extreme cases where there's like a really tight argument that you should be happy, like how happy should you be if there's a loose analogy between the process that you ran and biological evolution? So what do you think are kind of the best arguments both for and against uh, thinking that an un- unaligned or what seems like an unaligned AI would would be morally valuable? So I think it certainly depends on which kind of unaligned AI we're talking about. So one question is like, what are the best arguments that there exists an unaligned AI which is morally valuable? And then another question is like, what are the best arguments that like some particular like a random AI is morally valuable, etc.? So I guess the best argument for the existence, which I think is an important place to get started, or like if you're starting from this dismissive perspective, like most people in the alignment community sort of have intuitively, I think the existence argument is a really important first step. Hmm. I think the strongest argument on the existence perspective is consider the hypothetical where you're actually able to, in your computer, create like a nice little simulated planet from exactly the same distribution as like, you know, Earth. So you like run Earth, you run evolution on it, you get something very different from human hmm. evolution, but it's exactly a draw from the same distribution. Yeah. Do you think it's like 50-50 whether it's likely to be better or worse than us on average, right? Uh, well, from our values, it might be yeah. much like having conditioning okay, yeah. now on our values, it might yeah. definitely be much yes. worse. Yeah, um, but, but conditioning on being agnostic about what values are good. Yeah, uh, that's yeah. right. Uh, or like it's yeah, it's a really complicated moral philosophy question. Mm. Then the extreme, I think we can even make it actually tighter. So if you were to just make such a species and then like let that let that go in the universe, I think then you have, you have a very hard question about whether that's a good deal or a bad deal. I think yeah. you can do something a little bit better. You can do something a little bit more clearly optimal, which is like create, if you're able to create many such simulations, yeah. like run evolution, not just once, but many times, mm-hmm. look across all of the resulting civilizations and pick out a civilization, which like is constituted such that it's going to do exactly the same thing you're currently doing such that when they have a conversation like this, they're like, yeah, sure. Let's like let out that, like, let's just run evolution and like let that thing prosper. Mm-hmm. Then kind of like now the civilizations who follow the strategy are just engaged in like this musical chairs game where like, 
each of them started off evolving on some worlds and then they like randomly simulate a different one of them in the same distribution. <laughs> and then like that takes over that world. So like you have exactly the same set of values in the universe now, yeah. like across the people who adopt this policy just shuffled around. Yeah. So it's clear that like it's better for them to do that than it is for them to like say face some substantial risk of building unaligned AI. Oh, okay. So I didn't understand this in the post, but now I think I do. So the idea is like, imagine that there's a million universes all with like different, different versions of Earth where like life has evolved. Yeah. If you're willing to and, go for a really big universe, you can imagine they're literally just all copies of exactly the same solar system on which the evolution went a little bit differently. Yeah. Uh, and so they all end up with uh, somewhat different values. Um, and you're saying if, but if they're all, uh, if all of their values imply that they should uh, just reshuffle their values and like, uh, yeah, run a simulation and then like just be, be just as happy to go with whatever that spits out as what they seem to prefer. Then all they do is kind of trade places on average. They all just like, you all just end up with like different draws from this broad distribution of like possible values that people could have across this, uh, this somewhat narrow, but still broad set of, of worlds. Yeah. But you're saying this is better. Uh, because they don't have to worry so much about alignment. So, oh, so you mean why are things better after having played after having rearranged? Yeah, why does the musical chairs thing where, where everyone just everyone just flips values on average with with other people uh, produce a better outcome uh, like in total? Yeah, so I think this is most directly relevant as an answer to the question: Why should we believe there exists a kind of AI that we would be as happy to build as an aligned AI, even though yeah. it's unaligned? Um, but in terms of like why it would actually be good to have done this, like the natural reason is we have some computers. The concerning feature of our current situation is that like human brains like are not super like we have all these humans. We're concerned that the AIs running on these computers are going to be better than humans, mm. um, such that we're sort of necessarily going to have to pass control over the world off to things running on these computers. Mm. And so like after you've played this game musical chairs, now like the new residents of our world are actually running on the computers. So mm. now you'd sort of like as if you got your good brain relations um, for free. That is now you those people who have access to simulations of their brain can do whatever it is they would, whatever you would have done with your AI, they can do with themselves. Okay. It's a, yeah, there's really a lot of moving parts here and like a lot of ways this maybe doesn't make any sense. <laughs> okay. Well, let me just think. So if we handed it off, if we handed off the future to an AI that was running a simulation of these worlds and like, and using that as its reference point for like what it should value on average from this very like abstracted point of view, this would be no worse and if every if all of the people in this like broad set did this, then they would like save a bunch of trouble trying to like get the AI to do exactly what they want in that universe. That's they right. could all just just kind of trade with one another. Uh, well, well, they all they all get to save the overhead of trying to make the AI align well, uh, the- with, with them specifically. Instead, they have to align it to some like other poll that they've created of like uh, yeah some evolutionary process that it, uh, then like that listens to inside the computer. I mean, the concern is presumably not the overhead, but rather the risk of failure. It is, if, like, if you think there's a substantial risk that you, you would build a kind of AI which is not valuable, then like this would be you're like right. So that's we, that's our current state. We're like we but, might build an AI that does something no one wants. We could instead build an AI that does something that we want. Yeah. So maybe a second, a third alternative, which is like the same as the good outcome between those two, is just yeah. build an AI that does you know reflects values that are the same from the same distribution of values that we have. Okay. So you, you, you try to align it with your values. And if you fail, I'd think, well, there's always this backup option that maybe it will be valuable anyway. This is but definitely like plan B. Yeah. yeah. And so it would mostly be relevant. And again, to be clear, this this weird thing with evolution is like not something that's going to get run because you can't sample from exactly the same distribution as evolution. It would just yeah. prompt the question, what class of AIs have this desirable future, yeah. given that you believe at least one does? And yeah, it would be a plan B. So the reason to like work on the, there's this moral question, what class of AIs are we happy with despite not being aligned with us? And like the reason to work on that moral question would be that if you had a reasonable answer that like it's an alternative to doing alignment, if we had like a really clear answer to that question, then like we could be okay anyway, even if we mess up alignment. Okay, so this would be a, yeah, I, I see. It would be an alternative approach to getting something that's valuable, even if it's not aligned in some narrow sense with us. Yeah. And it might be an easier problem to solve perhaps. That's right. Or at least people have not. Argument. Yeah, I mean, on my list of moral philosophy problems, it's like my top, my top rated moral philosophy problem. Interesting. I think not that many people have worked on it that long. So if you were a moral realist, you just believe that there are objective moral facts. They should be totally fine with this kind of thing. Like I don't, from their perspective, why I think that humans are better at discovering objective moral facts than. Yeah. Actually, uh, I, don't, I don't know moral positions very well, but like my understanding, some well, moral well, would go for that. Hmm. But uh, I, I guess they might they might look at uh, humans and say, well, I do just think that we've like done better than average or better than you would expect uh, at doing this. For example, we we care about this problem to to begin with, whereas like many other agents just might not even have the concept of morality. Uh, so in that sense, we've like, we're like we're in the top half, uh, maybe, maybe not like the very top, but uh, but I, I you know I wouldn't roll the dice completely again. But then it seems like they should also then think that there's a decent chance. The fact that 
if, if, if we did okay, it suggests that there's a decent chance that if you rolled the dice again, uh, you'd, you'd get something somewhat valuable. Because it would be an extraordinary coincidence if we managed to do really quite well um, at, moral, uh, yeah, at, fig- at moral realism and figuring out what these moral effects are. But then, like, uh, if it was extremely improbable for that to happen to begin with. Yeah, I would. I mean, it's definitely if you're moralist, you're going to have different views on this question. It's going to depend a lot on, like, what other views you take on, like, a bunch of related questions. Yeah. And, like, I don't have, I'm not super familiar with, like, coherent moral realist perspectives. Yeah. But, like, on my kind of perspective, sort of, if you make some moral errors early in history, it's not a big deal as long as you, like, are on sort of the right path with the spectrum of moral deliberation. Yeah. And so you might think, like, from the realist perspective, there'd be a big range of, like, acceptable outcomes. And you could, in fact, be quite a bit worse than humans as long as, like, you were, again, on this, like, right path with spectrum of deliberation. Yeah. I don't quite know how moral realists feel about deliberation. Like, would they say they're, like, this broad distribution? Yeah, I, don't, I think there's like probably a lot of disagreement amongst moralists, and it's just not a. Yeah, but then if you're just a total subjectivist, you think there's like nothing that people ought to think is right. Uh, instead, you just kind of want what you want. Yeah. Well, why, would you, why do you care at all about uh, like what what other people in different hypothetical runs well, of evolutions would care about? Like, wouldn't you just be like completely? Uh, what well, I don't even care what you want. Like, all I care is about what I individually want, and I just want to maximize that. Yeah. So then you get into this like decision theoretic reasons to behave kindly. So like the basic, the simplest pass would be from behind, like if you could have made a commitment before learning your values to like act in a certain way, then that would have benefited your values and expectation. So if there are similarly, if there are like logical correlations between your decision and decisions of others with different values, then that might be fine. Like even on your values, it might be correct for you to make this decision because it correlates with um, this other decision, like decision made by others. In like the most extreme case, at some point I should caveat this entire like last however many ten minutes, fifteen minutes of discussion. It's yeah. like this is a bunch of weird shit that doesn't affect my behavior <laughs> as an employee of OpenAI. Like yeah. I do normal stuff, making AI good for humans. <laughs> anyway, then you get into like weird shit where like w- once you're doing this like musical chairs game, then like one step of that was you ran a bunch of simulations and saw which ones were inclined to participate in the scheme you're currently running. And so like from that perspective, like us as humans would be like, well, we might as well be in such a simulation. In which case, like even on our narrow values, by running the scheme, like we're going to be the ones chosen to like take over the outside world. Why are you more likely to be chosen to go into the outside world if you're cooperative? Uh, so like the scheme which would run, if you want to do the musical chairs thing, yeah. you can't just like simulate a random species and let it take your place. Okay. Because that is just then going to move from those species that run this procedure. They're all going to give up their seat and I then see. a random species oh. is going to replace them. So you end up, uh, it's like evolutionarily bad strategy. That's a bad strategy. Uh, yeah, the thing that might be an okay strategy is you run the scheme and then you, you test ch- for each species before you let them replace you. Did they also run the scheme? And you then choose so, from the cooperative ones. Yeah. Yeah. And then that okay. would cause the incentives to be. Yeah. I think this anyway. does get a bit weird once we're talking about the simulations. I, th- oh, it's I, th- super I think weird. it's super <laughs> weird. I think the, yeah, the earlier parts were like more normal. Yeah. Yeah. The, the question of just that, yeah, uh, w- whether an AI would be morally valuable uh, seems like much, much more mainstream. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. Uh, I think it's also more important. Angle. Like, I think this weird stuff with simulations probably doesn't matter. Whereas I think the question, like morally, like how valuable is it to have this AI which has values that are kind of like from some similar distribution to our values? Yeah. I think that's actually pretty important. I think it's relatively common for people to think that would be valuable, and it's like not a position alignment people have engaged with that much. It's not a question, to my knowledge, that moral philosophers have engaged with that much. A little bit, They're like not. I guess maybe they come from a different perspective than I would like want to really attack the question from. That's yeah. often the case with moral philosophers. Yeah. Uh, I guess another point is that I'm also like kind of scared of this entire topic, and that like I think a reasonably likely way that like AI being unaligned ends up looking in practice is like people build a bunch of AI systems. They're like extremely persuasive and personable because you've like optimized them to like they can be optimized effectively for like having whatever superficial properties you want. Yeah. So then you live in a world with just a ton of AI systems that want like random garbage, yeah. but they like they look really Pretend. sympathetic yeah. and they're like making really great pleas. They're like really this is incredibly yeah. inhumane. They're like killing us after this or the selecting us to like imposing your values on us. Yeah. Um, and then I expect I think like the sort of current way overall that like intellectual consensus goes is like really to be much more concerned about people being like Cruelty. bigoted or failing to respect the rights of AI systems than to be concerned about the actual character of those systems. Right. I think it's like a pretty likely failure mode and something I'm concerned about. Interesting. I hadn't really thought about that scenario. So the idea is here, we create a bunch of AIs uh, and then we kind of have a, an AI justice movement that like, that gives AIs uh, maybe more control. Oh, like, yeah, more, more control over the world and more moral consideration. But then yes. it turns out that while they're like very persuasive at like advocating for uh, their moral interests, in fact, their moral interests, uh, when they're given like more autonomy, uh, are nothing like ours, no, or no. much less than they seem. Then we're back to this question, which was unclear, yeah. of, like how valuable are like, maybe that's fine. I don't actually yeah. have a super strong view on that question. I think an expectation, yeah. I'm not super happy about it. But but by kind of arguing for, like, uh, the moral rights of AIs, you, you're making the scenario more possible, more, more plausible. 
I mean, I mostly think it's going to be like, I strongly suspect there's going to be serious discussion about this in any case. And like, yeah. I would prefer that there be some actual figuring out what the correct answer is prior to like it becoming yeah. an emotionally charged or politically charged issue. Hmm. I'm not super confident also to be clear about anything we're saying here. These are not like 80% of views. These are like 40% yeah. views. Yeah. An example would be like, often when we talk about failure scenarios, I will talk about like, there are a bunch of automated, like, like these autonomous corporations that control resources and they're amassing resources that no human gets to use for any purpose. Yeah. And people's response is like, well, that's absurd. We would just like say, look, legally, you're just a machine. You have no right to own things. We're going to take your stuff. Yeah. That's like something that I don't think is that likely to happen. Like I suspect yeah. that like to the extent lots of resources are controlled by AI systems, those AI systems will be like in the interest of preserving those resources will make like fairly compelling appeals for respecting their rights. Um, in the same way that like a human would if you were like if all the humans get around and like yeah, yeah we're just going to take uh, it just like such terrible optics and seems like so much not a thing that i expect our society to do like everyone just being like we're going to take all of these actors resources we just like don't think they have the right to like self-determination interesting it seems like the seems like the default to me but maybe not i guess the, the issue is that um the ais will be able to advocate for themselves without human assistance potentially uh, in a way that like a corporation can't a corporation is still made of people Although, like do do corporations like make an argument that like uh oh, I'm a separate entity and I like deserve rights and uh, should be able to like amass resources that don't go to shareholders. I guess the problem is like there it's controlled by shareholders. So it's ultimately bottoms out at people in some way. Yes. Yeah, so and AI doesn't necessarily. I think it is both the case that corporations do in fact have like a level of rights that would be sufficient to run the risk argument. So that if the outcome was the same as corporations, that would be sufficient to be concerned. But I also think that corporations are like both. Yeah, they do bottom out with people in a way that these entities wouldn't. And that's like one of the main problems. And also they're just not able to make persuasive arguments. That is, like, one, they're not able to represent themselves well. Like, they don't have, like, a nice, like, ability to articulate eloquent arguments that, like, plausibly originate with, like, this actual moral patient making yeah. the arguments. Yeah. And then, two, the actual moral case is more straightforward for corporations. Whereas I think for AIs, there will actually be a huge amount of ambiguity. And I think the yeah. sort of default, again, from if you interact with, like, people who think about these issues some right now, um, like, we talk to random academics who think about philosophy and AI, or you, like, look at Hollywood movies that are, like, somewhat less horrifying than, yeah. like, Terminator um, I think the normal theme would be like, yeah, by default, we expect once such agents are as sophisticated as humans, they like are yeah. deserving of moral consideration for the same kinds of reasons humans are. And it like, it's reasonably likely that people will deny them that moral consideration, but that would be like a terrible moral mistake. I think that's like yeah. kind of the normal, not normal view, but that's like, if I were to try and guess well, where like opinion is heading or where it will end up, that'd be my guess. Yeah, I guess uh, I, I feel like the AI is probably would demand like a, a deserve moral consideration and since like they're i also matter. agree with that sure yes. yeah so, <laughs> that's so that what makes that's, the situation so tricky that, that that's true but then there's this question of uh it's like they deserve uh moral consideration as to their i, I suppose because i'm like uh sympathetic to hedonism i care about their welfare but then do i don't I, to but be clear i totally as, care about their welfare. as do i yeah as as we all should but uh i don't necessarily then want them to be able to uh do everything like, like do uh, whatever they want with other resources, uh, which is an intro. I guess it's, I mean, I feel it's that way. I, I feel that, no, but I feel that way about other people as well, not necessarily, <laughs> right? That I like, I want, I want other people on earth to like have high levels of welfare, but that doesn't necessarily mean I want to hand over the universe to whatever the, to whatever they want. I just think, uh, yeah, it makes the character of this debate like a lot more contentious. If you're like, yeah, yeah. everyone agrees that there's this giant class of individuals, which is potentially <laughs> reasonably large which like currently does some large fraction of labor in the world, yeah. which is like asking for the right to like self-determination and control property and so on. And like, and, like, and, like are also uh, way more eloquent than we are. It's yeah. Like, oh, geez, like, <laughs> and we'll, we'll, we'll give you the welfare that we think you should deserve. <laughs> uh, yeah. This doesn't sound good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think the main reason I think it's plausible is that like, we do observe this kind of thing with like non-human animals. People are pretty happy to be like, yeah. pretty terrible to non-human animals. Um, but, I think oh, that, but that's another case where it's like, for, uh, for example, I think that we should uh, be concerned about the welfare of pigs and like make pigs live good but i wouldn't then give pigs you know lots of gdp to like organize in the way that <laughs> pigs want that's right uh, but i suppose yeah the disanalogy there is that we think that we're more intelligent and have values than pigs uh whereas uh, it's less clear that'll be true with ai but uh, like in as much as i worry that ai wouldn't have good values uh, it's it's it actually is quite analogous that yeah i mean i think your position is somewhat like the arguments you're willing to make here are somewhat unusual amongst humans probably i think most humans would have more of a tight coupling between like moral concern and like thinking that a thing and, deserves liberty and general determination and stuff like that right uh do you, think, like, do you think they're bad arguments i suppose yeah it, it, like it, it flows more naturally from a hedonistic point of view than a preference utilitarian point of view that seems to be maybe where we're coming apart oh no i mean i yeah. also would be like yep i care about the welfare of lots of agents who i believe like i believe it's yeah. like terrible a terrible bad thing though maybe not the worst thing ever if you're like mistreating yeah. a bunch of ai systems like yeah. this, i think they probably are, I mean, are like at some point to be moral patients yeah 
but like I would totally agree with you that like I can have that position and simultaneously believe that it was like either a terrible moral error to bring such beings into existence or a yeah. terrible moral error to give them great authority over what happens in the world. Yeah. So I think that's a likely place for us to end up in. And I think that like the level of rigor and carefulness in public discussion is like not such that those kinds of things get pulled apart. Huh. It, it probably mostly gets collapsed into a general like raw or boo or like, I don't oh, wow. know that much about how public should... opinion works, but I'd be happy to take simple bets on this. Well, there's uh, some selfish reasons why, uh, People would not necessarily want to, you know, give large amounts of GDP. You could, you could imagine there's groups that would say, well, uh, we still want to own AIs, but we should treat them humanely. Uh, I guess that doesn't sound too good now that I say that out loud. <laughs> yeah, I don't think it's going to play well. It's not going to play, yeah. Also, yeah. Like, I mean, there's just such a strong concentrated interest that is like so, like most of the cases where this goes badly are cases where there's like a large power imbalance. But in the case we're talking about, like the most effective lobbyists will be AI systems. AIs, yeah. so and it's, like, it's going to be this very concentrated, powerful interest, which cares a lot about this issue, has a plausible moral claim, yeah. like looks really appealing. Like it seems kind of overdetermined, basically. Yeah. Okay. This isn't super important. This is mostly relevant, again, when people say things like, no, it will, it's kind of crazy to imagine AI is owning, like, owning resources. Owning resources themselves, their yeah. Thing. And like, I think that this is the default. Outcome. Yeah. Barring some sort of surprising developments. And- yeah. Okay. I've, I've barely thought about this issue at all, to be honest, uh, which perhaps is an oversight, but I need to, need to think about it some more. Then maybe, maybe we can talk about it again. I don't think it's that important an issue, mostly. <laughs> I think the like, uh, details of like how to make alignment work, et cetera, are more important. Okay. I would just try and justify them by the additional argument that, like, to the extent you care about what these AI systems want, you really would like to create AI systems that are on the same page as humans. Like, if you get to create a whole bunch of extra new agents, it's really, it could be great if you create a bunch of agents whose preferences are well aligned with the existing agents. And it could be like, you've just created a ton of unnecessary like conflict and mm. suffering if you create a ton of agents who want very different things. Okay, so uh, we're, we're almost uh, out of time, uh, but just a final few questions. So you're not only uh, working in this area, but you're also uh, a donor and you're trying to support projects that you think will contribute to, to AI alignment. But it's a, an area where there's a lot of people trying to do that. Uh, there's perhaps uh, more money, more money than uh, than people who can usefully take it. So it's uh, so I hear somewhat challenging to find uh, really useful things to fund that are, aren't already getting funded. How do you figure out uh, what to fund? And um, would you mind mentioning some of the things that you that you donate to now? Yeah, so I think I would like to move towards a world where maybe it's like easier to work on kind of like anyone who is equipped to do reasonable AI alignment work is able to do that with like a minimal hassle. Uh, including like if they have differences of view with other organizations currently working in the space or like if they're like not yet trained up and like want to just take some time to like think about the area and like see if it works out well. I think there are definitely like, there are definitely people who are doing work who are like interested in funding and I'd say like not doing crazy stuff. And so one could just in order to inject more money, like dip lower in that, like say, look, we like previously, if we're not really restricted by funding, then our bar ought not be like, we're really convinced this thing is great. Our bar should just be like, it looks like you're sort of a sensible person who like might eventually like figure out what's like, you know, it's like important part of personal growth. Maybe this project will end up being good for reasons we don't understand. So one can certainly dip more in that direction. I think that's not all used up. I guess the stuff I've funded in ASA for the last year has been like the biggest thing was funding ought. The next biggest was running like this sort of open call for individuals working on alignment outside of any organization, uh, which has funded like three or four people. Actually, I guess most recently, like there's like a group working on like IRL under like weaker rationality assumptions in Europe. And then also like supporting V. Meshwitz and Vladimir Slepnev are running like an AI alignment prize, which I'm funding and like a little bit involved in judging. Do, do you think yeah. other donors that are earning to give uh, could find similarly promising projects if they if they looked around actively? I think it's currently pretty hard in AI alignment. I think there's like potentially room for like, right? So I think it's conceivable that like existing funders, including me, are like being too conservative in some respects. And like, you could just say like, look, I really don't know if X is good, but like there is a plausible story where this thing is good. Or like ensuring that like many people in the field had enough money that they could like regrant effectively like many people in the conventional AI safety crowd say, I had enough money they could regrant effectively and could do whatever they wanted. Yeah, unless you're willing to get a little, little bit crazy, it's pretty hard. I guess it also depends on what your, yeah, I think it depends a lot on what your bar is. I think like if AI is in fact, like if we're on short timelines, then like the AI interventions are still probably pretty good compared to other opportunities. Um, and there might be some qualitative sense of like, this kind of feels like a longer shot or like a wackier thing that I would fend, fund in most areas. So like, I think a donor probably has to be somewhat comfortable with that. Yeah, there's also some claims, like I haven't, I think Miri like is, sort of can always use more money. I think chai, I think there are some other organizations that can also use more money and it's like not something that I think about that much. In general, like giving is not something I've been thinking about that much because I think it's just like a lot. It seems much better for me to personally be working on getting stuff done. Yeah, that sounds right. 
Um, well, this has been uh, in- incredibly informative, and uh, you're so prolific that I've uh, got, got a whole lot more questions, but we'll have to save them for, for, for another episode in future. But I'll stick up uh, links to some other things you've written that I think uh, listeners who have stuck with the conversation uh, this far will, will be really interested to read. Um, and, and yeah, you, you, you do write up a lot of your ideas uh, in, in detail on, on your various uh, blogs. So uh, listeners who'd like to, like to learn more have, uh, definitely have the opportunity to do so. Just one final question, uh, speaking of the blogs that you write. Uh, about a week ago, you, you wrote about eight unusual science fiction plots that, that you wish someone would turn into a proper book or, or a movie. And uh, I guess they're, they're very hard science fiction, things that you think actually, actually might happen and that we could learn from. Um, so what, what do you think is wrong with current sci-fi? And uh, uh, what, which, was the, which was your favorite of the, of the ideas that you wrote up? So I think a problem that I have and that maybe many similar people have is that it becomes difficult to enjoy science fiction as the world becomes less and less internally coherent and plausible. Like at the point when you're really trying to imagine what is this world like, like what is this character actually thinking? Like what would their background be? Often if you try and do that, I think almost all the time, if you try and do that with existing science fiction, if you like think too hard, eventually the entire thing falls apart and it becomes like very difficult to like, you kind of have to like do a weird exercise in order to like not think too hard if you want to really sympathize with any of the characters or really even understand what's like, think about what's going on in the plot. I think it's extremely common. It's very, very rare to have any science fiction that doesn't have that problem. I think that's like kind of a shame because it feels to me like the actual world, like like the actual world we live in is super weird. And like there's lots of super crazy stuff that I don't know if it will happen, but certainly is like internally consistent that it could happen. And I would really enjoy science fiction that like just fleshed out like all the crazy shit that could happen. I think it's a little bit more work. And the basic problem is that like most readers just don't care at all. Or it's incredibly rare for people to care about to care much about the internal coherence of the world. So people aren't willing to like spend extra time or like slightly compromise on like how convenient things are narratively. I would guess that like the most amusing story from the ones I listed or the ones that would actually make the best fiction um, would be like, so I described one plot that was in the, in Robin's like age of M scenario, which I think is, you know, doesn't fill in all the details is a pretty coherent scenario. This is where you have like a bunch of simulated humans who have mostly replaced normal humans in work who are like alive during this like brief period of maybe a few calendar years as we transition from simulated human brains to like much more sophisticated AI. And like in that world, the experience of an M is like very, very weird in a number of ways. One of which is like, it's very easy to like, you can put an M in a simulation of an arbitrary situation. You can copy M's, you can reset them. You can run an M like a thousand times through a situation, uh, which I think like is a really interesting situation to end up in. So I described like a plot that's sort of like a, yeah, I, I think like if you consider the genre of like con movies, I like quite enjoy that genre. And I think it'd be like a really, really interesting genre in this setting where like it's possible, it's possible to like take a person, to copy a person's brain, to put them in simulations where like people actually have a legitimate interest for wondering like, not only what is this person going to do in a simulation, but like, what is this person going to do in a simulation when they're simulating someone else? It's like incredibly complicated like the dynamics of that situation and like also very conducive to, yeah, very conducive, I think, to amusing plots. So I'd be pretty excited to read that fiction. It would probably be most amusing as a film. I don't think it's ever going to happen. I think none of them will happen. It's very depressing. <laughs> Maybe after the singularity, we'll be so rich, we'll be able to, to make, uh, make all kinds of science fiction that, uh, that, that appeals just to a handful of people. It'll be super <laughs> awesome. Yeah, once we have really powerful AI, the AI can write for us. We can each have a single AI just, just producing films for, for one individual. Oh, thousands of AIs, <laughs> thousands of AIs just producing like your one. It's going to be so That's good. That's the dream. Thanks so much for, for taking the time to, to come on the podcast, Paul. And uh, also just uh, in general, thanks so much for um, all of the work that you're putting into to try to make the world a better place or at least the, the future a better place. Thanks again for having me and thanks for running the podcast. If you liked this episode, can I suggest going back and listening to our two previous episodes on AI technical research? That's episode three with Dr. Dario Amade on OpenAI and how AI will change the world for good and ill. And episode 23, how to actually become an AI alignment researcher, according to Dr. Jan Leiker. Then you can go on and listen to our two episodes on AI policy and strategy. That's number 31, Professor Defoe on diffusing the political and economic risks posed by existing AI capabilities. And episode one, Miles Brundage on the world's desperate need for AI strategists and policy experts. And if those four episodes aren't enough for you, there's episode 21, Holden Karnofsky on Times Philanthropy Transform the World and Open Phil's plan to do the same which has a significant section on the Open Philanthropy Project's plan to positively shape the development of transformative AI. And again, if you know someone who would be curious about these topics or already works adjacent to them, please do let them know about the show. That's how we find our most avid listeners and can most contribute to making the world a better place. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you in a week or two.